Hey OTR fans, this is Greg from an evening of old time radio. Orson Welles and old time radio are almost synonymous with each other. You really can't be a fan of one without being a fan of the other. Orson Welles was of course one of the most prolific radio film and stage actors of all time as well as an acclaimed director, producer, and writer for stage, film, and radio. He's probably best known for acting for his film Citizen Kane, Jane Eyre, and The Third Man, uh, on radio for his famous War of the Worlds production, Mercury Theater of the Air, and as a director and producer, he's probably best known on stage for his Broadway production of Around the World, uh, as well as his Mercury Theater and his Federal Theater project. And then in film, for directing Citizen Kane, The Magnificent Ambersons, and The Stranger. Altogether, he started over a hundred films, over 20 television shows, as well as hundreds of radio shows. He directed over 30 films and television shows. He wrote the scripts for over 50 film and television shows. And he produced, directed, and wrote over 80 stage productions, both on and off Broadway, through his 50-year career. So this, the first collection of Orson Welles' old-time radio, um, I put together some of his better-known work and a little bit of his lesser-known work. You know, Orson Welles had a funny side as well. He was actually quite uh, talented when it came to comedy. A lot of people don't know that. They tend to associate Orson Welles with uh, dramatic acting only. But he had a really funny side, and I've included a couple of shows, um, comedy variety shows that he actually uh, hosted. Um, where he gets, you get to see this funny um, side of him. So without further ado, here is the first of several Orson Welles Old Time Radio collections. Thanks for watching. Good evening, this is Orson Welles. Just saying hello before the show starts. We hope this finds you well and leaves you better. This is your radio almanac, the first of a new series. An almanac, you remember, usually has at least a little bit of just about everything. And, well, that's us. Mostly, we want your almanac to be fun for you, real fun for all of you, wherever you are. This is January 26th, St. Polycarp's Day, and the eve of the Feast of St. Christostom. There was a new moon yesterday morning at 8.33 at 4 degrees Aquarius. Our astrology department says for me to tell all you Aquarians who were born this week that you're in for a very active year. They want me to say that everything looks pretty good for you. 156 years ago today, the British settled Australia. I mention these things because they belong in an almanac. And here's another interesting item. Three weeks ago today, exactly, Dick Tracy was kidnapped by Flat Top. <laughs> Homely philosophy and nuggets of wisdom come later, along with Groucho Marx. January 26th, our time, 1944, is the date Groucho Marx appears on this show. At the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Uh, 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 uh. I beg your pardon? I said, ah, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> very pretty, but what does it mean? Well, it means we just can't tolerate this sort of thing. You see, I'm from upstairs. My name is Mr. Trivers. Trivers? Tri oh, yes, the censor. The censor, better known as vice president in charge of... <whistles> That's dirty. <laughs> What's on your mind, Mr. Trivers? We've told you a dozen times, Mr. Wells, that there's some things you can't do in radio. Why, what have I done? What have you done? Last week in your love scenes, you were breathing heavy again. I was? Yes, sir. You embarrassed the whole Middle West. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Trivers. It won't happen again. Won't happen again? Look what you're doing now. You've got red horses flying around in here. Now, Mr. Trivers. You can't do that. The flying red horse is symbolic. It's our signature. It opens the program. Let me show you. The makers of mobile oil and mobile gas, with their compliments, invite you to join us. Invite you to join us. If you're not careful, Mr. Trivers, you're going to wear out your uh-uh. Invite you to join us at the sign of the flying red horse. Tonight and every week at the same time over these same stations, the makers of mobile gas and mobile oil bring you Orson Welles. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this particular new moon is a total eclipse of the sun. 
But despite the conjunction with the moon's south node... Mr. Wells. Despite the conjunction with the moon's south node and its opposition to Pluto, which give vent to the foregoing... Mr. Wells. ...luminaries behold some very good aspects. Mr. Wells, immediately after this broadcast, you're to proceed to the lobby of the Wiltshire Fish Market, which is having its grand premiere. You will remove your shoes, and at 11.55, imprints of your feet will be preserved for posterity in the fresh cement. There's just one other matter... I have to fill out these forms for Social Security. Now, uh, the name is uh, Orson Wells, and uh, what is your occupation? Uh, well, I'm a dispenser of wit and humor. I bring smiles to people's faces. I make the whole world laugh. Mm-hmm. And employed? You can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Might I inquire, Miss? Might I inquire, Miss, who you are and what you're doing here? Well, they sent me over. I'm Miss Grimmett, your new secretary. I don't need a secretary. Who sent you over? Your sponsor. Oh. Oh. Well, pull up a knee and sit down. <laughs> I guess I could use just one more little secretary. Now, on with the show. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the average family in the United States consists of three and a half persons? Oh, isn't that kind of messy, having a half a person around the house? <laughs> I'd rather you didn't interrupt, Miss Grimmett. This is a radio program. Well, you'd better look over your script first. I've made a few changes. You've made a few changes? Yes. You plan to introduce as your first guest star, Cordell Hall? Yes. I thought I'd start with the Secretary of State and sort of build from there. Great idea, isn't it? No, I've canceled Cordell Hall. We can replace him with Frank Sinatra. I'm sorry. That's out of the question. <laughs> that's out of the question. We couldn't possibly use Frank Sinatra on this program. These microphones have no handles. <laughs> got enough to do without picking him up. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, the next item on your radio almanac is a little philosophical playlist, a drama. Uh, 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 uh. A censor again. What's on your mind this time, Mr. Trivers? Oh, we fellas upstairs. We've just been studying your script. Now, this drama you got on for tonight. You can't do that on the air. Why not? Oh, Mr. Wells. What is wrong with the love life of a gypsy moth? Why... Why, the sound effects alone are censorable. What sound effects? <laughs> well, take this one you got indicated right here. Yes. Yeah. Sound of two caterpillars necking. That's got to come out. But why? What a wonderful thing. I say, just imagine, if you will, two caterpillars necking. Listen to them. There's a pause, and we hear nothing. Now, see, caterpillars being so soft and silky, they don't make a sound when they're necking. That's what I mean. Much too suggestive. Well, now, what's suggestive about it? These caterpillars aren't making a sound. That's just it. They're being very sneaky about it. All right, we'll cut the caterpillars. Will you, sea lions, you have to have a fish in your pocket. Any other complaints? Yes, scene three. The one about love at first sight. Love at first sight? That's got to come out. Which scene is that? Well, it's this one here, see? Where the moth flies into the closet and sees a sweater... Oh, that's a charming scene. What's wrong with this? Oh, come now, Mr. Wells. Whose sweater did you really have in mind? <laughs> what do you mean? You know very well, Mr. Wells, that when you put a sweater in this story, you were thinking of only one person. And I don't mean John's other wife. <laughs> I'm afraid, Mr. Wells, I'll have to cut the whole script. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will send a stamped self-addressed envelope together with two feathers from the wings of the flying red horse and 25 cents to cover handling and mailing, I will send you the censor.
Listen, that was Lud Gluskin's orchestra playing I Know That You Know. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was what she said it was. Thank you, Miss Grimmett. I don't know about almanacs, but in every radio show long about this point, a charming fellow walks up to the microphone, beats you over the head with a commercial. You heard him, says, folks, have you tried Perkins Pickles today? <laughs> Why not? Don't you know that Perkins Pickles are tangy? I'm sure that Perkins Pickles are cram full of squishy goodness. <laughs> Friends! Perkins pickles are scientifically grown to contain 108 warts per pickle. <laughs> if Perkins finds a pickle with 107 warts, he throws it away. And remember, Perkins pickles, spelled backwards, reads Selkip Snickrip. <laughs> We don't have an announcer like that. We have a fellow, his name is Ray Collins, uh, by a coincidence. Very nice boy. Unquote, reserved. Very reluctant to talk about the product. So let's all give him a nice round of applause. Here he is, Ray Collins. Hello? See what I mean. <laughs> Ray, isn't there something you'd like to say to these lovely people? No. He wouldn't last long with Perkins Pickles. Ray, there must be something you want to say to them. Yes, there is something I'd like to say, but uh, don't you think it's a bit late for us? Not at all. It's the time for you to go right ahead. Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> well, that's very sweet of you, Ray, but I was thinking of something else. Have you done any any writing lately? Oh, sure. I'll tell the folks about it. Oh, they wouldn't be interested in my bicycle. <laughs> Uh, 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 your bicycle is not what I'm talking about, Ray. You drive a car, don't you? Oh, sure. Well, how do you make it go? Why, I turn on the ignition. Uh, what the fuck are you getting at, Orson? I, I don't want to be obvious about this, Ray, but when you drive a car and you want to get plenty from your ration coupons, you just... Oh, uh, you mean mobile gas. That's it. America's favorite gas. Right. Oh, well, sure, Orson. When it's miles that matter, people say mobile gas. Mobile gas is crammed just... Cram full of miles. All the miles it's possible to give you under wartime measures. Oh, sure, other gasolines are good. But all I know is in wartime, as in peacetime, mobile gas remains America's favorite. And 20 million drivers can't be crazy. Why, it looks like love. The way your engine and this master gasoline team up together. The qualities of mobile gas are outstanding with respect to mileage and power. The two things that count most today. On your speedometer, mark the miles you get from every gallon. And is there anything that you want more from gasoline today than mileage? Uh, I think I can say without fear of contradiction, Ray, that what we want is mileage. Uh, mobile gas, Dr. Wells. Mobile gas. Friends, stop in at the sign of the flying red horse. Get your miles worth from your gasoline coupons with mobile gas. Well, thank you very much, Ray. And ladies and gentlemen, there's just one thing I'd like to add. We don't make any exorbitant claims for our product. We're all adults. We're all adults. I don't think any of us are taken in by some types of advertising. However, mobile gas does contain vitamin A. <laughs> no other gasoline can make that statement. <laughs> I beg your pardon? <laughs> Pardon me, folks. I just found out we can't make it either. We uh, continue now, ladies and gentlemen, with old Dr. Wells' almanac and joke book, Depressing Information Department. In the islands of Hawaii, and this is true, there is a law dating back to King uh, Kamehameha which prohibits lovemaking on the public highways. Encouraging information department, powdered glass is not poisonous. Mystery writers, please note, powdered glass is not poisonous. Old Dr. Wells, however, doesn't recommend its use as a substitute for powdered sugar. We interrupt this program, ladies and gentlemen, to bring an interruption. <laughs> Groucho Marx. <laughs> well, 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 Groucho. Uh, thank you not to interrupt my interruptions, Wells. So this is the new Austin Wells program, and you're the new Austin Wells. Well, you don't look new to me. 
In fact, if I ever saw a used Orson Welles, you're it. <laughs> you're partially correct, Groucho. This is a new program, the uh, Orson Welles Almanac. Oh, it is. Well, did you know, Orson, that yesterday was the 150th birthday of Robert Burns? And after writing poetry for all these years, he winds up in Van Buren, Arkansas, playing a bazooka. <laughs> Uh, did you know, Groucho, that Professor Unger Dunger of the Harvard University Sociology Department has just turned in a Ph.D. thesis proving that most people would be better off if they hadn't been born? Yes, but that seldom happens to anybody. Uh, Groucho, tell me, what are you doing here? Your sponsor sent me over. Oh, you know my sponsor? Do I know your sponsor? He's over at my house every night drinking Pat's Blue Ribbon Beer. <laughs> Had to wait for the second page for that. <laughs> How do you think you got hired? Oh, well, gee, I thought he drank nothing but mobile gas. Uh, <laughs> now that you're here, Groucho, perhaps you can help me with a problem. Where am I going to live out here in California? Why don't you come and stay with me in Beverly Hills? You're joking. What sort of a neighborhood is it? Judge for yourself. On one side of me lives Betty Grable. Well, who lives on the other side? Who cares? <laughs> I take it you're fond of Betty Grable? Well, I, I lean towards that type. You do? Yeah, I lean towards her, but Harry James keeps pushing me away. <laughs> to get back to you, Orson, something I'm not crazy about, you'll be crazy about my place. <laughs> All modern improvements, gas lighting, inner door mouse traps, and a pot-bellied stove in every room. That is every room except mine. We couldn't get a pot-bellied stove for my room, so we hired Sidney Greenstreet to stand in the corner. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think I'd be comfortable there? Why, you'll be as comfortable as a bug in a rug. And we got some of those, too. Well, I'm afraid I couldn't impose on you, Groucho. You see, I left my ration book in New York. What if you haven't got a ration book? I'll take care of you. What's the best food in the world? Milk. Where does milk come from? Cows. What do cows eat? Grass. You can eat grass, too. <laughs> and who knows? No, it's impossible. <laughs> so, you see, you, you'll be... So you see, you'll be very happy at my place. I, I'm sorry, Groucho. I'm afraid it's out of the question, especially if I couldn't get anything to eat. Well, you can't have everything. Look at Solomon with a thousand wives. Do you think he had everything? Well, maybe he did. My luck. I had to think of Solomon just now. <laughs> well, suppose I did move in, Groucho. What would you charge me? Money. You speak to me of filthy legal letters. Only a cad would take money from a friend. Oh, I'm glad to hear you say that, Groucho. Shake hands with a friend. Shake hands with a cad. <laughs> Would, uh, 500 a month be too much? Oh, come now, Groucho. Money isn't everything. Can money bring you happiness? No, but I like to have it around so I can choose the type of misery that's most agreeable to me. I beg your pardon, Mr. Wells. I have a message for a Mr. Mark. I'll take it. He's a friend of mine. In fact, we used to know each other. Ah, he was a great guy when I had it. What's the message? There's a milkman outside. He wants his horse back. Tell him he'll have it back the first thing Friday morning, as soon as I get back from my ranch. You, a rancher? Why, only this morning. They sent me uh, 600 head of cattle. Jerseys or Holstein? I don't know. They only sent the head. <laughs> I think they were the heads. Now, look at here. <laughs> now, look at here, prairie flower. Take your hands off me. Don't get excited. I'm just trying to trace my 600 sides of beef. <laughs> Miss Grimmett, certainly you recognize Groucho Mutt. Indeed. You know, Mr. Marks, I can hardly wait for your program to come on the air every Saturday night. So I usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get along gloriously, Miss Grimmett. Couldn't we steal away somewhere together after the program, just you and me? Put me down! Quiet. Do you want to get into pictures? <laughs> oh, you can't fight it, Miss Grimmett. It's bigger than we are. Can't you see us sitting on a park bench, you and me? No moon, no stars. Just a beam from a policeman's flashlight. Well, did you ever? For me? Oh, once or twice. Uh... Orson, who is this woman? My secretary. Come, come, Orson, secretary, indeed. You can fool me once and you can fool me twice. But you can't fool me all the time. Remember, I'm some of the people. <laughs> now, come clean, Wells. Do you or do you not want to get into pictures? Put me down. <laughs> Pardon me, Austin. I, I always wanted to pick you up. And... So you're a producer now. Certainly. I'll, uh, shall I draw up the contract? Oh, you're a lawyer, too. Yes, and you'll have a contract as soon as we can get hold of another lawyer. If you're a lawyer, Groucho, why don't you handle it yourself? I don't fool around with shy sex. <laughs> now, the first thing we do is to give you a big publicity buildup. Monday, you get lost in the desert. Tuesday, we send Hedy Lamar out to look for you. Wednesday, I go out to look for Hedy Lamar. 
And Saturday. Wait a minute. What happened to Thursday and Friday? I found Hedy Lamar. <laughs> and don't interrupt. Can't you see we want to be alone? All right, Austin. That's your contract. The party of the first part, here and after referred to as Austin Wells, agrees to appear in seven pictures the first year, 12 pictures the second year, and 18 pictures the third year. Wells, you're fired. Fired? What for? You're making too many pictures. The public is sick of you. <laughs> Miss Grimmett, my cloak. And Austin, put two pair of shoes on the flying red horse. I'm getting out of here. Goodbye, everybody. What happened, Groucho? Silly horse. I told him he couldn't wear wedgies. <laughs> it it um, says here I'm next. Go right ahead, Raymond. Thanks. That's all right. Well, sir, I, uh... I like good round figures myself. <laughs> Don't you, gentlemen? Oh, you old <laughs> devil. <laughs> well, especially, I might say, when they're revealing. Well, well these figures are 70% of all the cars on the road today now it stops getting are funny. from 5 to 10 years old. 70%. New cars will be scarce for a long time after the war's end. Folks, you've got to take care of your car. That means frequent oil change, and that means mobile oil. Perhaps you think because you're making shorter trips at lower speeds, you didn't change your oil so often. On the contrary, under these conditions, oil is apt to get dirty quicker. That encourages burned bearings, worn-out cylinder walls, and wasted gasoline. So change oil frequently and change for good. To good, fresh mobile oil. It helps your car run better, longer. Drive in at the sign of the flying red horse for mobile oil. Department of Interesting Statistics, Mobile Oil is the world's largest selling oil. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to hear from one of old Dr. Wells' favorite songbirds. And one who looks just as good as she sounds. You're going to agree that that's quite something. The name is Martha Stewart. Miss Martha, tell the folks what you're going to sing for them. Bethany Mucho. That means kiss me a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, what you've just heard is the title of what you're going to hear. It does not constitute an endorsement of old Dr. Wells. Bésame, bésame mucho. Each time I cling to your kiss, I am you.
the way, the president will be 62 years old Sunday. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Here's my dime. Sunday is also the seventh anniversary of Hitler's repudiation of the Versailles Treaty. And five years ago today, the loyalists surrendered Barcelona to Franco. You know, just about the longest, loudest argument in our United States history has to do with states' rights. I saw the word states' rights in the headlines this morning. And 114 years ago today, Daniel Webster stood up on the floor of the Senate and spoke for that other sentiment. You all remember how it goes. Most of us had to learn it in school. That other sentiment. Dear to every true American heart, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. While we're on the subject of liberty, particularly eloquence on the subject of liberty, let's celebrate Thomas Paine's birthday two days early by reading a few lines of his. Lines written in 1776. I call not upon a few, but upon all. Not on this state or that state, but on every state. Up and help us. Lay your shoulders to the wheel. Better have too much force than too little when so great an object is at stake. It matters not where you live or what rank of life you hold. The evil or the blessing will reach you all. The far and the near. The home countries and the back. The rich and the poor will suffer or rejoice alike. The heart that feels not now is dead. The blood of his children will curse his cowardice, who shrinks back at a time when a little might have saved the whole and made them happy. By perseverance and fortitude, we have the prospect of a glorious issue. By cowardice and submission, the sad choice of a variety of evils, a ragged country, a depopulated city, habitations without safety, and slavery without hope. Look on this picture and weep over it. And if there yet remains one thoughtless wretch who believes it not, let him suffer it unlamented. Where was there ever a war on which a world was staked till now? Thomas Paine wrote the words you've just heard. They apply very well to this year of grace, 1944. I think they apply very well to the fourth war loan drive. I leave it to you. Now it's time to say good night. And please, if you've enjoyed this program, let us know about it. And more important, if there's anything you like or you think you'd like changed, write us care of this station where your dial will find us next week at this same place on your clock. The makers of mobile oil and mobile gas, Agnes Moorhead, Martha Stewart, Ray Collins, Lud Gluskin, all of us in the Mercury Theater, want this show to be exactly according to your specifications of a good time. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, I remain as always obedient for yours. <laughs> is as vital to victory as a long Tom Field gun on the battlefield. Keep it rolling with expert care at the sign of the flying red horse. Uh, ladies and gentlemen,
and gentlemen, they want me to make an announcement which it seems I forgot all about. So I'm going to add Libet. You'll excuse me. It won't take a second, but I think we've got just a second. We have a guest next week, and I forgot to tell you that we have one. And uh, he's an old friend of ours, a very distinguished lecturer, a world authority on uh, uh, undersea life, uh, treasurer's reports, and other curiosa of uh, the American scene. I know you'll be as happy as to hear about this gentleman as I am to be able to announce that he is coming with us. The distinguished lecturer, author, and world authority, Mr. Robert Benchley. Groucho Marx appears with the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company. Martha Stewart and Ray Collins appear through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios. Producers of the current hit, Madame Curie. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pab's Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Ladies and gentlemen, the element of suspense is so vital to our story tonight that our sponsors, the makers of Pab's Blue Ribbon Beer, are omitting their usual commercial message during the intermission between the acts so that our play will go uninterrupted from spooky start to spooky finish. Therefore, let's give Ken Roberts his 45-second opportunity right now to extol the merits of that blended, splendid... Uh, Ken? Of that blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. Those two words tell the whole flavor story. You see, every single drop of Pabst Blue Ribbon is the happy result of blending, the full flavor blending of never less than 33 fine brews. That's right. Never less than 33 fine brews blend their individual taste tones to give you that splendid flavor. Not too light, not too heavy, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer taste coming through just the way you like it. Friends, these days, when your dealer is occasionally unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like, Please keep on asking. For every single bottle you do get will live up to the same high standards of quality and taste. Yes, every bottle will be, as always, blended, splendid, Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Wells. We of the Mercury reckon that a story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warm. Sometimes you want your spine to tingle. Well, the tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to a classic among radio thrillers. Its author is one of the most gifted of all the writers who've ever worked for this medium, Lucille Fletcher, who wrote the greatest single radio script ever written. Sorry, wrong number. The title of this, her terrifying little tale of Gru, for this evening, is another spine tingler by name... The Hitchhiker. I am in an auto camp on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it'll help me. It'll keep me from going crazy. But I must tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well. Perfectly well. Except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Ford V8, license number 6B7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it is not me who's gone mad. But something else. Something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. 
Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, Mother. Here, give me a kiss, and then I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. <laughs> no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Oh. Hey, what's this, tears? Oh, it's just the trip, Ronald. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers now, on the road. Strangers? Don't you worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in excellent spirits. Drive ahead. Even the loneliness seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without him... Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. He stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved, if I hadn't swerved, I'd have hit him. I almost did. Almost did hit him. Now, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb, pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he'd got there, but I thought maybe one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then, late that night, I saw him again. It was on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hailed me this time. Hello! Hello! I stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidences, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir. Fill her up, will you? Check your oil? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it it uh, has been raining here lately, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh, no? I, I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. Well, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, though. Ain't many pleasure cars out in the turnpike this season of the I year. I guess not. What about hitchhikers? <laughs> Hitchhikers here? Why, what's the matter? Don't you ever see any? A guy'd be a fool to start out to hitchhike on this road. Look at it. Then you never see anybody? No. Nope. Maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it's a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up a guy for that long a ride. This is pretty lonesome country here, mountains and woods. Yeah. Hey, you ain't seen nobody like that, have you? Oh, no, no. It's it's just a <laughs> technical question, huh? Oh, I see. Well, uh, that'll be a dollar forty-nine with the tax. The thing gradually passed from my mind as coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio. I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little, 
the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked... He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello! Hello! I'd stopped the car, of course, for the detour. For a few minutes, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I realized he must be thinking that I'd stop for him. Hello! No, no, I'm... Not just now, I, I'm sorry. Going to California? No, no, not today. The other way, I'm, I'm going to New York. Sorry. Sorry. After I got the car back onto the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The lights changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. <laughs> You sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yep, we do. In the daytime. But it close up for the night. I know, but I, I was wondering if, if you could possibly may have a cup of coffee. Black coffee. Not at this time of night, mister. My wife's a cook and she's in bed. Well, now, uh, l listen, ju just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right right beside here. And he was a suspicious-looking man. Henry? Who is it, Henry? It's nobody, Mother. Here's a pair of things he wants a cup of coffee. Now, Go back into bed. I, I don't mean to disturb you, but you see, <coughs> I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. What was he doing? Nothing. You've been hitting a bottle. That's a, that's what's the matter with you. You got nothing better than do than wake decent folk out their hard-earned sleep. Now get going. Go on. No, he, he he looked as though he was going to rob you. I ain't got nothing in this stand to lose. Now on your way before I call out chair folks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop to rest a little, but... I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. A few resort places there were closed. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that... When I saw him next, I'd run him down. But I didn't see him again until late the next afternoon. I'd stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma. Let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks. He was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then, something went wrong with the car. It, it stalled right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell. I heard its cry, its whistle crying. Still, he stood there. Now I knew that he was beckoning beckoning me to my death. Well, <laughs> I frustrated him that time. The starter had worked at last. I managed to back up, but 
after the train had passed. He was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one minute. Hello there. Hello. Like a ride? What do you think? How far are you going? Amar- Amarillo. I'll, I'll, I'll take you to Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas? Yeah, I'll drive you there. Gee. Hop here. It's Mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. No, go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. Swell car and decent guy driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. You hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Yeah, I think it would be. But I'll bet, though, you could, if, if, you, if you got a good pickup in a fast car, you could get to places faster than, what well, we'll say, another person in another car. I don't get you. Well, you, you take me, for instance. Suppose I'm driving across the country at a nice steady clip of about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for lifts beat me to town after town provided she got picked up every time in a car that was doing 65 or, or 70 miles an hour? I don't know. Maybe she could, maybe she couldn't. What difference does it make? Oh, no, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do if I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Well, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax. If I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... Hey! Did you see him, too? See who? That man standing beside the barbed wire fence. I didn't see anybody. Right there. There was nothing, just a barbed wire fence. What did you think he was doing, trying to run into that barbed wire fence? There was a man there, I tell you. A a thin, gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. I was trying to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? I'm I'm trying to get rid of him. Or at least prove that he's real. But you you say you didn't see him back there. You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far as that's concerned... Well, watch for him. Watch for him the next time. Then keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Look there! How does this door work? I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? Did you see him? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. And I don't see how I will very long driving with you. No, look, I'm sorry. I, I don't know... What came over me? Please, don't go. So if you'll excuse Please, me, Please, you mister. can't go. Listen, how'd you like to go to California? I'll drive you all the way to California. You elephants all the way? No, thanks. Listen, please, just one minute. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend, just a good dose of sleep. There, I cut it now. No. No, you can't go. Leave your hands off of me, do you hear? Leave your hands Come back here, please. Come back. She ran from me, as if I was some kind of monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get a hold of myself... If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car, just a few hours and sleep, just along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket, just as a blanket, when I saw him coming toward me. Coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Maybe, maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out, then and there, for 
Now he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped even for a minute for gas, for oil, for a drink, a pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich. He was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was standing near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque where I bought ten gallons of gas. I was afraid now. Afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in... in lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly... crawling over the face of the moon. And now he didn't even wait for me to stop... unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads... He waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude, over the cold and lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals. Flitting. In the pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself. Beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico, this morning. There's an auto camp here. It's cold. Almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I I had the feeling that if I could speak to somebody familiar, somebody that I loved, I could pull myself together. Number, please. Long distance. Thank you. This is long distance. I'd like to put in a call to my home to Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> I'm Ronald Adams. The number is Beechwood 9970. Thank you. Thank you. What is your number? My number? It's, it's, it's 312. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling a Beechwood 9970. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was in the middle of the morning. I knew Mother'd be home. I pictured a tall, white haired in her crisp house dress going about her tasks. It'd be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right. Deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello. Hello, Mother? This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, what? please? Who is this? This is Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? 
I, I don't know any Mrs. Whit. Is this Beechwood 9970? Yes. Where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The, the hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? What's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. A nervous breakdown. Nervous. Who is this calling? Nervous breakdown. My mother was never... <laughs> it's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Since the... Death of her oldest son, Ronald. Hey, what is this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 9970. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Sir, your three minutes are up. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so, I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. And so, I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise... Otherwise, I'll go crazy. Outside, it is night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me, stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa. And mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them. He is waiting for me. Somewhere. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. Austin Wells will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's production of the Mercury Summer Theater. But first, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon wish to remind you that, though you may not be able to get Pabst Blue Ribbon every time you want it in these days of grain restrictions, it is well worth your while to keep asking, for every bottle you do get will continue to live up to its name. And speaking of grain restrictions, not a single grain of wheat is being used in the brewing of beer and ale. And the grains that are being used by breweries are not the grains wanted for famine relief. Now, let me repeat. When you do get Pabst Blue Ribbon, you can be sure this truly great beer will be as always the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. As always, blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. Now, here is Orson Welles. Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen... We bring to your radio another Mercury favorite. We hope a favorite of yours. You've asked for it many times. We've performed it many times. Jane Eyre. And Jane will be played by a Mercury actress who was heard tonight and has been heard so often on our shows. One of the most gifted people we know in our business, Miss Alice Frost. Jane Eyre then, with Alice Frost and your obedient servant, that's the same time next week, same station. Please join us. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, for all of us on the Mercury Theater, including Bernard Herman, who wrote and conducted the music on this program, I remain, as always, obediently yours. <laughs> More than one half of all our nation's workers make their living in the food industry or a related field. One of the largest groups in the food industry are the grocers. Next week in Chicago, the National Association of Retail Grocers, which represents more than 500,000 retailers, is holding its first post-war convention, at which problems of food distribution will be discussed and new ideas and methods will be worked out to better serve its customers. The makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer salute the grocer, 
who was doing his very best under trying conditions to keep America well fed. This program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. of the United Nations, we present one of America's top spine tinglers, a radio rebroadcast of a program dedicated to the mysterious, the unusual, and sometimes the supernatural, a program of suspense. This is the truth. Do you understand? The truth. It must be the truth. It has to be. I, Robert Wensley Graham, a doctor and psychiatrist by profession, do hereby of my own free will and volition, albeit with deepest regret, make the following full and complete statement relative to that all but unbelievable series of events which has brought such disaster and misfortune to my house, particularly to my poor wife, Isabel. It had its beginning, properly speaking, some two months ago, to be exact, on the evening of July 25th. We were in the drawing room, Isabel at the piano, practicing, as she said, her Aunt Jane and I on the opposite sides of the room. Isabel, what's the matter? I don't know. I can't seem to keep my mind on anything anymore, even my music. <laughs> Nerves. Nerves? <laughs> Isabel. Yes, Robert? I don't wish to distress you, but it's been going on for quite a little while now. It's not getting any better. I know. Let's not discuss it, shall we? You should let me prescribe treatment for you. I could prescribe something for her. You can do remarkable things now with just the common old drugs under proper control. Drugs? It's not drugs that she needs. It's to get out of this house for a while. It's to get back to the concert stage where she belongs. It's work. Aunt Jane, please. I'm sorry. I don't believe in beating around the bush. You're an artist. You've got talent. There's no sense in your trying to subordinate yourself to somebody else. Aunt Jane, that's enough. I'm not subordinating myself to anyone. Really, Aunt Jane, you mustn't interfere, you know. Robert doesn't want me to go back on the stage. Darling, it isn't that I don't want you to go back. I'm proud of you. You know that. It's only because I think... Because I know that... Going back to a professional career in your present mental condition would be terribly harmful. I know, Robert. I know you're right. Oh, after all, I'm, I'm a doctor. It's my business to know these things. I, I get it. Probably the hospital. Hello. Hello? Yes, it's Dr. Graham. Oh, yes. For... Who? Huh. Well, when, when would you like to see me? All right, fine. No, 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 no trouble at all. I... Very well, I'll be expecting you. G goodbye. Isabel, good heavens. Who do you suppose that was? Who? Roger Holcomb. Do you remember the case? Roger Holcomb? I remember it. Of course you do. The fellow was brought back from the dead, as the newspapers put it, about a year ago. Oh, yes. Huh. Well, he really was dead for four full minutes, as far as medical science was concerned. 
Then Bates brought him around. It was nine days' wonder at the time. Well, what did he want to see you about? I don't know. Something to do with his experience, obviously. He was in a terribly agitated state. Poor fellow had been walking up and down in front of the house for an hour trying to get up courage to ring the bell. Finally, phoned from the corner drugstore. Why, the poor man. Why in the world should he do that? Anxiety neurosis. They hounded him, you know, in the most shocking way. Got out of the hospital. Preachers and spiritualists, movie agents, just plain fakers. People trying to find out if he remembered anything of the four minutes. He was supposed to be dead. People just trying to exploit him. Oh, must be Holcomb now. Take him into the office. Dr. Graham? Yes, you're Roger Holcomb? Yes. Come in. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Holcomb. Yes, sir. You come this way, please, to my office. Now just sit down anywhere. Lie down on the couch if you like. You're tired. I am tired. Tired and dead. Give me your hand, please. For heaven's sake, there's nothing wrong with my pulse. If that's all you think it is, I'll go. Why did you come to me, Mr. Holcomb? You know my history? Yes, most medical men do. Up until your disappearance. Yeah, most medical men do, all right. Then they tell me I'm crazy. You think you are, Mr. Holcomb? Oh, I see. You're like all the rest. Let go of me, please. Just, just a minute, right. Mr. Holcomb. You came to me for advice. For treatment. Just you tell me your story. Well, I was told you, you specialize in strange cases. Hmm. Things that other men can't explain. Yeah, that's true in a way. Oh, you know what happened when I got out of the hospital. Yes. Huh? Followed me, questioned me, hounded me, day and night, trying to find out if I remembered anything, if I'd experienced anything beyond the grave. Yes, I remember that. Well, then you remember that my answer was always the same. That I remembered nothing. That I knew nothing. I was wrong. Oh? What did you experience during those four minutes? I don't know. But it must have been something. Something I don't even dare to think about. How do you know this? Well, it, it happened the first time on a, on a boat trip, which I'd taken to recover my health. I, I found myself chatting with a woman who was seated at my table in the dining saloon. She found occasion, as such women often will, to mention her age. She said, after all, I'm not yet 40. And then... It happened. What happened? Well, from somewhere came crashing into my mind a certain knowledge of the exact day and year of that woman's birth. Mm -hmm. And with it, a compulsion to speak out. A compulsion which I could no more have resisted than I could have resisted breathing. I said, Madam, you were born in May, weren't you? May 30th. And she looked at me in utter astonishment. We'd never even seen each other before in our lives. And said, yes. And, and then I added the date, the year... 1900. See, she was well over 40. She'd lied to me. Innocent enough thing, but I had known the truth. And I'd been forced to speak. And I have been ever since. This uh, phenomenon has occurred often? More times than I can remember. Every time a direct lie, no matter how trivial, is uttered in my presence, I suddenly know the answer to that lie. I know the truth. And I'm compelled to speak it. Mm. And this Condition has existed only since your... Uh... Since my four minutes beyond the grave, mm, yes. Quite. It's as though in that brief time I, I glimpsed eternity. As if I'd seen revealed all truth of all the ages. I can never tell you how horrible that thing. I found that men, even the most honest of men, live by lies. Tell me. You have a family, friends who are understanding. Oh, for heaven's sake, Doctor, don't you understand what this has done to me? Yes, I had a family and friends. A girl I was going to marry. Today I'm, I'm an outcast, pariah. I'm, I'm shunned, feared. I, I'm hated. Yes, hated. Mr. Holcomb. Uh, Mr. Holcomb, I believe that this condition is very real to you. It causes you very real anguish. I want to help you. Do you think you can? I'm confident that I can. Suppose you could arrange to stay with me here at my home for a matter of weeks or months, if necessary. Well, I'll do anything. Go anything ahead. in the world to be a normal man again, but... But what? Dr. Graham, I... I can see that you still don't believe me. Oh, no. I beg of you. You don't know the terrible responsibility I'd be to you. I'd be like a spy, like some inexorable prosecutor from another world. Mr. Could... Holcomb, just... let me worry about that. All right, is there anyone else in your household who might object? Oh, no, there's only my wife and her aunt. They have your own quarters. They'd be quite comfortable, I assure you. I'm sure I'd be. It's a lovely house, but I've seen it. Yes, I'm rather lucky. I'm 
interested in research primarily. Not much money in that, you know, but a couple of years ago, I came into quite a nice inheritance. I also went with it. What is it? What's the matter? The inheritance was not yours. It was your wife's. The house is your wife's. You were penniless. I don't know why I lied to you. Pride, I suppose. I'm sorry. I told you I couldn't help it. No, no. I'll go now. Please. (laughs) My fault is to fall mad. But you see now that I... I want to help you. Do you believe me now? I believe, Mr. Holcomb, either that you are far more ill than I realized or that in months to come, you and I must venture into a realm never before explored by mortal man. It was utterly fantastic, and yet it was true. I checked the facts again and again. He could not possibly have known, and yet he knew. Could you imagine what this meant to a man of science? If I could fathom the depths of Roger Holcomb's mind... I could make a contribution to the body of scientific knowledge absolutely without parallel in modern times. I'd be more famous than Pasteur or Ehrlich. There remained the problem of Isabel. I was aware of the danger, of course. I was acutely aware of the peculiarly delicate balance of her mind at that time. But the fact that the presence of a man like Roger Holcomb might, might be seriously detrimental to my rather well-conceived plan for Isabel. I believed I could control the situation. I determined to proceed. Actually, Holcomb's presence made itself felt almost immediately. The first incident came after his visit. Isabel, please stop that playing and listen to me. And Jane, you know, Robert has said I mustn't talk about it. That it's bad for me. I don't care what Robert says. But he's my doctor and my husband. And I'm not sure that he should be either. Thanks, Jane. I don't know much about psychiatry, but I do know that making trouble between a husband and a wife... I'm not making anything that isn't there already. And you know it. Good heavens, girl. Look at yourself. Look what's happened to you since your marriage. I've been sick. He's made you sick. That's ridiculous. Maybe it's just that he's afraid of losing you. Maybe he's even afraid of losing your money. But I'm absolutely convinced that whether he's mentor or not, he's made you believe there's something the matter with you that isn't. Aunt Jane, I simply forbid you to talk this way. And now he brings this... this psychopath into the house. And don't bring Roger into it. He's Robert's patient. It's Robert's work and it's none of our business. What about your own work? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? Aunt Jane, you simply don't understand. Robert is my husband. I trust him and I love him. Nothing can ever come between us. I'd destroy anything. I'd kill anyone who tries. Isabel. Isabel, do something before it's too late. Do what? Get away. Leave him. Divorce him. Anything. Oh, I hope we're not interrupting. Of course not, darling. Hello, Roger. Hello, Isabel. Good afternoon. How are you feeling, Roger? I'm better, I think. I think it would be better if we didn't discuss our state of mind, Isabel. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Well, would you like me to play something for you? You know, I think I'm beginning to get the feel of it again. Really, I do. You're sure we haven't interrupted some conversation? Of course not. We were just discussing how helpful you've been in getting Isabel back to her work again. Roger. No. No, you were not. You were telling Isabel to divorce her husband. Isabel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Roger, come back. Isabel, is that true? You brought him in here deliberately. Is that true? It doesn't matter, I suppose. You've known how I felt for a long time. Yes, I'm afraid I have. Robert, it was all so silly. She didn't mean it. It was just I did she... mean it. But I did mean it. I'm sorry, Isabel. But I've been under this roof too long as it is. Oh, Jane, you're not leaving us. It's best, Isabel. Yes. Yes, I think it's unquestionably best. Best that you go at once. She left us, of course. I'd always believed that Jane exercised an unfortunate influence over Isabel. I did not dream it had reached such a point as this. Yet this incident gave me my first insight into the relationship which was destined to develop between Isabel, Roger, and myself. The first and most obvious result was that within a matter of weeks, Isabel was to lose every friend she had. 
we became further estranged as each day passed. It was difficult to speak of even the most casual things with this strangely terrifying specter of truth, always at our elbow. The situation reached its inevitable climax the evening that Leopold Sarinsky, the famous conductor of the Los Angeles Symphony, was to call on Isabel with a view to resumption of her professional career under his auspices. I gave a great deal of thought to that evening. It had to be handled with a great... Robert, you will help me, won't you? Of course I will, darling. I don't know whether you realize how important it is to me. I have nothing but the music now. I've been working so hard. Playing sometimes half the night yes. while you were asleep. I've heard you. Sometimes it seems that, that the piano is all that's helping me to keep my sanity. Uh, my darling, I, I, I want you to let me prescribe something for you. It's time we face this thing, your trouble, I mean. Robert, does he have to have dinner with us tonight? Roger... Isabel, you know how I stand on that. Oh, yes, but just even, what... even once, Isabel, keep him in the, his room like a spoiled child and we have guests. Isabel, it, it might undo everything I've accomplished in weeks. Oh, of course. You're right. But... Oh, Roger, come in. Robert, I, I was wondering if I mightn't be excused just tonight. Oh, you're having dinner with us, Roger. Must I? You know you must, Roger, and you know why. Why, Roger, don't you want to meet the great Leopold Sarinsky? He's really a wonderful person. Yes, indeed, I would very much. You know, I made my debut with him in 1934. I did a concert with him every year until my... Until I... Isabel uh, was very talented, you know. I was? <laughs> I am. Oh, Roger, I'm going to play with him again. He wants me to open the season in November. Can you imagine what that means to me? I'm so glad. Isabel. And Robert has finally given his consent. <laughs> Haven't you, dear? I'm, I'm sorry. What was it you said, Isabel? I said you'd given your consent to my playing with Sorinsky. Well, Isabel, you... You know I don't want you to think that I'd ever stand in your way. I know, dear. Roger, I'll do the Emperor Concerto. And you will come to hear me. You do want to, don't you, Roger? I... Please, Isabel, don't ask things of me that can't... What's the matter? What's the matter with both of you? You act as though you thought I wouldn't be able to appear. As though the whole idea were hopeless or something. Isabel, please. I am going to play. I'll be better than I ever was. You know I will, don't you? Don't you? Yes, of course, Isabel. You play wonderfully. Roger. No, Robert. You, you are very certain that Isabel will be prevented from ever playing again. By death. Yes. Death. Oh, Isabel, forgive me, forgive me, please. I dare. No. Oh, no. Please, Roger, it's not true. Tell me it isn't. Roger, answer me. Answer me. Roger, do you hear me? Answer me. Answer me! <laughs> When Sorinsky arrived, I told him it would be quite impossible for Isabel to leave her room. The concert was canceled, and indeed, to my knowledge, she's never touched the piano since that day. By now, to even the most casual observer, it must appear only natural that Isabel had every motive for a desperate, almost paranoid hatred of Roger Holcomb. This much was clear to me. The rest, not yet. But one thing, from any point of view, was certain. I had to keep Roger and Isabel apart. Perhaps what I feared was indeed inevitable. I honestly did not think it so at the time. The precautionary measure, however, I prescribed a drug for Isabel, which she at last consented to take. I gave her her own supply. She administered it to herself, as I had directed. Roger? Roger? Yes? It's Isabel. What do you want? Let me in, please. No. Please, it's terribly important. Robert said that I... I know. But he said it would be all right this time. You so? Yes. Yes, please. All right. Now, what do you want? I want to talk to you, that's all. What about it? It's so important. Roger, why don't you ever leave your room anymore? Can't you guess? Do you think I hate you? Isabel, I don't know what to think anymore. You, you do, don't you? I warned him. I, I told him it would happen. Now I'm going mad up here. I think of the anguish I've caused you. But, Roger, I don't. You must believe me. I know what it's been like for you having me here. Roger, you see, for the first time in my life, 
I think my husband is wrong about something. Wrong? Yes. Don't you see? He's been worried about both of us. And so this, this distrust has grown up between us. Well, I, I don't distrust you, Isabel. You've been more wonderful to me than I But afraid. you're you're afraid of me. And that amounts to the same thing. And it's bad for the both of us. It's, it's hurting both of us. Well, I've often felt I wanted to talk to you, to beg your pardon. Oh, you don't have to do that. We're both sick. But I think if we saw each other sometimes, if we talked the whole thing out, it would it would help us both. Well, does, does Robert think so, too? No. Then, then he didn't tell you it was all right to see him. No. I lied to you. You, you what? I lied to you. You lied to me. And, and it didn't happen. Isabel, don't you see? I, I am getting well. It didn't happen. I, I know. <laughs> I don't think it does happen anymore. Except with Robert. With Robert? What makes you think I don't know. All... Something about the way he acts. The way he is. Oh, but is there? He, he is curing me, then. Perhaps you shouldn't have come No, up no, don't you understand? We must see each other. We must talk. No, listen. Isabel. Robert, something's happened that I must Please, tell you about. Please, you're completely overwrought. Oh, but Robert, if I must insist, Isabel, why did you do this? I'm you sorry. Have to have a sedative right away. Isabel, get the bottle from your room. Mine? Yes, yes. Please, hurry. All right. Robert, she lied to me. Yes, yes, I know. But, Roger, I must I... absolutely forbid you to talk now. You must trust me. All right, but uh, later I want to have a long talk with of you. Of course, she we lied. shall. Here it is. I brought my hypodermic, too. I'm glad you did. The other one's mislaid somewhere. Will you give it to him, please? I? Yes, I'm sorry, but this has upset me rather badly. My hands are shaking. Robert, I'm terribly sorry. Matter now, give him the hypodermic. Me up with That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Leave us now, please, Isabel. All right. How are you feeling now, Roger? Well, I'm fine, Robert. I, I think I'm better than I've been in months. I know you're better. That's why I was so upset to see you. But why, Robert? I can't tell you all my reasons now, but you must trust me and believe in me. Oh, I do, but... Only that I'm afraid. For your health. Roger. No. You're afraid of murder. What? Murder. Roger, listen to me. Roger. Murder. Roger, what are you talking about? Roger! Roger! It was clear to me now. I knew I must take immediate action. I knew that the most terrible consequences might result if Isabel were alone with Roger, even for a moment. But he knew that he'd said so. There was no other explanation. I thought it through most carefully. And yet no plans are perfect. No man is infallible. Isabel! Robert! Why, what are you doing? Why, nothing. Don't lie to me, Isabel. I'm not. I'm you were just... coming from Roger's room. No. No, I swear I won't. Isabel, don't you understand that you're sick? That I've insisted on these things for your own good and his. All right. I was going to talk to him, but I had not Oh, Isabel. Why do you try to tell me that? But it's true, Robert. Really true. Is it? Roger. Roger. What's the matter? Look. Robert. No, it couldn't be. It is. He's dead. Dead? Hypodermic by his side. The drug, your drug, your hypodermic. But it's only a sedative. Except that in large enough quantity, it's fatal. You knew that. Oh, Robert, don't listen to Isabel, me. Isabel, why? Why, I warned you. Robert, look at me. It's Isabel. It's your wife. You can't... Oh, no. Where are you going? Come back. I'm going to call the police. It was perhaps the most terrible decision a man ever had to make even though it did come not as a shock to me, even from my point of view as a scientist. But terrible enough. Yet it had to be done, and I had done it. I did not speak to her as we waited, and she made no further attempt to appeal to me. She seemed utterly stupefied, perhaps as a result of the drug she'd herself been taking. Perhaps because she suddenly realized she was hopelessly trapped. When the police arrived, I told the story with as little emotion. 
Yes, there are fingerprints, all right, on both the bottles. Those would be my drink. wife's, of course. They both belong to her. Is that true, Mrs. Graham? Yes. Dr. Graham, do I understand, then, that you are formally charging your wife with the murder of Roger Holcomb? Well, you could hardly expect me to do that, could you? I'm simply telling you the fact. Uh, but you said she hated Holcomb, and you knew it. My wife has been mentally ill for some time. There are many people who can testify to that. You will plead insanity, of course. Dr. Graham, I can't tell you how sorry I am, but the things you have told me add up to only one thing. That you yourself obviously recognize. Yes. Your wife, Isabel Graham, murdered Roger Holcomb. What did you say? I said your wife, Isabel Graham, murdered Roger Holcomb. No. I murdered him. What? I tried to make it appear that Isabel had done it. And I succeeded. But I killed him. man is infallible. Yes, I killed Roger Holcomb. And he himself revealed the truth. I'd planned to dispose of Isabel for many months. I'd never loved her. I'd loved only science. I wanted her money and Holcomb found it out. That was the risk I ran. But any chance lie in his presence, either by Isabel or myself, bring out the truth, and it did. I had no alternative once he'd discovered that. But to kill him, it's easy enough to throw the blame on Isabel. I had not counted on that terrible compulsion for the truth. That strange affliction of Roger Holcomb. His power over me. Did it transfer itself at his death? To me? Or was it conscience? Pity that it had to end this way. It was a fascinating case. So closes Lazarus Walks, starring Orson Welles. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This rebroadcast is a presentation of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Orson Welles just saying hello before the show starts. There's a full moon tonight. February 11th is the anniversary of the day Thomas Alva Edison was born. He invented the incandescent lamp only to discover years later that Spencer Tracy had beat him to it. <laughs> Welcome to your radio almanac, ladies and gentlemen. At the sign of the flying red horse. Tonight and every night at the same time, over these same stations, the makers of mobile gas and mobile oil bring you Orson Welles. Jack Mather speaking. Our guest tonight comes to us with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producer of the great hit, Madame Curie. Ladies and gentlemen, Ann Southern. You know, I don't mind telling you I'm scared stiff. Well, scared stiff? Why? Well, aren't you going to saw me in half? 
Oh, no, the OPA put a stop to that. They said I was wasting too many women. <laughs> I'm not just a magician, and I'm, I'm a romantic lover, oh. you know. Of course, I don't believe it, but they, they do say that, compared to me, Sinatra is just a boy scout. Mm. <laughs> he may be a boy scout, but a lot of girl scouts belong to his troop. <laughs> Well, uh, don't get me wrong, Anne. I'm not envious. As a matter of fact, in my next Mercury Theater production, I've been thinking of doing Romeo and Juliet with Frank Sinatra as Romeo. Really? Yes. Can't you just hear him singing on the balcony as Juliet climbs up to him? <laughs> oh, listen, I don't want to criticize an old Shakespearean authority like you. But Juliet stands on the balcony and Romeo climbs up to her. I know, but Sinatra would never make it. <laughs> now, look, Ann, we're doing a scene later and you'll find out how romantic I am. Well, if we're going to do a scene together, I'd better give you a couple of pointers. Pointers? Yes, now let me show you. Now, put your arms around My me. My arms around you like this? Uh-huh. Now, say something romantic. Oh, my darling. What's funny about that? <laughs> oh, my darling. I love you with an equatorial passion. You ought to see me in Jane Eyre. <laughs> I love you with an equatorial passion that no thermometer can register. Oh, my darling. Pardon me, Anne. Hello? Oh, hello, dear. What? We're only acting. Of course I don't mean it. Honestly, she was only teaching me something. <laughs> well, I know you can. But I, I, but, but... You know I do. I said you know... I said you know I do. I can't say it now. There are people listening. <laughs> I say... I say there are people listening. <laughs> oh, please don't be angry. I'll call you later. Goodbye. Who was that? My laundry man. <laughs> oh, yes, you've got to be awfully nice to them these days Now, let's go on You were saying Ah, yes, darling, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, oh, yes You were saying Thank you for giving it to me again I'll try it once more Darling, I've endeavored to conceal a passion Who's in it, you should see me in Jane Eyre I don't do this, I'm sorry <laughs> I have endeavored to conceal a passion Whose inner fires are broiling the very soul within me I'll oh, take it I'll take it Oh, it says in the script that you will Uh, yeah. Hello? Oh, it's okay. I'll tell him. Orson, your laundryman says he's going home to his mother. <laughs> She's always kidding that way. I'll bet. Now, come on, Orson. Make like Sinatra. <laughs> Kiss me. All right, I will. Uh-uh. Orson, who is this character? This is Mr. P. Bristle, the censor. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wells, but you can't kiss Ann Southern like that. Why? Do you know a better way? He's not allowed to kiss anybody that close to a microphone. Why not? Well, the voice is too romantic. Mr. P. Bristle, what... P. P. Bristle. P. Bristle. Whatever gave you the idea that his voice is romantic? Well, now, just read this letter. Ah, uh, dear sir, whenever Orson Welles speaks, I get goose pimples signed Bella. Bella? What's the address? 602 Beverly Drive. Just as I thought. Bella Lugosi. <laughs> well, I have additional proof. Uh, let me show you. Uh, would you three young ladies please step up on the stage? That's right, right this way. All right, Mr. Wells, say something romantic. You mean, uh, 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 like this? Darling, I love you. <laughs> Orson, pick them up. Are they kidding? You girls don't really think I'm romantic, do you? <laughs> I <think> uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, girls, it's ridiculous anyway, anyone feeling this way about me. I. Uh, oh, just... you. you send us wealthy. He's a killer! Solid, Jack! You see, I wasn't lying. Now go on, say something romantic. Say something romantic, like, uh, like I adore you. <laughs> I can't understand it. That's because you're a man. Thanks. <laughs> How would you feel if you heard Hedy Lamar say, I love you? Ah! <laughs> Anne, 
man pick me up. Oh, girls, can I join the club, too? Yeah. Yeah. Just sing the theme song with this here <laughs> When we heard Frank Sinatra, we all gave out with yells. Gave out with yells. But we're through with Sinatra. Now we swoon for Orson Welles. For Orson Welles. Our lives were all so useless, like boats without the oars. Without the oars. But now our life's worth living. When he says obediently, yo. Shoo, 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 baby. Bye, 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 baby. Papa's off to the seven seas. Don't, don't cry, baby. Don't, don't sigh, baby. Bye, 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 baby. When I get back, we'll live the life of bees. Seems kind of tough now to say goodbye this way. Papa's gonna get rough now so that he can be sweet to you another day. Don't cry, pretty baby. Don't you sigh, my little babe. Shoo, 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 baby. Papa's off to the seven seas. Cry, baby. Don't, don't sigh, baby. Bye, 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 baby. Papa's off to the seven seas. That was Johnny Horace taking the vocal, everybody. Did you like him? Tell me, folks, did you know this? Gasoline for cars is made by blending light and heavy elements. The heavy are for mileage, the light for snappy starts and rapid getaway. Today, some of these lighter, quick-starting elements have gone into gasoline for tanks and planes and ships. And I know that's okay by you. Fortunately, mileage is what matters most these days. And 1944 Mobile Gas will give you all the mileage that you got from peacetime mobile gas. We're proud to say that. What's more, mobile gas can help you get better all-round wartime driving if you'll just follow these simple tips. First, warm up a shivering motor for 30 seconds. That does away with stalling. Second, don't tramp on your accelerator. Step down gently. This will save you gasoline. Third, keep your battery in good shape to turn your engine over quickly. And when you start up, start with mobile gas. It's packed with every wartime mile it's possible to give you. Folks, you'll get your coupons worth when you drive in at the sign of the Flying Red Horse and get trustworthy, mile-worthy mobile gas. We bring you now a story of a boy and a girl. The boy, Joe, is employed as a welder at Pacific Shipyards. The girl, Betty... Is played by Ann Sutherland. ...is employed as a welder at the same shipyard. As was to be expected, Joe and Betty met, and after a whirlwind courtship, they were married. We find them now on the threshold of the little bungalow Joe has rented. There it is, baby. Oh, it's beautiful, Joe. Well, ups a daisy. Here you go. Well, don't drop me. It's bad luck. Well, this is the living room. Mm -hmm. There's the dinette. Oh. And the kitchen. Uh-huh. And the bathroom, and, uh... Uh, there's another room in through there. Uh, I hope it's got a nice gas range. I just love to cook. <laughs> yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice in here, isn't it? Who is this Arthur Lake? Uh, yes, it is nice. Still love me? Well, uh, do you still love me? You know I do. Well, here we are. 
Yes, we certainly are. I... <laughs> nice of them to give you the afternoon off so we could get married. Yes, if they hadn't, we couldn't have. Couldn't have what? Got married. That's true. <laughs> well, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> you can put me down now, dear. Oh, sure, sure. I wonder what time it is. Oh, it's early, about 8 o'clock. Will you excuse me, dear? Yes, certainly. I'll be back in a minute, as soon as I unpack my bag. Well, I'll unpack mine, too. <laughs> I think I'll wear this blue one. Oh, darling! Yes? Will you knock before you come in? In a minute. <laughs> Andre! Blue, my favorite color. Joe, what kind of pajamas are those? Those aren't pajamas, they're overalls. <laughs> overalls? Yes, didn't I tell you? I'm on the night shift. See you in the morning, hon. <laughs> oh, yes. Joe forgot to mention he's on the night shift and Betty's on the day shift. They see each other 15 minutes a day. So let's take an average evening. Betty is just coming in the front door. Darling. Darling. Darling! Oh, darn that oval team. I haven't got the heart to wake him up. Of course, if I dropped my lunchbox, he'd wake up by himself. Oh, no, it'd be mean just to drop a lunchbox. <laughs> And yet, if it was on the edge of this table and I was looking for something else and accidentally pushed it with my elbow... Okay, boys, launch her! <laughs> Darling! Darling, I didn't expect to find you up. Oh, turn the light out, will you, dear? I'm tired. Oh, but this is practically our honeymoon. Can't you be romantic even for a little while? Romantic, darling. I love you with an equatorial passion. No thermometer can register. Now leave me alone. I'm sleepy. Oh, I never should have married you. People told me you were no good. What people? Hello, Hopper! <laughs> Let me sleep. Oh, you're a beast. That's what you are. You, you only think of your oh. own comfort. Oh, now, wait a minute. Here, I've been welding for eight hours, and I want a little home. Oh, now, baby, don't cry. <laughs> Darling, you mustn't cry. <laughs> Honey, please don't cry. <laughs> you know I love you. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> I'm going home to mother. Oh, now, wait, honey. I didn't mean it. I lost my temper. <laughs> <laughs> then say it. Say it. Oh, say I don't want to say it, dear. It's silly. Now say it. Say what you promised to say every time you lost your temper. I'm sorry I lost my temper, and if I ever lose it again, I hope Shorty drops a hot rivet in my back pocket and... Oh, this is silly. Go on, finish it. Oh, hot rivet in my back pocket, and if I ever say a harsh word to you again, I hope all my teeth fall out except one, and that one I hope I have a toothache. There, I said it. Oh, Joe Joe, kiss me You bet I will Hey, what time is it? Oh, Joe, it's only 8 o'clock, kiss me I've got five minutes to dress And I have one minute for coffee That leaves me 15 seconds Here How's that? Same old trouble Too little and too late Two weeks pass It is morning Joe is just returning from work Honey! Up, 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 up! Mm-hmm. Honey, the sun is shining. The birds are singing. Tell them to shut up. Well, I must say, this is a nice greeting. Mm-hmm. People work hard all day, and when they come home, they deserve a little relaxation. I'm relaxing, dear. Relaxing? You're sleeping. No, I'm not. I'm wide awake. You've got your eyes closed. No, they're open, dear. I've just got the lids over them. <laughs> what kind of a home life is this? I thought marriage meant meant love and companionship and... and... Uh, <laughs> I know just how you feel, dear, but now I'm sleepy. Well, go ahead and sleep. If that's your idea of a happily married life, go ahead, sleep. Ouch! You struck me, and while my back... 
back was turned. Well, it didn't hurt you that much. You're well insulated. Oh, are you insulting me now? Well, you started it. You were sleeping when I came in. Well, you're always sleeping when I come in. Yeah, but you overdo it. You look contented when you sleep. Well, I can't help the way I look when I sleep. I don't get up to look at myself to see how I look when I sleep. This is no way to live. You working in the day and me working at night... How we're ever going to bring up a family, assuming by some miracle we were to have one. <laughs> Kids never see you all day, and at night they'd be asleep. I don't want them to call me mama. Well, what about me? I've got a husband I see 15 minutes a day. Well, I know the milkman better. Oh, you do? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Now, you listen to me. I put up with a lot. If I don't mind just talking. You think you're a of a sound sleep, then Case 24850, Mrs. W. Go ahead, please. Mr. Anthony. Uh, Mr. Anthony, I've been married for three months now. My husband is... Don't mention any names, please. My, hu- <laughs> My husband works on the night shift and I work on the day shift, and the only time that... Young lady... You must find more time to spend with your husband. uh, That's what I'm trying to do. Then my advice to you is to go home. Go home to your husband. But my husband isn't home now. You see, he works... Just where is your husband, Mrs. W.? He's working. He works on the night shift. I see. How long has your husband been telling you he works on the night (laughs) shift? Since the day we got married, we didn't even have a honeymoon. Oh. Then my advice to you is to go home. Go home to your husband. Speak to him. But that's impossible, Mr. Anthony. We only see each other a few minutes a day. You see, he works on the night shift and I... Then my advice to you is to go Go home. Go go home home to to your your husband. husband. Hello, Mother. I was just going to call you. I've got the most wonderful news. I finally got them to change me to the night shift. Oh, there's Joe, Mother. I'll call you back. Honey. Joe, I've got the most wonderful news. Betty, I've only got a minute. Got to get right back to the yards. Darling, I've been changed to the day shift. <laughs> You know, uh, a lot of Lionel Barrymore's admirers don't know that he's a composer of music. And he wrote us something special for this program. He really did, no? It's not even supposed to be funny. And according to last week's promise, here it is. We think very highly of it. Carnival by Lionel Barrymore, Maestro Lud Gluskin. <laughs> Thank you. 
very fine, Lud. You know, I think Mr. Barrymore uh, really has a future, don't you? <laughs> I'm sure Lionel Barrymore listening in. Uh, hello? Oh, I'm glad you liked it, Lionel. Oh, you couldn't have liked it that much. Oh, the trumpet. The, th oh, the third trumpet player. I'll tell him. Goodbye. Lud, Lionel says your third trumpet player was only using one lip. Friends, we're driving to a different tune today. We don't go far. We can't go fast. And lots of the time, our cars are idle. Consequently, it's much harder for the battery to hold its strength. In fact, a brand new battery loses half its charge in just one month of idleness. Now, don't let your battery run down. You know the well-known moan of the motorist? Darn car is stuck. My battery's dead. Well, that won't happen if you'll pay a visit to a certain fellow first. Your friendly mobile gas dealer. Let him double-check your battery and cables. Ask him to recharge that battery. Yep, your mobile gas dealer is your man. Have him check connections and the terminals to make certain they're not frayed or rusted. Top-notch battery service. That's what you'll get. To save yourself cuss words and start your car at all times pronto, drive in soon. Tomorrow, at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Clothes, furniture, books, the household goods were packed in boxes and trunks. Family had taken rooms in the Chenry house. The old cottage home was gone. Lease, the horse, buggy, and cow were sold off. At the hotel, he'd roped his trunks himself and had written, A. Lincoln, the White House, Washington, D.C. On cards, he fastened on the trunks. He was going to the biggest home in the country, the hardest house in the country to live in. The Atlantic seaboard was the front yard, the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Slope, the colossal backyard. His body, the feet and mouth of him, would be in the White House eating three meals a day and taking a bath every so often. But the heart and mind of him would have to be far away, roaming the immense front yard and backyard, where there were boys fighting, girls scratching each other's faces, children sticking their tongues out calling nasty names at each other. He was to be the father. The Red Indians would actually call him the Great Father. Negroes would call him Massa. And punctilious white men would use the address, Your Excellency. He would be the Supreme Counselor of the American people. Good God, what a job. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12th, the day before his 52nd birthday. He left his home in Illinois for Washington. A cold drizzle of rain was falling. Lincoln and his party were to leave Springfield on the 8 o'clock at the Great Western Railway Station. Chilly gray mist hung on the circle of the prairie horizon. One by one came hundreds of old friends shaking hands, wishing him luck and good speed. All faces solemn. On the platform of the car, he turned and saw his home people. Then he said slowly, amid the soft gray drizzle from the sky, Friends, no one who's never been placed in a like position can understand my feelings at this hour nor the oppressive sadness I feel at this parting. For more than a quarter of a century, I've lived among you, and during all that time, I've received nothing but kindness at your hands. Here I've lived from my youth till now I'm an old man. Here the most sacred trusts of earth were assumed. Here all my children were born. Here one of them lies buried. To you, dear friends, I owe all that I have, all that I am. All the strange checkered past seems to crowd now upon my mind. Today I leave you, I go to assume a task more difficult than that which devolved upon General Washington. Unless the great God who assisted him shall be with me and aid me, I must fail. But if the same omniscient mind and the same almighty arm that directed and protected him shall guide and support me, I shall not fail, I shall succeed. Let us all pray that God of our fathers 
may not forsake us now. With these few words, I must leave you. For how long, I know not. Friends, one and all, I must now bid you an affectionate farewell. Bells rang, there was a grinding of wheels, and the train moved and carried Lincoln away from Springfield. The tears were not yet dry on some faces, and the train had faded into the gray to the east. Some of the crowd said afterwards that Lincoln, too, was in tears. The tears ran down his face as he spoke that morning. And one of the crowd said there were no tears on Lincoln's face. He had a face with dry tears, said this one. He was a man who often had dry tears. of Mobile Gas and Mobile Oil invite you to join us next week, same time, same station. Dr. Well's special guest is Robert Benchley. Right, Dr. Well? Right, Mr. Mather. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, all of us in the Mercury Theater remain, as always, obediently yours. <laughs> Mr. Wells read from Carl Sandburg's Prairie Years, published by Harcourt Brace. Jack Mather speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio show is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. Tonight's program is dedicated to the navigating men on the big Navy patrol planes, to the Army bombers, and to the jobs they're doing. Our planes are named after the stars of Lockheed and Vega. Orion, Electra, Lodestar. The Vega, that was Matin's plane, and Post and Gatti's. One Vega set a round-the-world record. It took another Vega to break it. Then Howard Hughes and another Lockheed did better yet, circle the world in three days, 19 hours, and nine minutes. The Lodestar, that was a commercial transport. Today it's re-engineered and armed to the teeth. We call it the Ventura Bomber. Today, the Ventura Bomber, the Hudson Bomber, and the P-38 Lightning are helping to write history among the stars. Gazing up at the stars, earthbound philosophers and poets used to say, Behold the enormity, how great it is, not to be measured, not to be conceived of. How small a thing is man. Astronomers catalogued the stars and navigators put them to man's use. The navigator tells the ship where to go. He's just as important in the air as on the sea. Not so many years ago, a pilot could only tell where he was going by sticking his head over the side of his plane and looking for landmarks. Then came radio beams, locators, and nowadays dead reckoning and celestial navigation flying by the stars. Now, here's a navigator, name of Carl W. Jones. You haven't read that name in the papers. Not yet unless you happen to subscribe to the Hodgetown Daily Scimitar. An honorable mention went to Carl W. Jones for jackknife and hatchet trailblazing through McGrundy's woods. That's the last time Carl Jones' name appeared in the press, and that was some time ago. It's been almost ten years since Carl was active in the Boy Scouts. Mrs. Jones still has the clipping. 
Mrs. Jones used to get in the papers all the time. The Ladies' Forward League met Wednesday afternoon at the home of Mrs. Walter Jones on 513 North Elm Street. Bridge was played at three tables, after which delicious refreshments were served by Mrs. Jones, and the guests left with many an expression of gratitude for a delightful afternoon. Mrs. Jones doesn't save those clippings. Of course not. All the girls who belong to clubs or groups get their names in the social notes. There's nothing special about me, except I'm Carl's mother. Carl has a girlfriend. And her last moment of celebrity was the time she won a prize for best Eleanor Powell tap dance imitation at the annual A&P Wiener Roast. All hearts were captured by the cute and skillful dancing of little Lucy Carter. Oh, gee, I forgot about that. We have a very extensive research staff, Miss Carter. Why'd you pick on us? Because of Carl. Mrs. Jones, your son is a typical navigator. That's why we picked him. This program isn't dedicated only to Carl. Why not? We well, got the fifth highest rating in his class in training school. He always got good marks in grammar school. A and neatness always. At the grocery store, Mr. Needick said he never had anybody working for him so accurate or careful. Just give Carl a pencil, Mr. Needick used to say, and watch his dust. Never a mistake. Mr. Needick said he ought to be a bookkeeper. Bookkeeper? Mrs. Jones, wouldn't you say that helped him to be a navigator? I'd say it helped. Before we go on with the show, Mrs. Jones, have you anything you'd like to say about the war? No. Miss Carter? Mrs. Jones does a lot. She's fingerprint clerk at the school four afternoons a week, and she serves on the draft board Monday and Tuesday nights. Millie, that was the hired girl, went to work in the shipyard. Most women do their own housework, Lucy. I'm taking lessons in spot welding. Oh, Mrs. Jones goes to classes on first aid, too. Nutrition and first aid. Wednesday and Friday. Well, that doesn't leave you much time for your women's clubs, Mrs. Jones. All the girls are busy now doing things for the war. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. Thank you, Miss Carter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, about Mrs. Jones' son, Carl. I'll give it to you fast. Carl Jones enlisted in the Air Force. At the grocery store where Carl used to work, they said he'd make a good bookkeeper. Carl can add and subtract like 60, but he wanted to fly. And the truth is, he'll never make a first-rate fighter pilot. Jones? Said his commanding officer. Jones, I'm afraid that's about it. I want to fly, sir. If I can't fly... I told you Carl wanted to fly, and besides, there was all that expensive training he'd had. Carl hated to see that going to waste. Jones? Yes, sir? How would you like to be a navigator? A navigator, sir? Uh, Why all the astonishment? Well, sir, you've got to know mathematics backwards and forwards to be a navigator. I didn't make headlines in geometry. Can you add? Yes, sir. What Carl really meant was... And how? Make many mistakes at it? No, sir. Then you can be a navigator. We'd like you to have a try at it, Jones. So Carl took the pencil from behind his ear, so to speak, got himself a sextant and a Bowditch's practical navigator and Weems treatise on aerial navigation and drawing instruments and precision dividers and several Mercator charts and a stopwatch and a few dozen extra pencils. He worked at it hard for 15 weeks, took his place beside a lot of other boys from the stores and offices and colleges of America... Took his place beside a navigator by the name of Christopher Columbus, a trailblazer named of Daniel Boone, who never got lost, no, but he was bewildered once for three days, and a lot of other pathfinders. Carl learned to stand in the plastic glass turret of a bomber and take some sights on the stars and then make some passes with that yellow pencil of his. And lo, he knew where he was. It was magic. Carl Jones, fresh from wrapping butter and cartoning eggs, could intercept starlight, traveling at 180,000 miles a second. Consult his almanacs, fool with his sliding scale, make a few passes with his yellow wand, and by Jupiter, he knew where he was. Holy cat, it... it works. Floating around in space, a thousand miles from anywhere, Carl could find out where he was by Jupiter and by Polaris. And by Sirius and by Lyra. And by about 40 other stars, as well as the sun. He could tell where he was and where he was going and when he'd get there. By the lodestar, he could. And all at once, Carl came to an important realization. He found out he wasn't just a clerk in the big bombers he navigated in practice. He was the manager. He told the pilot where to go. Well, pretty soon Carl got so good they sent him to an airbase in a jungle island in the South Pacific. 
It was so small that from 10,000 feet it looked like a sprig of parsley. A nice location for a thriving business, though. Customers weren't long in coming. Men, our reconnaissance reports a very powerful enemy task force in our vicinity. The vital information goes up on the blackboard. Pencils come out. Carl Jones takes down his biggest order to date. Enemy bears 320 true distance. Enemy disposition. Two aircraft carriers. Four cruisers. Eight destroyers. Objective. Intercept. And attack. So this is it. A far cry from the grocery counter to the plyboard desk of a four-engine bomber loaded with big trouble. Wind is from 60, 15 knots. Going to make an airspeed of 280. Track of 320, true. Uh, brings us out on the enemy's vector to the airspeed ring. Thus, Carl, the Jones boy who ground your coffee medium, now prepares to grind the enemy fine. Speed of 200... Means I'll be coming back, steering 142, making a track of 230 miles. It comes to 43 minutes anyway, before they intercept the enemy fleet. Then, for 43 minutes, and exactly on schedule, rendezvous. The enemy under the wings. The bombers dodging the ak-ak fire, watching for fighters make their runs. Pieces of black rip through the cabin walls. Machine gun bullets wind through the ship. A port engine is hit. The enemy fighters swarm all around the bomber. Then from the bombardier... Arms away! Let's beat it out of here! So they beat it out of there. And with machine gun slugs spanging and humming through the ship, Carl Jones makes some vital corrections for a crippled engine false course to throw off pursuit ships who might find the secret landing field, the change in wind direction and velocity. Very routine. Very. Now, let's see. 145 degrees, making a track of 235 miles. Unperturbed, the yellow pencil moves across the board. The grocer's clerk makes his calculations. In other bombers, clerks and college boys and coal miners hand up slips of paper to the pilots with estimated times of arrival calculated correctly, almost to the second. Theme song for pilots, Show Me the Way to Go Home. Nightfall. The bomber has shaken its pursuers. Her course has changed. More calculations for the navigator. Look at him. Less than six feet tall, with his head among the stars. Stands there with the sectants to his eyes and puts the universe to use. Puts the giants of heaven to work for him. Outside his plastic turret gleam stars. Bigger through the middle than our entire solar system. They work for him. Carl Jones, whom you used to know, peers at them and steers by them. Homing. For he wears the universe like a wristwatch. Balances it like a pencil. Orders and uses it like a navigator. Estimated time of arrival at base 23.27. There she is, boys. We're home. Something went wrong. I don't know how it could have happened. My estimated time of arrival was off. Twelve seconds. ex grocer's clerk takes four-engine bomber out to sea, engages enemy, attacked by enemy fighters, hit by flak, engine knocked out, change of course necessitated, wind changes, brings four-engine bomber home again to a one-cent postage stamp somewhere in the South Pacific. Wonders where he dropped twelve seconds. Earthbound philosophers and poets, gazing up at the stars, used to say, Behold the enormity, how great it is. Not to be measured, not to be conceived of. How small a thing is man. Americans, this is 1942. Look up, what do you see? 
Enormity. The glittering cosmos. And Carl Jones. He's up there in the middle of it. He's doing a great job. That's what the Air Forces say. I always knew he would. How about you, Miss Carter? You're going to marry him. I think he's wonderful. Surprised? I shouldn't be. He hasn't changed any. I guess he was wonderful before. We're just finding it out. Miss Carter, I don't want to embarrass you, but you're wonderful, too. Carl up there in the stars thinks you're wonderful. And you, Mrs. Jones? I dare anybody to make a joke about an American woman's club now. While we're about it, is there anybody who thinks it's funny or dull to be a bookkeeper? Your boy Carl may never make the headlines, Mrs. Jones, but he's proving an important point. It concerns the dignity of man. He doesn't look very small up there compared to the universe. He looks very big. Tonight. Please listen next week. Till then, good night, Americans. This program has come to you from the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. I beg your pardon. Well, go on. I. Do I know you? Not intimately, I think. Well, who are you? A horseman. You've seen horses. Oh, well, of course. That is, but this is a horse. I am a horseman. After all, a horse should be a welcome figure to a party. A little lecture on food. Some people eat horses. In a pinch, yes. Yes. Do you mind if I'm your guest tonight? Not at all. Do you mind if I have certain useful contributions to make to your program? Do you know anything about food from the Americas? I know everything about food. Everywhere. <laughs> Your horse evidently doesn't. He's all ribs. I do not belong to the breed that fattens animals for the slaughter and for the gullets of men. I interrupt your story. Do go on. I intended to. Food. Subsistence and existence. Yes. Yeah. Where there was the promise of food, men went. Where there was grass, tribes, nations, civilization went to feed their livestock, that their livestock might feed them. The rat and the ant have survived because they have known how, somehow, always to have food. The rat and the ant and man. Superlatively inspiring thoughts. But go on. When the rat and the ant compose a symphony or give testimony to God, let me know, man on horseback. Mm -hmm. Go on. Ever since the beginnings of man, his struggle for subsistence has been the story of his life. Interesting. His war and his peace, his hate and his love, his passions and his ideals. All is food. Man, the potent lord of creation who lives only to eat. History and scriptures are full of the literature of meat and bread. And the picture. And behold, Pharaoh did have a dream. He stood by the river, and there came out of the river seven kine, well favored and fat fleshed, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, out of the river, and the ill favored and lean fleshed kine did eat up the well favored. And fat kind. 
But he sent for Joseph out of his dungeon, and Joseph told Pharaoh, This is the wife or of your dream. There shall be seven years of great plenty in Egypt. But afterwards, there shall be seven years of hunger in the land. And the plenty will be forgotten. And hunger shall consume the land. And Joseph told Pharaoh to store up his food in times of plenty. That there should be food enough in the lean years. <laughs> the devil can quote scriptures. Why can't I? Today, the world is at war. There is plenty where the torch is not put to the granaries in the fields. There is hunger where the armies, like locusts, swarm over the tortured lands. Here in the Americas, the torch of war is not yet laid to the fields and bins and granaries. Can America, can this hemisphere alone feed its own and feed a world besides? No. Yes. Will we supply the world with food when it is hungry? Yes. Food. And is it hungry now? It starves. Then there will be food. You need ships to carry food. We'll have the ships. They will be sunk. We'll sink the sinkers. There'll be other ships. And where, tell me, is all this wealth of provender? All this food for yourself and for the rest of the world? Where is so much in the root and on the stock and on the hoof? We have some. We have much. And you, my optimistic friend, who are you? I am a gaucho, and I am only one of many, and there are many such many. I come from the great plains of the Argentine, from the white pampas. A, a cowboy, you would say, up here? I wouldn't. No. Not to you, perhaps, whoever you are, but the other one, the American, yes? Yes, my friend, I would. Ladies and gentlemen, a gaucho, a cowboy, if you please, from the plains of South America. The finest and beefiest beef on earth comes from those plains. Uh, it goes out in ships with ice, um, uh, how you call it? The refrigerated. Uh, yes, and in cans, to where the armies are spread across the world. With the United States, with Mexico, with Uruguay, we have beef enough to feed the world. From the pampas to the huge slaughterhouses goes the beef. Then to be frozen and packed or tinned. And into the ships. Fanning out across the world, across the oceans. Across the equator, past Iceland. Joining the quiet convoy. Watch out! Submarines! Cruising the deadly ocean into the cold, the icy waters of the northern seas. Archangel. Watch out, you fools! Dive bomber! Past submarine, past bomber and surface raider. Mamance. You can't make it! The sea is sown with mine. Murmansk and we're in, boys. We're in with beef from the Argentine. The harbor is mine, I tell you. The sky is full of ruin. Trucks, the railroad, taking the cargo, taking the beef of the Argentine for the sinew of the Russian bear. Food, the ultimate fuel of the offensive. The army again, marching on its stomach. While the people march on their backbone, their nerve, and their knowledge that somewhere on the high seas the food is coming. Russia, Britain, China, Greece... Greece? We perish in our homes. We stiffen by the side of the road. Our eyes grow large and staring. And our ribs are harps for death to play upon. Hmm. Our ribs are harps for death to play upon. Hmm. A skillful figure of speech inviting a sharp, clear picture of the truth. These Greeks are not bad. No, they're not bad at all. Making such words with hunger fall upon them. A worthy race. Descended from the gods indeed. Bravo, brave Greece. I do not care about the speeches that I make. Except the world must listen and help us. Help. We cannot feed upon our bravery. Greece. Breakfast is warm water. Cold water would be torment to shrunken stomachs. Luncheon. Some blades of selected weeds and grasses, some stolen rancid oil. Dinner? A few olives. One has been lucky. And a spoonful of wheat flour. No. Beautiful, the spacious skies. Amber waves of grain. America. Wheat. Bread. Or we die. But the ships. There are no ships. There are ships. Not enough. For that, yes. There must be. Do you want your own people to go hungry? There is enough for all. Have I said you were a fool? Once, I think. You are twice a fool. Because I say there is enough to eat for all. Americans, north and south and central, tell this stranger, tell this rider of a lean horse, 
what you have to give and of your will to give. Talk about Argentina. You ought to have a look at Texas. American cowpuncher. Slightly different in dress from our friend the gaucho, but up to the same game with just about the same instruments. Rising with the sun, resting with the cattle, safely corralled for the night. Not before. Using his rope like an artist, calling it a lasso. Or a riata. Short for la riata, which is where we get the word lariat. But I prefer a rope. It's easier. How rope we call the boladero. I still like playing rope. It's easier. Rope. Riata, boladero. Its aim is the same. Gaucho, vaquero, cowboy. The game is the same. To feed the world. And panhandle or pampas, the business is beef. More beef than you can count from now to the low Sierras. Cattle that move like a dark ocean across the prairies. Cattle as far as the eye can see. Millions of heads. Under the stars of the pampas, riding the range, seeing to the wire. Cowboy in America, riding the range, seeing to the wire. Singing his melancholy song, full of contentment, full of the doing of his appointed job. Let's talk about coffee now. Not exactly a food, but... Closer to it than a good after-dinner cigar, which makes a good dinner taste better and digest better, more than likely. There is more coffee in Brazil than the world can use. Hills of coffee, slopes full of the coffee plunge, mountains of coffee beans. Coffee. Hot and piping. To warm the heart and lift up the spirit. The worker's wine. The soldier's companion. Across the vast sweep of the hemisphere... The farmlands lie open to the mercy or the malice of the zones. Manitoba, Canada, a farmer frowns at a head of wheat. The rust. I should have burned those barberry bushes earlier. That's what spreads the rust. In the dry, difficult plateau of Mexico, a humble farmer rests on his worn spade. It is very hot. It is a world of other people's mouths and of his own pockets. And both need sorely to be filled. And the worn spade moves again. In Ohio, a young farmer violates tradition and neglects to say, I'll be switched. Instead, I'll have to see about an alkalizer for that old strip. It's much too acid. The hydrogen ion potential is way out of sight. The sky does not go unwatched. The waters are measured. The grain and the corn rise and are harvested. The soil surrenders to the farmer. This is your standard of achievement, then? This is the measure of your culture and your civilization, which you esteem so well and consider worth saving from starvation. An ocean of coffee channeling through your exalted system. <laughs> oh, these men. These worthy, worthy men. I just thought I'd show you that we set some store in what is not necessity. By way of showing that there's plenty and to spare. You'd uh, probably be interested in the more substantial things like beef. Consider the potato. Oh, yes. The potato. That dirty stone in the muck for men to scrabble at. The potato. Humble tuber. Let me see. To that miserable fleshy food that Sir John Hawkins took back to England from the New World, wasn't it? Oh, I can tell you about the potato. It saved an entire people from starvation once. The more is the pity. See, here, you don't like people much, do you? The world is overcrowded. Let us return to the noble potato, savior of a people. All right. 
You tell me, and then I'll tell you. Sir John brought potatoes back to England. That wasn't really their name, but the white man couldn't pronounce so impossible a word as batata, which is their real name. It's too much for man's highly advertised culture. Go on. The potatoes landed in England, whereupon the English king, full of kingly sanctimony, the milk of human kindness, had them dispatched to Ireland as food and for further cultivation. <laughs> the Irish, it appears, were starving to death. The uh, potatoes saved them and have continued to do so from time to time. And the Americas produce enough potatoes to feed every one of the United Nations once we get the bottoms and the wheels to ship them on. Potatoes uh, did a great deal to relieve the siege of Stalingrad. I myself have no particular liking for potatoes. You uh, develop a taste for them in besieged cities. <laughs> yes. And they're not bad with onions and gravy, convoyed by steak, hamburger, a leg of lamb, and some of that South American coffee. Remember? I don't care for potatoes. What do you care for? I have three comrades. The log of the horsey set, too. Yes. If they're all like you, you can have them. They are very much like me. But I thank you for them. Take a look around you from the train window in the plain states. Or from that saddle on your emaciated horse, mister. And see a heap of corn on the stalk. All kinds. Corn, maize. Ranks and ranks of it. High, full, strong, full of starch, sugar, calories. The fields of waving grain you may have heard about in that song. Wheat, then corn, wheat, and more corn. Planted in strips, planted with tricks and savvy by Americans who've learned how to get the best out of corn and the best out of the soil that corn grows on by rotating crops and rebuilding the earth that the corn breaks down. Corn being the sinewy, substantial stuff that it is, it takes a lot out of the soil. But American farmers have what it takes, and they put it back again. And that's why there's enough of it to go around. It didn't just grow. It was out there and nursed and kitted and persuaded and browbeaten up to where it is today. It took know-how in the United States and Illinois, in Iowa and Nebraska. And it took know-how and savvy in Argentina, where the corn grows tall and the corn grows numerous. American farmers in the Americas had to whisper sweet something to those big golden ears of corn. They got corn. A whopping big lot of corn. Enough and more than enough to go around. Americans. The Americas. You, uh, <clears throat> find something gravely wrong with them? I reserve my privilege to despise them. I hate the fat lushness of America. That ain't fat, mister. That's muscle, evenly distributed. Beautiful, spacious skies. Amber waves of green. That's right. Wheat. Bread wheat. Macaroni wheat. Mm -hmm. Plum wheat. Mm -hmm. Lots of wheat. And anything under a billion bushels a year is strictly bush laid these days. Mountain majesties. The fruity plain. <laughs> Lyrical. You don't care for oranges and vitamin C. <clears throat> you hate apples I and pears and peaches. And you're not happy in the Santa Clara Valley. You probably think George Washington did exactly right when he chopped down the cherry tree. I reserve my privilege to hate at my pleasure. Well, you certainly are having a lot of fun, whoever you are. And I repeat, I hate America. Will I find out why? Perhaps. I should happen to lose my temper. Maybe this will do it. I don't know. Bananas. Bananas. Yes, we have no bananas. Bananas were brought up from Central America as an experiment. They were a smash heap overnight. We are not amused. Nuts. I beg your pardon. Uh, nuts. One South American nut that you won't approve of, mister, because it's very well liked by plain people... Is the cocoa. They make cocoa chocolate from the nibs of the cocoa bean. Chocolate is one of the greatest items in the diet of the entire world. As a delicacy. As a delicacy for a decadent people that are better off dead. As a food, then, for millions of people. As a source of quick energy and chocolate bars for soldiers. 
purposely made unpalatable so that the soldiers won't eat them unless they really have to. Civilization going really mad. Americans alone drink 2,730,000,000 cups of chocolate every year. Oh, how interesting. Mm -hmm. Gives you the uh, haunting idea that there must be an awful lot of cocoa in Brazil. Enough to count in the whirlpool. That's 170,625,000 gallons of chocolate. Oh, hum. Oh, hum, indeed. But a fleet of super battleships, 16 in number and weighing over 40,000 tons, each could be floated on that much chocolate. Could it indeed? Well... It could. Manner of speaking, maybe it will. Maybe it will. Shredded coconut comes from down there, too. And we use the coconut shell in making gas masks. America is where someone once took a chance and ate the vegetable called a love apple. And found out by the horn spoon it wasn't poisonous after all. We call it a tomato. Today, and its juice is a cheap and potent source of natural water, soluble vitamins. For a world that doesn't precisely reek with vitamins, where they're needed most urgently, most pathetically, and where by the grace of God and the watchfulness of a few tin cans and corvettes, they're arriving because we have a lot of tomatoes that we know what to do with. All over the Americas, tomatoes are numerous. There are no tomatoes in Europe that we don't send. They're as American as covered wagons and a short left jab. Only more helpful. Are you quite finished? No champion of the groaning board. Is the rhapsody concluded? Have you sung enough of the Americas and their preoccupation with their own innards? Those of all the world? Have the men of ideals and ideas had enough to eat? We haven't heard from Chile yet. These people out here are going to be interested in knowing, I think, that the famous chili bean has a lot in common with all the tall, strapping men who are called Tex, because they've never been to Texas. Chili beans are most largely produced in the United States. Hence, they're called chili beans. Now, I know my unhappy friend here who rides a meager horse disapproves of this kind of talk, but... Mm -hmm. I've stopped trying to understand a man who says he hates Americans. I do who says he hates all the Americas and the whole Western Hemisphere. I do. Venomously. Buponically. You said you'd like to make some contributions to the discussion of the Americas as the provider. After you, great champion of your people. Cuba. Mm -hmm. And the Cubans. We're Americans, and you're at liberty not to like them either. And the Cubans are at liberty to be at liberty. Cuba is the world sugar bowl. And in a way, sugar set Cuba free. Even before 1898. The thick Cuban sugar cane is cut with a murderous-looking instrument called a machete. A machete, charged by those liberty-loving Cubans, was a terrible thing to see. So the Spaniards didn't stay around to see it. Western Hemisphere can feed the world. It has quantity. It has infinite variety. The limits of both have never been tried. There is no philosophy beyond the facts. Others need, we have. We are richly able to share. We do share. We must share more. We shall. That is the simple progression. If it is broken, we are broken. For more and more we live for and by our fellows in this world. We can reenact the miracle of the loaves in modern dress so that it becomes the science of the loaves. Man does not live by bread alone, but without bread at all, he also perishes. Challenge, challenge, challenge. You speak so much of golden grains that you yourself become mealy-mouthed. All right. Out with it, then. What do you challenge, man on a lean horse? That your precious man does not live by bread alone. Ah, <laughs> he does. And by nothing else. He lives by the sweat of his brow. For the satisfaction of his stomach. You put it more simply before. You said he lives to eat. And nothing more. 
exalted orator, notwithstanding the Lord of creatures is himself a creature, created only to experience a few brute senses, then to perish. Why do you try to make it seem otherwise? To set a higher purpose for the miserable species. The grubbing nature of the beast is so apparent. Just apparent to me. Because you're one of them. A slug, a snail, a primitive. The turkey gobbling through the field of locusts. Concerned only and completely with eating and digestion. What do men do, these pretenders to divinity? They kneel and scrabble in the muck, planting and growing to eat. All other ends are nothing. Only eat. Feed the organism. Nourish the insistent cells. Then languish in a stupor of appeasement until hunger comes again. Then eat. Nourish oneself. It's unhappily necessary to nourish the earth first. The earth. Made up of death. Since the world began. They dabble about in the mud. Raking in foul things that send a stench to high heaven. Nod and smirk at each other. And say, we enrich the soil. This is a good thing that we do. No. I don't like anything you've said tonight. It's man's individual destiny what becomes of him. No. Hands off policy. Isolationist, huh? If man must perish, then he must. Why change things? He's marked for starvation. Let him starve and be done with it. Not as important as you make him out to be. Not by far. I disagree. As I disagree with you. As I abhor the things you fancy. As I revile your amber waves of grain. And your fruited plains. And your babble and prattle of plenty. Your continents and their meddlesome fertility. I hate them. For they are wasteful and prodigal, contrary to the law of survival, of selection. I tell you, I hate America, for I am famine. I am the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. I am famine. And America is my enemy. The Mercury Theater on the air. Columbia Broadcasting System welcomes you to the 14th program in its weekly series featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. Tonight, this brilliant Broadway company turns from their cycle of dramatized literary classics to relive for us a stirring adventure of recent history. It is Orson Welles' own adaptation of Hell on Ice by Commander Edward Ellsberg, the gripping story of a disastrous early expedition to the North Pole. My name is Melville. As retired chief engineer of our Navy, fair share of honors come my way. The engines and boilers which drove the Oregon 12,000 miles under forced draft to take a place in the battle line at San Diego were my creation. Since then, I've designed the engines for half the warships that show the American flag. But now, as I look back over my life, 
I can only humbly hope that the name of George Melville may be a little remembered as one who served under Captain DeLong on the last voyage of the steamship Jeanette. I still read and reread my log of that trip. Though the ink's been dry near 30 years. Here's the first entry. July 8th, 1879. 3.40 p.m. Pacific time. Jeanette weighed anchor. Destination, the North Pole. Already below. Already below, Captain DeLong. Ready, Keith? Ready, Captain. Have steam in the harbor? Yes, sir. The Navy has done a thorough job on the Jeanette. They built an extra sheeting around a hull of six-inch Oregon pine belted down with iron straps and a truss of massive beams across a blockhead. I remember noticing as soon as we were underway, Jeanette wallowed a bit in the waves instead of knifing them clean. But she was a small ship, 420-ton in displacement, 142 foot long, 25 feet in beam. And grossly overloaded with three years' provisions and bunkers full of coal. Remember the first roll call on deck? Still Mel Hill? Yes, sir. Still Tip? Yes, sir. Chip, second in command. Fifteen years at the China Station. A small man with a beard like General Grant. Still Yes, sir. Denon Hour, our navigator. Twenty-nine years old. Heavy built. No previous Arctic experience, but... Serve to navigate the fleet around the globe. Dr. Ambler? Yes, sir. Ambler, small but sturdy. High-ranking surgeon. Collins? Yeah. Jerome Collins, a Herald reporter sent by Bennett for his own reasons as a meteorologist. One of our two civilians technically listed as seaman but quartered with the officers. The other was Newcomb, a scientist, a nervous, testy little fellow. Mr. Newcomb? Yes, sir. For her, the crew of 23 all Navy men, hand-picked. One Chinese cook. We steamed out the Golden Gate. The cheering crowds were black on Telegraph Hill. Mr. Melville, the captain wants to see you on the bridge, sir. All right. I'll never forget seeing him on the bridge together. George Washington DeLong. Scholarly appearing man with glasses. Commander of naval vessels for 20 years on the seven seas. And by his side with her pretty head flung back. Emma DeLong. Chief, I want you to meet Mrs. DeLong before she deserts her husband. How do you do? Glad to meet you, ma'am. Mr. Melville, tell me. What do you think of a husband who'd rather go off to the North Pole than stay home with his wife? Being a bachelor, don't know if I can stay, Mrs. DeLong. <laughs> now, Emma, the people think you really don't want me to go. <laughs> <laughs> and now, George, something I have for you. And no, no, stay here, Mr. Melville. Right. I want you to be a witness. It's your flag. Mm-hmm. I want you to unfold it at the... Yeah. At the point farthest north. Point Father's North. The North Star, George. I'll watch it and we'll be looking at the same thing. Things equal to the same thing. Remember your geometry, Captain? I remember. Well? Chief, take care of it. And good luck. You sure will. I'll ride over to the yacht with you. For a few brief minutes, the Jeanette rolled in the swells while our starboard whaleboat was man-lowered and shoved off, carrying towards a lone yacht which now lay off to our quarter, Emma DeLong and her husband. A brief embrace, and DeLong, balancing himself on the thwarts, handed his wife up over the low side of the yacht. Another moment, and seated in the stern sheets of the whaleboat, DeLong was once more simply the sailor, sharply as commands traveled across the waves. And our whaleboat came back to us, rounded to under the davits, and was hoisted aboard. And then we got underway. For a few minutes with strained eyes, I 
watched a white handkerchief fluttering across the water at us. And it faded in the distance. Of our passage to Alaska, there's not much in my journal. August 2nd, with the aid of a tow hook, baited with salt pork, our scientist Newcomb bagged an albatross. Crew none too pleased. The ancient superstitions of the sea persist even to the day of steamships. August 14th. Course set north by northwest. Through Bering Straits and into the Arctic Sea. And off the coast of Alaska toward Wrangell Island. September 2nd. Stray ice drift sighted two miles to port. September 4th. Ice flows increasing. Surprising this time of year. September 6th. Ice! Ice hole! Ice hole! Captain! Captain! Eric, where is it? It is ahead, Captain. And on the way the bow. It's a ship. Yes. Ice ahead. Ice? Oh, I'm going to hard to leave. Every man to his Hard to leave. Every man to his station. Bring a fast ship. Closing fast. No use, sir. She won't clear it. Ice 200 feet ahead. Ice to starboard. We're going to strike, Captain. Try the engine. There, Chief. Yes, sir. We'll try the engine. Ready, Chief? Yes, sir. Hold steam astern. for us, that 19-inch planking of the floor would have stove us in. As far as we could see, the pack was unbroken. Except in back of us, a narrow lane of open sea. Supper that night was a somber meal. Here was ice only 240 miles north of Siberia, latitude 71 degrees, 30 minutes, where it had no business to be at this time of the year. Finally, the captain, chewing earnestly away on his mutton, broke a silence that was almost as solid as the ice pack. Well, Mr. Chip, do you think by morning we'll find a lead to this ice to Wrangell Island? No, Captain. We won't. Seem pretty certain, Mr. Chip. What's more, while God's given you a chance, I'd back the Jeanette into that little hole astern and head out of this ice pack to open water. Before the bottom drops out of the thermometer and we're frozen in. What are the rest, do you think? Tell an hour, what do you think? You're a navigator. I think that Chinese cook's cough is even worse than usual, sir. <laughs> All water and no coffee beans. <laughs> what do you say, Chief? Well, maybe our Sam's saving coffee. In case the ice pack holds. Collins here seems to be able to drink his. What I drink is my own affair. Oh, don't take it so hard, Collins. Hey, our Sam. Nothing. Our Sam, you call this coffee. It tastes like the Arctic Ocean. All the same water make coffee? Poop up and pails? I thought so. Doctor, how about that? Salt water coffee. You can't use salt water, our Sam. You've got to distill it. Or we'll all be done with the scurvy before we're off this ice. We're not on it yet, Doc. A heavy gale would break up this pack. And break the Jeanette along with it. Well, what better can we do, Mr. Chip? We can back out this lane and then head east. A whale will stay in open water further north than this on the Alaska side. No use, pilot. We're not whaling and we'll not go east. We're heading for Wrangell Island. It's our only chance to make the pole. More coffee, everybody? Next morning it was too late. During the night the temperature fell to 23 below. Young ice forming over the open patches of water cemented together the old pack with the Jeanette stranded in the middle. 
At noon, we were ordered to the captain's quarters. Gentlemen, it looks bad. Tied up in the ice before summer's over. We've got to break loose. Chief, how long will it take to get steam up? A half hour, sir. Break the fires and hurry it up. Ten an hour? Yes, sir. Take soundings of the ice. Get the direction of its drift. Yes, sir. Chip, pick your men from the crew and prepare to dynamite the ice around the rudder. We'll try it, sir. The next three hours, we nearly tore the engines off their bed plates and the smoking thrust block off its foundation while the Jeanette rammed, squeezed, backed, and butted her way through the ice. That night, the temperature dropped again. I have before me Chip's entry, which I copied in my journal. September 6, 1879. Temperature 17 degrees. Ice frozen 3 to 7 feet. Drift south by southeast. Starboard list of nine degrees. Next day, with broken ice piling up all along our side, the captain gave the order to unship the rudder. So the end of the first week found us a rudderless ship, drifting with the ice pack. All chance of exploration gone. Stopped at latitude 71 degrees north, which had been reached in these same waters 20 years before by an ordinary sailing ship. Next day, we let the dogs loose on the ice. Late that afternoon, a bear was sighted. Linderman, Collins, and Dan and I set off across the ice in pursuit. And an hour later, the captain came up on deck. Have Linderman most of the crew, Mr. Chip. Linderman, sir? Well, yes, of course, he has the watch now. Sorry, Captain, but Linderman's chasing a bear. He must be over a mile away by now. Linderman gone? Who gave him permission to leave? Was it Dan and Hour? Tell Mr. Dan and Hour I want to see him right away. Dan's gone too, sir. He followed Nindeman after the bear. Who'd they leave in charge on deck? I don't know, Captain. Well, this won't do. Even if we are on the ice, I can't have my crew disappearing from the ship whenever they see fit. That evening, I happened to be in the cabin with Collins. Evening, Mr. Malva. Hello, no, Sam. Mr. Collins, note from Cotton. All right, all right, Sam. I said all right. Yes, sir. Very well, Mr. Collins. Well, I wonder what's on His Majesty's mind tonight. Hereafter, no one will leave the ship without my permission, except in an emergency. A bear is not an emergency. Please initial this in return. George the long captain. Hmm. There it is, Chief. I'm trapped. <laughs> what? I'm a newspaper man, not a sailor. Back in the States, my brother warned me I shouldn't ship on this cruise as a seaman. Like a fool, I didn't believe him. Now it's happened. And I'm trapped. Trapped. <laughs> What's ailing you, Collins? We're all trapped in the ice. You're no worse off than the rest of us. No, it's not the ice, Chief. The captain. You're all right. You're an officer. But I'm signed up as a seaman. He's got me just where he wants me. Ah, don't be a fool, cop. Don't you live in the cabin, mess with the officers, muster with the officers? What more do you want? Some gold lace on your sleeve? But look at this order. And delivered by a Chinese cook. And that order hits me and every other man on board as much as it does you. That order's aimed at me. But he can't persecute me. I'll show him. I'm covering this expedition for my paper. When we get home, I'll have plenty to tell about the way Captain DeLong ran this expedition. 
The truth was that after two months in the cabin of the Jeanette, we were beginning to get tired of each other's company. This same day, the captain wrote in his log. Same faces at every meal. The same irritations pricking our nerves. The same routine day after day. No shore leave. No ports to visit. Nothing but endless ice. And no hope of change until next summer. Unless a gale breaks up the pack. Drifting willy-nilly a thousand miles from that pole which in a blaze of publicity we had set out to conquer. September passed, and the gales we had hoped for failed to materialize. October came and went. Break in the ice! Break in the ice! Oh, oh, Mr. Chip, where's the captain? Oh, captain! Captain along! What is it? What's going on? It's a crack in the ice. Look, you can see it from here. My instruments! Look, captain, it's spreading. Yes. It's getting wider. Uh, Chip, take some of the men and help Colin salvage his instruments. Quick, before it's too late. Quick! Down there! 400 feet of high! By the time we went to bed, it opened up leads of water all around us that looked like veins of ink in that vast white field. Didn't get much sleep. Hardly had the mid-watch ended when through an open canal scarcely a hundred yards away, huge ice cliffs as high as three-story buildings were bearing down on our ship. Let's do a band and fix. Ship, turn to with all hands to unload the dinghy. Yes, sir. Provision. Send a hand, please. Yes, sir. I'll unpack your instrument. Yes, sir. Dan, uh, my log, the record, Captain. Nearer, nearer crept that mass of shrieking ice. Our starboard deck arched up like a cat's back under the strain. Pitch and oakum were squeezed like syrup out of the Jeanette seam. Hundred feet away, Captain. Seven five. everybody. Breakfast ready. And then began our unchanging round of dreary days. Day and night were now the same. The perpetual dusk of Arctic winter. No hope of escape until next summer thaw. I turned back the captain's log. He could write in a few words. The rest of us felt and couldn't say. December 1st. On board the Jeanette. By now we've told all our stories. Read all our books. Played all our games. We awake to the same faces, the same dogs, the same ice. We take the same exercise, make the same calculations of the drift, eat the same food and return each night 
to the same beds with the conviction that tomorrow will be the same as today. In my own diary, I find a different entry, December 24th, our first Christmas Eve on the ice. We gathered in the wardroom, a glum group, if ever there was one. Ship with a bad cold, then an hour with a black patch over his eye, the ice glad infected, Surgeon Ambler, tied out for nursing sick officers and crew. Newcomb, more silent than ever, and the captain and myself. Only Collins' chair was empty as usual. He'd eaten and left us as soon as he could. Half hour passed, mostly in silence. Hey, what kind of a Christmas celebration do you call this? I never saw so many grouches at one table in my life. How about some mistletoe over the rigging? I might catch an Arctic mermaid like Ninky caught this albatross. Newcomb's my name. Mm, so it is. Excuse me. Nink would have her all stuffed before any of the rest of us could get to her. Lay off with you, Dan and I. I don't think that's funny. Can't you take a little from Newcomb, even on Christmas? As your doctor, I prescribe a broad smile. Say three times a day before meals. I'll smile when there's anything to smile about, doctor. Well... What about this? Holy mackerel. Irish whiskey. Hand it over, Chief. <laughs> Where's the captain? Oh, thanks, Chief. And Dr. Ambler. Thanks. Yeah. Here, uh, I'll pour my own. Devil done and all. You've only got one good eye. I can always see well enough for this. Hey, that's enough, Dan. They're going to say something to the crew, you know. Well, Newcomb, how about you? What's it like? Is it good with you? <laughs> <laughs> give me a written guarantee, Chief. Newcomb's my name. I'd give you another if I'd have been your old man. Don't waste any of that stuff on him, Chief. Take your whiskey and go to the devil. Well, that's a nice Christmas thought. Yeah. Well, I had to forget him. Can't help it, I guess. Hey, how about a toast? If anyone proposes James Gordon Bennett, I'll follow Ninky. <laughs> yeah. Chip's got one. I can see it fizzing. Yes, I have. I propose a toast to Emma DeLong. Thank you, Chip. I... I couldn't say it, but I was thinking that, too. Emma DeLong. Emma DeLong. Well, now, gentlemen, I have a toast. To the Jeanette. And next summer, her safe passage to the pole. The Jeanette and that. Jeanette. Jeanette. January 5th, temperature 57 below zero. Drift still to the southeast. Sun appeared for the first time since November. Today, Doc Ambler had to operate on Dan and I's eye. He has to... Sit in the cabin without a crack of light. We take turns talking to him. Speaker next summer. The breakup of the ice. He likes to talk about that. February 1st. More trouble. Preparing rusty floor plates in the boiler room, I noticed Erickson, Bozen of the crew, and one of our best workers was laying down on the job. He stopped working every time I turned my back. Decided he was sick and sent for Dr. Ambler to look him over. Chief, he am not sick. He is watched. Who's watching him, Nels? What are you talking about? There is mute to me on the ship. Mute me. There is mute to me on the ship. Oh, now, look here, Erickson. Take it easy. Tell me more about it. There is mute to me, sir. On the ship, sir. Mute me. And the crow? Hey, where'd you get this, Erickson? Yeah, Chief. They tell you it is like they say. They was asked to join. They no say yeah. They no say no. So he is watched. They got guns. They kill me for it if I tell. Erickson. Yeah? Speak fast and answer my questions. Who's their leader? They no can tell. They kill me. Oh, nonsense. Yeah, Chief. They say they kill me. Erickson. 
What do you mean by they? Hey, please, Kano can tell us. They killed I'm him. your officer. Do you know what disobedience means? Now, come on. What's behind this? It is... Nobody hear us. Nobody. It is... Our Sam. Our Sam? Oh, Sam, Chinese cook. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, Chief, it's been like I said. It's you, to me. Nels. Yeah? Nels, look here. Yeah. No. Now look at me. Yeah. Uh, right in my eyes, Nels. Yeah. Follow my fingers. I move it. Your finger? Yeah. Yeah. Here? Yeah. No. Over here. Yeah. Nels. Yeah. Nels, we're going to see Dr. Amber. Oh, no, but then they kill me, sure. I won't let them, Nels. I'll take care of you. Yeah, but they kill yeah. you. Yeah. I know. All right, now, take my hand, now, Seth. Yeah, yeah. That's a good fellow. Now, come along. January 6th. Four months on the ice. Part of the crew sick. A blinded officer. Now a seaman gone mad. What will this ice do to us before this winter's over? are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original adaptation of Hell on Ice by Commander Edward Ellsberg. We pause a moment for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hell on Ice, Commander Ellsberg's account of the disastrous polar expedition of the Jeanette, relived by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. On February 25th, after six months in the ice, the Jeanette's position was 74 degrees, 11 minutes north. We were still drifting, waiting for the thaw to free us. March 5th, first glimpse of sunshine. Three minutes of bleak twilight, then darkness again. March 30th, temperature rising, noon reading five above zero. I still 14 feet thick. So June ended. July came with a fog and chilling mist. Our hopes for what the summer sun would do are beginning to fade. Temperature rises, then drops again. We find rifts in the ice at sundown and see them knit again overnight. The day grows shorter and with the men's tempers. Half the men aren't speaking to the other half. Collins quarreled with Ambler over the slamming of a door. Mr. Chip just asked Newcomb about an ice measurement he'd taken and the little scientist wouldn't answer since the query was in the line of duty, Chip reported the incident. Captain. Newcomb, I have Mr. Chip's report that you failed to give him an observation. Well? It's in Chip's province to receive that information and enter it in the ship's record. I was going to write it on a piece of paper and hand it to him. Come, come, Newcomb. Let's forget such childish play and we'll all get along better. Don't I do my duty, sir? Yes. And I'll take good care you continue to. Very well, sir. If I do my duty, I must respectfully continue the privilege of being silent as long as I please. Can I go, sir? Yes. You may go. The captain's entry on the anniversary of the day we first froze in states what all of us knew and none dared say. September 6th. Another winter on the ice. Crew look at me with a mute appeal that's pitiful to see. 
I know what they're wondering. Will it be another winter? Another year? Or will it be forever? But none of us talk about that. We keep it our routine as if our lives depended on it. October 10th. Collins took his time about making his observations today. He didn't report on the ice till 20 past 12. When he finally came out, the captain was waiting for him. Well, Collins, has it required all this time to log your noon observations? I uh, hardly know the meaning of your question, Captain DeLong. Seems to me my words are plain enough, Mr. Collins. Well, perhaps I might have done it quicker, but I didn't know my minutes were being counted for me. I've issued an order for an hour's ex- exercise. I've noticed for several days you've been cutting down that time. Today I'm satisfied you're doing it deliberately. Very well, if you're satisfied, Captain, I've nothing more to say. But you're doing me a great injustice. Mr. Collins, that's an impertinent comment. I don't like your manner and bearing in talking with me. Well, I don't like the manner you speak to me either. I'm your commanding officer. I'm merely informing you of a breach of discipline. And when you say that, I say it isn't true. I'm making allowances for your ignorance of naval regulations. But I advise you not to repeat that contradiction. When you charge me with violating an order, I deny it, and I'll repeat that as much as I please. Enough, Mr. Collins. When we get back to the United States, I'll have you court-martialed. Meanwhile, turn in your instruments and perform no further duties on the ship. You're under arrest. Temperature reached 59 below. Scurvy set in. Eight men down with frostbite. Spring finally rounded the calendar. You can call it spring at 10 degrees below zero in the frozen pack. In May, we saw the sun again. June 10th. My watch, 9 p.m. till midnight. 11 p.m. Disturbed by heavy shocks drumming against our hollow hull. Those words were all I had time to write. I remember the captain rushed up on deck. This evening, even at midnight, the sun's above the horizon. We could see about 80 yards ahead. A lead had opened in the pack some ten feet wide with cracks zigzagging across the surface of the ice, moving towards us. Then the floe split wide apart beneath us. The Jeanette lurched wildly to port and suddenly slipped off the ice into open water. We were thrown across the deck. The ship rolled like a drunken man. Shaking in terror, we waited for the next move. Six bells, the pack started to press down that open canal. Slowly, it closed in on us. Mostly flat closed this time, but thick and jagged. And behind it, the push of endless miles of surging ice. On came the pack. No turning off this time. The ice reached our side, started to squeeze. We're thinking, Captain. Ice is coming through the side. What's that? Ice in the hole? Right down, ship. Pete, you're an experienced seaman. Take your report to me as if you were one. Seams are opening below, sir. The sides will give way. It's only a question of minutes. Very well. Come with me, Keith. We started for the hatchway. At that instant, the ice got its teeth in her hull and snapped to sprinters. Abandoned ship! Yes, sir! Ship! Lower boat! Yes, sir! Erickson! And the damage! Quartermaster, Lee! Yes, sir! Unload provision! All you can save! I'll check them at the rail! Yes, sir! Chief, my instrument! I'll get... Uh, come on, Lee! I'll need all the engine crew! Sledges, Cole! Go with them fast! Yes, sir! I'll check provision! Hermicus, three barrels! Toss it over the starboard side! Watch out, Billow! What's the list, Chip? Here, 30 degrees! Watch your footing, man! Careful, they were down an hour! See, he doesn't fall, Doc. Yes, Chip. Lower him in the boat. And keep your eyes closed. Here, Iverson, you too. Hold on. Newcomb! 
What are you doing with those tough birds? I've only talked to some of them. Far away, boys. Over the side. Going fast, Skipper. Better jump for it, hadn't we? Abandon ship, men. Over the side. Over the side. The jump was the captain. Scattered over the ice like flies, we watched the doomed Jeanette. She lay far over on her beam's end. The smokestack broke off at its base. A crumbled deck bulged upwards. She slowly rose upright over the pack. Her black hull began to slide down, down through the crack. A yard banging down on the ice, stripped from the masts. Finally, the top foremost plunged through the ice and the Jeanette... Silent now. Slipped down to her arctic grave. The situation was now desperate. Truly desperate. Thirty-three men. Cast away on drifting ice floes. Our fate totally unknown to the world we'd left two years ago beyond possible reach of relief. Five hundred miles away lay the Lena Delta. June 17th, 6 p.m. We made our start, course due south. First day's journey was a nightmare. Men and officers harnessed together, tugging at their far ahead, planting black flags to mark our course. Sledges sinking in weak ice. Men wading through slush up to their knees. Cannon Howard blind but pulling on a rope fell in open water. Pulled him out before he went under the ice. Lee and Erickson collapsed in a harness. One sledge used for dragging the sick. Chip, all in, tried to fling himself from the hospital sledge to save us weight. But we strapped him in. Chip cried like a baby at adding to our burden. Unloaded and ferried over open water. Dogs drowned as Cutter overturned. Only saved Snoozer, my favorite. By morning, reached our two-mile flag. Tried to get some sleep. On again at evening when the ice firmer. June 23rd. At dawn, the first sledge reached Ambler's 12-mile flag. The men stumbled into camp and lay exhausted on the ice, temperature 34 below. The captain called me into his tent. Well, Chief, what do you think? There's hardly enough food to last 60 days, Captain. We've only made 12 miles in seven days. See, now that leaves... Don't say it. There's something else I think you ought to know. With Dan and Chip knocked out, you're the only officer left I can confide in outside of Ambler. He's got his hands full with the sick. That doesn't sound like good news. Well, shoot, brother. In six days, we've made 12 miles south. Right? We're just about to. Well, we're 20 miles further north tonight than the day we started. What? Wait, Captain. Let me get this straight, you see. We're north of where the Jeanette sank. Twenty miles. The Norwest Drift's got us in tow. Are you sure? You saw me shooting the sun, two meridian, altitude, and a couple of Sumner lines, and they all checked. Uh, I am sorry I had to spill it, but some officer must know where we are in case something happens to me. Sure, Captain. Sure, I'm trying to clip my breath, but I'm all right now. Uh, don't tell anyone else. The men found out I, I couldn't get them to lay a hand on another sledge. Yeah. They just sit here and wait to die. Got a plan, Captain. What is it? Yeah. Look at this map. Back here is where the Jeanette sank. And here's where we are today. That's right. 77 degrees, 43 minutes north. We're walking against the drift and the pack's moving faster than we are. I'm changing our course from south to southwest. That way, we've got a chance of reaching the edge. Uh, one chance in a hundred. 
the one we've got to take. How about rations? They'll never hold up. We'll have to stretch them. Now, how thin can you cut them? You're working the men, and that's for you to decide. Well... Well, Skipper, cut a third off. That'll last 90 days instead of 60. I'm willing to try. I knew I could count on you, Chief. I always can. And now, Chief, you're to be my witness of a little ceremony, remember? The flag. This is Delong's flag. Yeah, that's so. The point farthest north. We'll hope this is it. Hold the other end, Chief. We'll unfurl it for... for Emma. I think she knew, Chief. Sure, Captain. The North Star. She's right over our head. Things equal to the same thing. She'll be glad... Now let's fold it up now so nobody will know that we had it out. Else they might guess the reason. Got any tobacco left, Captain? Stand a pipe, Paul. I don't feel like supper. Or is it breakfast? Hand your pipe over. I'll fill it up. Thanks, brother. Chief, this is a grand country to learn patience in. Ninety-one days. We struggled on over the ice going southwest. Now towards the Lena Delta. Through fog, day after day. Ferrying across leads, pulling through slush our clothes. Constantly soaked in ice water. The most we covered in one day was six miles. Some days not more than two. The men growing weaker every day from frostbite and scurvy. On September 9th, 91 days after the sinking of the Jeanette, we reached the edge of the ice in the open sea. Crawled into camp and then the long mustered his crew called the roll for the last time. That night he held divine service. Even the sick joined in. Only Collins stayed in his tent. Thank God for thy mercies. We pray thee for deliverance to our homes and to thy continued service. Amen. Running mountainous. 
Our little boat rose dizzily to every crest and plunged down in the trough as the wave rolled by. The other boats were falling behind. We glanced back at ship a thousand yards to windward. As I looked, an immense sea swept over his boat and she broached, lying helplessly broadside to the gale. No boat ever beat a mile dead to windward against such waves. Long before we could even get our boat into the wind on the first tack. The icy waters had ended the agony of the ship and his men. Way astern was the captain's cutter. Night fell. That too faded from sight and we were left alone. Eleven frozen men in a tiny whale boat. In utter blackness. By morning, the ocean calmed, and in the gray light we saw land less than a mile away and smoke rising. But there was no sign of the captain's boat. The story of the last days of Captain DeLong and his men was pieced together many months later from the captain's diary and the ship's papers that were found in his camp. One hundred and thirty-fifth day... Around October 1st, this morning reached Lena Delta. Boat overturned in shallows. All stores lost. Only chance is to make Kumax sick, 95 miles south by my chart. Doctor says some of the men can't walk even a mile. They'll have to. Tonight, ate the last of the Femican. 136th day. Erickson dropped in his tracks. Both feet frozen. Flesh falling off in his boots. We cut him some crutches out of driftwood. Let me stay, Captain. Don't move me. My legs is killing me. Oh, crutches no use. They won't only die quick. Get up, Erickson. You think I'm going to leave you? Up for our carrier. Oh, please, Captain. Up, I tell you. We're going on. 137th day. This morning, an ambler shot a reindeer. Men too famished to wait for fire. Ate the beast raw. Gave the bone to snoozer. 138th day. Trapped by open water. Have to cross. We try to build raft. The men are broken. Can scarcely lift planks. I drive them hard. What's the matter, Leech? Lashing to loot. There ain't enough logs to float it. Then haul the lashings tighter. Your ship's carpenter. I haul it as tight as I could. Do as I say. Stop talking back. You won't even let us die in peace. You're not human. Leech, another word out of you, and I'll have you court-martialed. You hear me? Yes, sir. 139th day. Raft completed. Crossed water. Found a deserted fishing hut other side of the bay. Put up overnight. A raging blizzard outside. At midnight... Erickson died. Sea burial. Fired a volley with our last rifle. 144th day. About the 9th of October. Today sent Nindeman and Noros, the two strongest men left toward Kumak Cirque. They may get through and send help. Today... Killed my dog, Snoozer, for food. Dog never whimpered. Too far gone. Men weakening fast. 145th day. Collected driftwood. Built fire. We wait here, hoping all hands feeble, but 
Cheerful. God help us. 147th day. Still no game. One spoonful of glycerin for food. After supper, all united in saying Lord's Prayer. 152nd day. Alexei dying. Doctor baptized him. Mr. Collins' birthday. Forty years old. Food. Willow tea and two old boots. 153rd day. Calm. Mild. Snow falling. About sunset, uh, Lexi died. Covered him with ensign and laid him on a crib. Me dying. Our Sam dying. Doctor rubs their hands to keep them warm. 156th day. Found Leech dead in the morning. Still sitting up between the doctor and myself. Iverson laughs. Laughs. His mind is gone. Too weak to carry the body out on the ice. 157th day. Near the end of of October. Very little hope. Said part of the divine service. At sunset, our Sam died. He still leans over his kettle. We can't move him. Hundred and... Hundred and sixtieth day. Dressler died during the night. Ambler, now weakening. God, help us. Hundred sixty fourth day. Iverson's laughing stops. Ambler crawls over to him. Feels his pulse. Dead. Hundred and sixty seventh day. Mr. Collins dying. Mr. Collins dying. The captain's last entry in that fateful book. No word of himself. His frozen fingers scrawled their last words. Mr. Collins. Dying. Months of searching finally brought us to that gale-swept hill. There I made out stiff and stark above the snow... An upraised arm. The arm belonged to Captain DeLong, half buried in the snow. I figured he'd tossed his journal to safety on higher ground and his stiffening arm had frozen in that gesture. I was right. The journal was just above and his face was calm as if his work was done. Atop a rocky promontory, looking to the north, towering 400 feet above the great bay of the Lena Delta and far beyond the reach of any possible flood, I prepared for my captain and his crew their final resting place. Above that rocky cairn, I raised a massive cross 25 feet high, hewn from a driftwood spar salvaged from the bay below. And on the spreading arms of that cross, I cut the names of those who were to rest beneath it. Then when all was ready, on April 6th, 1882, on that gale-swept mountain over the Lena, we buried them. 
We lifted the thin bodies from the sledges. Tenderly. Laid them out on a bed of snow inside the tomb. Captain DeLong at one end. The others in order of rank. Surgeon Ambler. Mr. Collins. Lee. Cack. Gortz. Boyd. Iverson. Dressler. And last at the other end. Our Sam. And then, sorrowfully sealing up the can, we left them to their rest. Among the Siberian snows looking out over the Lena's great bay at that desolate cape below, which had witnessed their last agony, and northward across that polar sea which he had valiantly given his life to conquer, DeLong and his men of the Jeanette lay at last beneath a huge cross. On the rocky cairn, with the fierce arctic glares they had so often bravely faced, and the winds mournfully wailing their eternal dirge. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System has brought to its coast-to-coast -coast audience a reenactment of the early expedition to the North Pole as dramatized by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. The play was adapted from Commander Edward Ellsberg's historical account of the Saga of the Jeanette, as told in his book, Hell on Ice. This was the 14th consecutive broadcast in the weekly CBS series featuring Broadway's newest and most widely acclaimed theatrical producing company on the air. Orson Welles adapted the story for radio and directed the entire production. In the cast tonight were Thelma Schnee as Emma DeLong, Clayton Collier as Lieutenant Chip, Joseph Cotton as Lieutenant Dannenauer, William Allen as Dr. Ambler, Frank Reddick as R. Sam, Howard Smith as Collins, Al Swenson as Erickson, Ray Collins as Captain DeLong, and Orson Welles as Lieutenant Melville. The original music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. This is Dan Seymour speaking. <laughs> at this same hour, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we invite you to listen to the 15th of the weekly performances by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presents the Silver Theater. Starring Orson Welles in One Step Ahead, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you this week in behalf of International Sterling, world famous solid silver. We present the 26th program in our current Silver Theater series, and here, ladies and gentlemen, with a word for you is our director, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, Henry Charles. And to you and our audience, welcome once again to Silver Theater. Today we feel is one of the real high spots in our fourth Silver Theater season. Our star is Orson Welles, who's undoubtedly the most talked of young man in the entertainment world today. Not only has he contributed to radio some of its most startling and original moments, but he's been a tremendous stimulation to the legitimate stage. And more recently, he's added further to his laurels by preparing for the screen Citizen Kane which many of our Hollywood critics are claiming as a milestone in motion picture production. Silver Theater is proud to be able to make the most of his appearance on our stage with a play that's truly unusual. It's an original by John Latouche, who is best known for the splendid lyrics of the epic song Ballad for Americans. Our performance will go on in just a moment. But now before the curtain goes up, we'd like you to share the experience 
about which a young wife is writing to a girlhood friend. She's well along in her letter, but she just stopped for a moment to read over this last paragraph. Remember, Peggy, when you and I were very little, what tremendous plans we had for the future? I remember I was going to live in a real castle someday, and everything around me would be made of real gold and silver. Well, here we are, Jim and I, in our own little home at last. And you'd never mistake it for a castle, I'm afraid. But we do have one real treasure. That's our international sterling silver. Jim and I were both definite about sterling because we think it's mighty important that it's our lovely sterling more than anything else that gives character to our home. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, genuine solid silver does lend dignity and background to even the simplest home, particularly when your sterling is made by the world's foremost silver house, International. For that name, International, is the same that appears on pieces exhibited in museums. It means that your pattern was designed by silversmiths whose craft traditions are more than a century old. So if you are a bride-to-be or a wife about to choose new silver, don't miss seeing the beautiful and distinguished patterns of international sterling. The house lights dim, the silver curtain rises, and here is One Step Ahead, starring Orson Welles as Timothy Wheeler with Lorene Tuttle as Alice and Mary Shipp as Stella. A man is walking alone along a city street. Tim Wheeler, age 41. That's me. Profession, businessman. Or should I say (laughs) ex-businessman? Ex-businessman. The man walks on, relentless, grim, oblivious of all about him. On through the man-made canyons of the city, moving now in sunlight, now in shadow, as the sun of the fading day sinks lower in the western sky. And in this man, despite the calm upon his face, is turbulence and strangeness and dark turmoil. Here I am, walking along a city street, with death inside me. Twenty minutes, I'll be home. Funny I should still call it that. I'll be home, and she'll be there. Alice. Sweet Alice. Laughing at me as she's always laughed. Twenty minutes, I'll be home. Twenty minutes. Hey, mister, how's about a handout? I ain't eaten since yesterday. All right, buddy, keep your dough. And I hope you choke, you lousy cheapskate. A street beggar asking me for help. Me. What could I have told him? That I'm even more of a failure than he is? What's the use? He wouldn't have believed or understood. Failure. Could I believe that myself until this morning when it happened? It was so quick, so final, and so sure. As usual, at half past nine, I got to work half an hour later than the others since I'm head of the department. Through the outer office, I walk past the row of girls bent over their machines. They usually smile at me as I pass and say, good morning, Mr. Wheeler. But this morning, they didn't smile, any of them. I wondered why. Then Charlie came toward me, the office boy. He said the old man wanted to see me. The old man, J.B., the president, general manager. He wanted to see me. I hurried to his office. Come in. Morning, J.B. Oh, oh, Wheeler. Yes, the office boy said... Well, Wheeler, I'll get this over with quickly. That'll make it easier for both of us. You're through. Through? You mean... I'm fired? Why? I have my reasons. Well, then what are they? I've been with this firm for 20 years. It's it's all I know. You can't fire me without a reason. All right, Wheeler, I'll be frank. The trouble is, you're no longer fitted for your job. You've gotten stodgy. Stodgy? Yes. Take that Bakersford matter last week. We could have had that account if you hadn't been so slow getting out an estimate. Won't do, Wheeler. Things move fast nowadays. We need a man who can travel along with them. Maybe I have been a little conservative, but it seems wise to me to look at every angle of an idea before you make a decision on it. In fact... Well, Wheeler, you know that I hired you in the first place 20 years ago because your wife is the daughter of my best friend. You mean that Alice asked you to give me the job? Of course. I suppose that you knew that. No, I didn't know. And, of course, it's not my business to pry into employees' private lives, but you treated that girl mighty shabbily. And if any man needed to hold on to a wife like Alice, you did. What happened between you two, anyway? I'm not sure I could explain. Or that you'd understand if I did. No, neither am I. Now, as a matter of fact, Alice and I were talking about you the other night at her father's house. 
I think she hit the nail on the head. You should have been in some other business in the first place. Alice said that, did she? Yes, and she was right. We need speed here, Wheeler. You've never had speed. So Alice said I should have been in some other business? Yes, she did. In other words, it was really my wife who fired me. She put the idea into your head. I make my own decisions. You're discharged for incompetence. Get your check and leave. Huh. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Why do you look like that? Now, look, don't think I've enjoyed having to do this. Don't worry, J.B., I'm going. You won't be troubled further with my incompetence. <laughs> You checked him? Sure, here you are. Now, sign the voucher, will you? Why not? Gosh, Tim, I'm sorry. I mean, I wish there was something... Tim! Tim! What use was there in trying to answer him? I started back through the outer office again toward the street. The girls still bent over their machines, but seeing me just the same. I could feel the things that they were thinking about me. He's going out. He's fired. Too slow. He couldn't keep one step ahead. Too slow. He's fired. He's going out. He's fired. He's going out. He's fired. 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 That was that. As quick and as definite as that. It was six hours ago I came out that door, and I've been walking ever since. Walking... Walking and thinking, trying to pierce through the veil of years to see things clear. Now I do. I do. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes and I'll be home. And you'll be laughing. Laughing because you knew before I did what was going to happen to me this morning. And it's always been like that, even from the first. Hasn't it, Alice? That was that day so long ago when I'd at last realized I loved you. That glorious, carefree summer day. <sighs> Shall we rest here, Timmy? I was just going to suggest it. Here, I'll help you down. Take my hand. <sighs> you know, I do have to be careful. I have a funny heart, the doctor says. It doesn't do to strain it. I hope all this hiking hasn't been too much for you. No, of course not, Timmy. I'm all right. It's so glorious up here. Oh, it is. Look at the sunlight on the river. Water flashes just like that. Alice... Yes, Timmy, darling. Alice, I've been thinking things over. Yes, Timmy, what things? Well, it's hard to... You mean you've been thinking about you and me? Yes. And after considering carefully, I... Hold my hand. Now, what is it you're trying to say? Well, I thought, that is, after looking over my prospects and... and... Oh, Alice... Timmy, are you trying to ask me to marry you? Yes, how did you know? Oh, it's been written all over you, silly. I've known you were going to for days and days. You have? I've just been waiting for you to say it. And I was beginning to think you'd never get around to it. Then you will? Of course I will. I've already picked out my trousseau, and I found the cutest little church. I do want to be a June bride, you know, so I thought I'd be prepared when you finally did make up your mind to ask me. You silly, darling, slowpoke. <laughs> You laughed, and I thought there was music in your laughter then, so I laughed too. Dear Alice, that was the beginning of your being ahead of me. The hare and turtle race of your quick mind. My slow one. Never could hit a rhythm between us, could we? Time is money, Tim. But haste makes waste. He who hesitates is lost. You've got to hurry. A person ought to look before he leaves. Strike while the iron is hot, slowpoke. Keep moving. You'll be left behind. Yes, but in spite of that, we were happy at first. You were full of plans, Alice. Plans that somehow always managed to be one step ahead of my own. For instance, when I was out of a job just after we were married, and I considered going into a different kind of work, running a bookstore, I'd always been fond of books, but you were opposed. You said I was the kind of man who had to work for someone else, and that with your helping me, I'd succeed. So one day, I came to you. And you've decided, Timmy, darling? Yes, Alice, I guess you're right. I'd better stick to the kind of work I've done, regardless of what I'd like to do. Besides, this means surer income for us. I'll call J.B. McKenna in the morning and tell him I'll take that job. I don't think you need to bother, Tim. What do you mean? Well, it just happened that I saw J.B. myself this afternoon at Father's house. I told him you'd report for work on Monday morning. You told him this afternoon? How? I, I didn't know myself by then. Mm, oh, but I did, Tim. You forget, darling, that little Alice knows her Tim better than he knows himself. And she always will. <laughs> I 
went to work all right that following Monday, 20 years ago. <laughs> and now, 12 minutes. 12 minutes, I'll be home. Alice, sweet Alice. <laughs> yes, you built me up in the business, but you began to wear me down as a human being. That was the time we were looking for a new house, just after I'd been promoted to sales manager. This is the last house on our list. What do you think? Oh, don't look so cross, Jimmy. I'm not cross, dear. I'm just tired of looking at houses over and over and over again. Well, if you'd make up your mind and not take so much time about it. I don't see what's wrong with our old house. Oh, haven't we been all over that? You have to live up to your position, Timmy. Besides, remember my heart condition. You know the doctor said I was to get lots of sun and air and quiet surroundings. You could do that where we are. What you really need is just to relax a little, Alice, and quit driving yourself all the time. <laughs> You'd like me to slow down and vegetate just like you, wouldn't you? Oh, I don't mean to hurt my darling's feelings, but it just mustn't be an old stick in the mud. Now, about the house. Oh, we've seen so many, it's hard to decide You'll exactly. You'll have to decide, Tim. And after all, this one is a good investment. I've looked into that carefully. Really? Well, of course, the view from this house is good. In fact... I think I prefer this one to the other. It's got more space. Yeah, definitely. I'll take this home. We'll be happy here, Tim. We'll start all over again and recapture that first magic we knew. Will we, Alice? Of course, dear. You know, I'm such a fool. I get the idea sometimes that, well, you got a way of making me feel sort of dumb and awkward, as if you knew what I was about to do next. Going me one better. Makes me lose confidence in myself. Silly. I'm just a helpless little half-invalid. You're so much stronger and cleverer. I'm not kidding myself about that, but... As you say, we'll start all over again in this new house. And by the way, I'll have to tell the agent we want it. No, you won't, Tim. What? The people who owned it wanted to sell it quickly, so I put down the deposit right away and got them to reduce the price $500. Aren't you proud of me? You mean you already... Already arranged it? I had to, darling. They might have changed their minds. How did you know I'd choose this place? You did, didn't you? Yes, but Well, then still... there's no harm done. Why, well, I was sure you'd pick this one the minute I looked at it. I can read you like a book, Timmy. Just like a book. <laughs> Just like a book. Our whole life was like that. A book. But you'd always read the chapter just ahead. First, that delighted me. I was proud to have such a quick, intelligent wife. But as time went out, I'm stopping to buy no papers. I'm stopping for nothing. I'm going home. Ten minutes now. Yes, ten minutes. Ten minutes, Alice. Yes, the house, you decided that for me, too. And I knew it, and it upset me. I'd never been too sure of myself. And what confidence I did have began to ooze away. I got... So I hated to go home at night, and I was lonely. Seemed to be nothing to live for, and then... Stella. Please, Mr. Wheeler, you mustn't stay over time just to help me. I'll get my work done somehow. Yes. Then it was that I met Stella. There's nothing unusual about her, just a simple little yellow-haired girl who worked in the shipping department, but Stella loved me with a kind of love I'd never even dreamed of. Stella didn't think I was slow and befuddled. No, oh, she looked up to me. Thought I was witty and wonderful. There were those days when we had tea together. <laughs> oh, Tim, that's wonderful. I wish I could remember stories the way you tell them to me. <laughs> but, Stella, that's such an old story. Well, I never heard it. Then stories always just go in one ear and out the other with me. <laughs> I love your laugh, Stella. So warm and full of joy. And so different somehow. Different? I guess I laugh just like anyone else. No, you don't. I do have fun with you, Tim. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it's because you're so calm and so understanding. You like that, do you? For a man to be calm and quiet? Not always rushing to be ahead of the other fellow? Oh, of course I do. You know, Tim, I feel that deep inside yourself you have the real secret of living. Sometimes you seem to forget that you know the secret. Stella. Stella, darling. Tim. Stella, listen to me. You and I... No, no, Tim, you mustn't say it. 
You're, you're married, Jim. That's right. I'm married. We can't forget that, can we? Either of us. Yes, I was married to you, Alice, and being the kind of man I was, I did my best to stick to my vows. I never let you guess from my actions what was in my heart. When you looked at me with that amused, half-pitying look of yours, I drew a mask across my face, hiding the thoughts underneath. Then one day you stopped in to see me at the office. Hello there, Tim, darling. Hello, Alice. What are you doing in town? Well, I talked to Mother on the phone a while ago, and she wants me to come down to visit her in Baltimore for the weekend. You know how worried she is about my heart condition. It's not worse. No, but you know Mother. She's got some super specialist she thinks will help. You don't want to come, do you? Naturally, if you want me to... Oh, I'll... don't be dutiful, darling. You know Mother bores you to extinction and vice versa. I'll be back Sunday night. All right, Alice. Goodbye. Nice trip. Be a good boy while I'm gone. Be good. <laughs> be good and let who will be clever. <laughs> let who will be clever. I wondered then what you meant by that. But I learned. When Sunday came, I persuaded Stella to spend it with me. We drove out into the country. She was so beautiful that day. She was so happy. Happier than I'd ever seen her. It was almost as if she were determined to forget everything except that we who loved each other so were together. Then in early evening, just at dinner time, we arrived at a little hotel not far from town. We left the car and went inside. And as we started into the dining room, suddenly she stopped. Tim, wait. We can't go in there. Why not, Stella? You mean you're afraid of being recognized? There's no one in here we know. There couldn't be. There is. Who? Your wife, Tim. She's there, and with another man. Alice, in there? Tim, take me home. Please, please take me home. Yes, Alice, you were there. Sitting at a table with an old sweetheart of yours. Your back was turned. You didn't see me. You were laughing. And even though you hadn't seen me, I felt that you were laughing because once more you were one step ahead of me. Stella and I went back to town immediately and whatever link there had been between us was broken. I begged her at least to go on seeing me, but it was useless. No, Tim, it can't be. We were crazy to think it could. What we were drifting into, well, we're not that kind of people, you and I. That moment at the hotel made me realize it. I felt unworthy of myself and of you. Stella, it's you I love. My marriage with Alice is... Oh, please, Tim. Let this be goodbye. It has to be. And, well, to make it easier for both of us, I'm going away. Back home. Thank you for loving me, Tim. Stella, listen to me. No. Goodbye, Tim, darling. Goodbye. And it was. It was goodbye. And so, Alice, you'd taken that, too, away from me. Here's Main Street. A candy store. Buy a box of candy for your true love. Huh. Main Street. Five minutes now. Five minutes, I'll be home. Just walk faster. Faster. You never knew, Alice. You never knew that I'd seen you there in the hotel when you should have been in Baltimore. I didn't want to admit you'd beaten me again, but... Finally, one night on my way home, I decided that our life together was impossible. I decided at last that I'd tell you with no stammering around, no indecision, exactly what I thought of you. Yes, Alice, for once, I was not going to wait for you to steal a march on me. And when I got home that night... Come in. Hello, Alice. Oh, it's you. Yes, it is. I have something to tell you, Alice. Have you? Yes. It's this... Alice, for years now, we've tried to keep our marriage going, but I've made up my mind that there's Pardon no... Pardon me, madame. The trunk is closed and locked. Tell the boy to take it downstairs, Jean. Yes, madame. Trunk? What are you packing for? I'm leaving you, Tim. You're what? I'm leaving you. I'm going to Reno for a divorce. You're... That's wonderful. You're going to divorce me. Once again, you'd forestalled me. 
Three minutes now. Three minutes more and I'll be home. Your home, Alice, since you arranged it with a court so that it was no longer mine. The divorce. The divorce was quick, efficient. You saw to that. You saw, too, that all our friends would sympathize with you. Everywhere I went, you'd been there first with a convincing story. Especially J.B. You must have been particularly eloquent with J.B. Why should I complain when the job you took away was the job you got for me in the beginning, the job you got for me, whether or not it was the job I really wanted? But you knew, Alice. You knew what my life should be. You always knew, Alice, my good angel, my ever-present help in time of trouble. Alice, sweet Alice. Block away. Oh, now it's a block away. A minute more and I'll be laughing. I'll do it. I'm going to cross the street. Hey, watch out! Hey, you, you're crazy crossing the streets against the lights? You want to get killed? You see, Alice... You're on my mind so much, you've got me disputing the right of way with trucks. A man can't argue with a truck any more than he can argue with death. Death. I'm not going to die. No. Someone else is. Do you know who that is, Alice? You. Yes, Alice. Today, this crisp and lovely autumn day, I'm going to kill you. gun in my pocket. A gun, and in that gun is a bullet intended for you. You've deliberately destroyed my life from the beginning, and now I will have at last the bleak satisfaction of destroying yours. Only I'll be kind. I'll do it all at once. You don't expect me. It'll be brief and final. I don't care what happens afterwards. But I'll know as my finger presses the trigger that this one time I have outplayed you. I have at last been one step ahead. Mr. Wheeler. Jean, I must see Mrs. Wheeler. Where is she? She is upstairs. I will take you to her. Never mind taking me, Jean. I know the way. I'll surprise her. But, Mr. Wheeler... It's all right, Jean. You don't understand. Mrs. Wheeler and I must have a long talk together. A long talk. But you talk. cannot talk with Madame. Oh, you but cannot... I must. I shall. The most important talk of my life and the first. Stand aside, Jean. For once she's not heading me off. But I thought they told you. Just an hour ago, Mr. Wheeler. Her heart. Her heart? She's dead. She's dead. gentlemen, in just a moment, our star for tonight, Orson Welles, will be back for a word with you. And while we're waiting for him to catch his breath, we'd like to pass along to you this friendly reminder. All right, Henry Charles. As you all know, ladies and gentlemen, there are times when you simply have to compromise between your pocketbook and your heart, when you must choose second best whether you like it or not. But the one time you don't have to compromise is when your heart says sterling silver. Because today you can buy genuine solid silver of impressive craftsmanship, silver as rich and exquisitely wrought as international sterling, right out of income on easy month-to-month terms. Beginning sets for four in some international sterling patterns start as low as $68. And a complete service for six persons can often be purchased for only $100. But why not visit your favorite silverware dealer for the complete details? He'll be glad to show you the many beautiful patterns including rich, regal, royal Danish, glad to help you plan for an adequate, lovely service. And you, on your side, will see at once what elegance and background international sterling can lend to your table. And you'll choose this silver, whose craft traditions are a century old. International Sterling Silver. Once again is today's star, Orson Welles. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Conrad. I don't have to tell you that I really enjoyed working with you in the Silver Theater. And I want to thank the whole cast, especially Lorene Tuttle, for such a grand performance as Mrs. Wheeler. Yeah, well, Orson, I know you have a lot of things to do today, but I'd just like you to take a moment and tell our audience what you were doing in New York. Well, as is the case with anyone who goes to New York, I've been doing a lot of things. Principally, however, I managed to get my new stage show, Native Son, into production. I see in Ed Sullivan's column that it looks like a smash hit. Well, that's great news for Manhattan theater goers, but what's the good news for the rest of America's theater patrons? How about Citizen Kane? As the star, the writer, the director, and producer, I imagine you're in a position to know something about it. Well, Conrad, I think I can assure you that Citizen Kane will be released within the next three or four weeks. Good. Now, with a final bow in your direction, sir, and another in the direction of your splendid product, International Sterling, I bid you goodbye. Bye, Orson, and don't forget, if you can find time, you've got a date with us for next season. Well, ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday, Silver Theater will star Kay Kaiser and Ginny Sims in a rollicking comedy about the trials and tribulations of a couple who embark on one of the world's dizziest honeymoons, Niagara to Reno. Be sure to be with us. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, when you buy solid silver, be sure to look for the name of the world's foremost silver house, International. International Sterling Silver. John Letitia's original play, One Step Ahead, was adapted for Silver Theater in collaboration with True Boardman. Music on today's program was arranged and conducted by Felix Mills. Henry Charles speaking for International Sterling. Well, good friends, this is Conrad Nagel bidding you all good evening and thank you. See you next Sunday with Kay Kaiser and Ginny Sims. All names and designations of persons and organizations used in the dramatic portions of this broadcast are fictional. Silver Theater originates at Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ceiling unlimited. Man has always looked to the heavens for help and inspiration. And from the skies, too, will come his victory and his future. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles, speaking for the men and women who make Lockheed and Vega aircraft. If you will turn back the pages of your favorite magazine to the advertising section of a recent issue... You'll find a striking message sponsored by Lockheed and Vega's brothers in aviation at Vaulty. A message based on a most provocative illustration. The fellow with a familiar small mustache, the lunatic fringe of hair, the paranoiac eyes, reaching for the globe, while four phantom figures watch him anxiously. King Philip II of Spain, Louis XIV of France, Napoleon, the Kaiser, looking on in envy as the madman reaches out to put a strangling grip upon the world. And underneath the caption, simple and significant, Hitler came the closest. Well, that's true, of course, he did. And how do you think the others feel about it? Philip, Louis, Napoleon, the Kaiser, the other four who might have ruled the earth. Where are they now? Into what far corner of oblivion have they retired? What are they thinking as the tide of centuries rolls by? Excellency, if I may ask it, why have you invited us to attend this conference? Ah, Monsieur Napoleon, restless as always. Are you uncomfortable, perhaps a ah. little warm? Ah. <laughs> Believe me, you'll get used to it in time. Another century or two? But, senor, for a conference like this, where are the others? Caesar and Charlemagne. Yeah, or Genghis Khan. Oh, I could have asked a dozen others like yourselves, but most of them are rather old. You four, I thought, would be the most compatible. Having so very much in common. Monsieur, I trust you do not class me with these paltry fellows. Senor Napoleon, you speak of Philip II of Spain. Look to your manner, sir. I am the oldest. The oldest. Yes, yes, the oldest, not the most important. Uh? I have more pages in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Excellency, is not that true? Quite true, Monsieur Napoleon. A most absorbing record filled with the greatest victories. 
Barring Waterloo, of course. Ah, Waterloo, Waterloo. Why must you always remember Waterloo? No man ever faced the judge. The world was leagued against me then. What of my world, monsieur? Have you not heard of the Grand Alliance? All those nations banded against Louis XIV? Ah, uh, yeah, me too. In 1918, I'm fighting the whole world. Senores, believe me, it is not how many, but how strong those stubborn ducks. How can you oh, come again, come Gentlemen! Ah, yeah. Gentlemen! Thank you. You understand, of course, I do not underrate the work that any of you did for me on Earth. Of course, comparisons are always odious. To whom could you compare us, sir? Well, there is a man on Earth today, a genius of a fellow, an organizer. He plans to turn the whole world like a mill, and grind out what he needs. What? The entire world? Oh, yes. And even that might not be quite enough for him. <laughs> He even looks on me with something of disdain. He thinks my red flannels are a bit old-fashioned. I'm afraid he hopes one day to take my place. To rule here in your place, monsieur? Who is this man? If you will turn your attention to the wall, look at the map. A map? Oh, I had not noticed this before. Naturally, Wilhelm. It wasn't there. Caramba! This is a strange map, senor. Yes, Philip, a very special map. It breathes and pulses with the world. It trembles, shudders, sometimes even cries aloud. If I may say it, sir, this is a devilish clever thing. Monsieur Napoleon, you flatter me. Look, look, look at the map. Some parts are turning red. Why do they turn red, monsieur? Very at times your ignorance is monumental. It's blood that turns those countries red. The blood of men and women, flowing as only rivers flowed in your benighted days. All this, all this is blood. Look at the map. Monsieur Napoleon. Starting there from Germany, see how the bloody torrent races on. See how it sweeps upon the Czechs. You hear those cries? Those are the cries of Lidice, despoiled and ravaged, ground to dust beneath an army's iron heel. Yeah, this is very systematic. That distant thunder now, that's Poland, Warsaw. Such a proud and lovely city, crumbling in upon itself. The ghetto and the boulevard at last united in their common ruin. Rather thorough, don't you think? Well, next. Next to the north. Norway takes a mere few days, you see. Then south again, the lowlands, Rotterdam. Oh, stubborn, Bart. Ah, but this time, Philip, their stubbornness is no defense. In 30 minutes, 30,000 of them die. 30,000? Santa Maria! No, don't thank her, my friend. Thank me. You did your best on Earth, of course, or should I say, your worst. But possibly your talents weren't scale for things like this. What things, senor? Great battles that are named for oceans and for countries, not for streams or towns or puny villages as they were in your day. Death multiplied a million times. Whole centuries destroyed in half an hour or less. Oh, yes. This fellow Hitler serves me very well indeed. Hitler, Hitler. I do not recall the name, monsieur. Uh, what is his family? Well, Louis, there seems to be some doubt about his ancestors. Is this senor to do all this? He must be a most great general. Naturally, Philip. Is he not trained in Germany in my war? Wilhelm, in your war, the fellow was just a bad corporal. I like to think his training came from me. Hitler, Hitler. Monsieur, which it is this one? Hitler first or fourth or eighth or what? <laughs> Those foolish men on earth. They say he will be Hitler the last. But first or last? You mean for him to conquer all the earth? That is my plan, Monsieur Napoleon. Oh, what a pretty picture that will be. All men reduced to craven slavery. Food bought with tears and suffering. New life created just to be destroyed. In spite of the resistance of such people as the free French, the English, the Norwegians, the Russians. Monsieur, you mean this Hitler has invaded Russia too? Oh, yes. Oh, Monsieur Napoleon, my sympathy... If that brings certain bitter memories to you. Ah, oh, it will do him, too. Excellency, this is where he fails. He makes the same mistake. Oh, no, my friend. You see, he has an instrument you didn't have. A new weapon, senor. A new gun, yeah? Oh, more than that, much more. Something that projects through time and space. That reaches to the furthest corners of the earth. With such a weapon, I could have ruled the world. Why did you give it to him? Ah, but I didn't, Monsieur Napoleon. I didn't give it to him. It was designed to be an instrument of peace and brotherhood. But mankind put it squarely in his hand and begged naively 
for their own destruction. But, Excellency, Of I... course, they didn't realize it at the time. That's precisely where my Hitler's genius lies, to take an instrument they meant for good and warp and twist it to my ends. Those silly, stupid men on Earth. They thought they could escape me in the skies. They spread their little mortal wings and tried to fly. And then I spoke to him, a little whispered word that made him smile in gratitude. How well he understood. How happily he took those human wings and made them beat with fury and with rage. The very wings those other foolish ones had built in joy and hope. Believe me, gentlemen. Majesty. Majesty, your humble servant. You have returned most opportunely, I should say. What have you to report? Nothing, Majesty. I had no luck at all. You went as I directed you? Oh, yes, Majesty. I traveled far and wide through all America. Yes. I, I went to Valti first. Yes. The women working at the machines, I thought they'd be the easiest. Yes. I reasoned, pleaded, tempted them in every way I knew. Well? They wouldn't stop their work. They simply smiled and said, the devil with you. What about the men? I went to Lockheed, Majesty. Those men were difficult. I whispered to them. I said, I work so hard, they'll pay you just as much money for less work. What, do you care what happens later? What did they say? All the same thing, Majesty. They said I could go straight... Enough! And... You failed me, then. I couldn't help it, sire. If you could see America awake, around. Excuses, nothing but excuses. Just... Be gone, you did. Out of my sight. Fools, you fools! That woman and that man are making planes. Planes, Mr. Yes, planes. The instrument I hoped that he alone would use. You gave Hitler that How advantage? Else? How else could his greedy fingers span the earth? How else could he come so close to all the things you dreamed but never did? How else but through the air? So close. Now fail so miserably. Ah, then he fails too as we fail. I failed. know America. They'll answer him five planes for one. Destroy him in the very flames I showed him how to light. One day he'll merely be a name that's gone. Like all the rest of you. If I may say so, sir, he'll make a notable addition to our group. I doubt if he'll enjoy it much, monsieur. For one who fails me so colossally, I have a plan. A very special plan, no doubt. A very special plan. One day I'll give him all airplanes that are made. Senor! And all the guns and powder, all the armaments. Monsieur, you can't. It isn't fair to us. Senor, you give him up. Yes, everything. Everything but men. No men, monsieur? Since he has learned to hold all human life so cheap. No men. No men. <laughs> Excellency, my compliments. A most ingenious plan. No man. <laughs> this will be pure hell for him. Well, after all, Monsieur Napoleon, precisely where do you think you are? <laughs> Any further orders, Majesty? Or is that the end of it? Is it the end or just a new beginning I must make? You see, I know the world rather well. Don't I, world? You're tired, aren't you? You're weary with the sight of blood and suffering. You wish the war were done and over with. And what will happen when it is? Shall I tell you, world? Shall I tell you what you'll do? You'll sit about a table and contrive a peace and document it with the same mistakes you made before. You'll tell yourself that never, never can there be a war again. And you'll relax. Oh, yes. You'll grow quite fat and lazy in the luxury of your delusion. That's when I'll be back again. That's when I'll add another figure to the five you met tonight. A man who will not fail me as the others have. A man who... <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me. I think I've had enough playing the devil. And just for a moment, I'd like to be Orson Welles, taxpayer and citizen. Let's give the devil his due. He's given us a lot of trouble in the past and promised us a lot more for the future. Unless, of course... This scourge of fire and brimstone that we suffer now will shock us to eternal vigilance. But will it, Americans? Will it? What is our defense against it? 
The answer, I believe, was stated in the text from which our fable sprang tonight. Hitler came the closest by using the air. Remember, Americans. Remember, world. And never again be unprepared. Never again be caught with folded wings while madmen fly across the sun and put the shadow of despair upon the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say here how very nice it is to be back again, even for a short visit, with my old and good friends who bring you this program. We had a real Mercury cast tonight, and that was nice, too. Here it is. Napoleon was George Coulouris. Philip, Pedro de Cordoba. Louis, Joe Kearns. The Imp, Lou Merrill. Hans Conrad was the Kaiser. This is Orson Welles speaking for the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. I'm proud to speak for them. Thanks for listening. And until next time, I remain as always obediently yours. Next week, our guest will be Joey Brown, newly returned from the South Pacific. Tonight's story was written by Harry Cronman. The music was written and directed by Anthony Collins. This program has come to you from the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporation of Burbank, California. Patrick McGinn speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The makers of Campbell Soups present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Tonight we broadcast our version of what is generally regarded as one of the greatest of the modern mystery murder novels. In some peculiar fashion, it seems to have become necessary to defend the murder mystery as a form of entertainment. Heavy artillery is brought up in its behalf. President Wilson, it is proclaimed loudly, could not go to sleep or could go to sleep, one does not remember the point exactly, until a certain number of conflicting clues had managed to efface the days from his proof. And with a mysterious solved only after suspicion has been aimed at every adult in the neighborhood, he's not particularly shameful. I have never understood the need for this defense. Murder mysteries are, among other things, our most moral form of entertainment. The wrongdoer is regularly apprehended. If he is not, I have incredibly missed some fascinating black sheep of an author in a flock otherwise startlingly white. And one learns an obvious lesson that to be suspected wrongfully is in due course to be triumphantly cleared of suspicion. Life doesn't always proceed according to this admirable pattern. The apologists would do better to defend life, I sometimes think. To help us solve the mystery of the murder of Roger Ackroyd here tonight... We are fortunate in having a very powerful ally, a most distinguished lady and one of your favorite actresses. A lady in whose ears a nation's applause is still ringing for her latest brilliant success in Drums Along the Mohawk. Miss Edna May Oliver. But before we delve into the mysteries of this night's doings, Ernest Chappell has a comment to make on something which appears to be no mystery at all. Mr. Chappell. Thank you, Orson Welles. I'd like to ask all of you if you'll do this. The next time you're out in the car driving along the highway, just note the great number of eating places that display as their main invitation to you the words chicken dinners. The reason, of course, is simply that the proprietors of these eating places know by long experience that to nearly all of us, one dish that is a symbol of good eating is chicken. Now, because chicken is a favorite dish with nearly everyone... It's really no mystery at all why Campbell's Chicken Soup continues to grow steadily in popularity. 
You see, in every drop of the glistening golden broth, there's the rich chicken flavor you like so much. Steeped in deep chicken flavor, too, is fluffy white rice in every fragrant plateful. And you'll also enjoy the pieces of melting tender chicken meat that Campbell's adds. Yes, here is chicken soup, deep and full and rich. And you'll appreciate that from your first brimming spoonful. If you've already enjoyed this homey old-fashioned chicken soup as Campbell's make it, won't you remember to have it again soon? And if you haven't yet tried it, won't you do, do so at dinner tomorrow night? Because I promise you, just as sure as you like chicken, you'll like Campbell's chicken soup. And now our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd with our guest of the evening, Edna May Oliver. And ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, I think you'd like to know that we have with us in the studio tonight as a surprise visitor... <laughs> None other than the celebrated Belgian detective, Mr. Hercule Poirot. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I bid you good evening. Uh, if we had time, which we have not, I'm sure nothing would please us more than to hear from Mr. Poirot, unfortunately... Why unfortunately when we have here a microphone? But, Mr. Poirot, you, you don't understand... I that... understand only that since my arrival in your country some weeks ago, I observed that there is circulate an impression of my person which I must now publicly refute. I trust that the embarrassment of my presence here tonight in Mr. Wells' studio will ensure from him an honest and lifelike portrait. It has been said that I am a little man. Regard for yourself that this is not so. I have five feet two inches of high. My head is perhaps egg-shaped, and I carry it perhaps a little to one side, the left, but my eyes shine green when I am excited. Beyond on this, my mustache are the largest in Europe, and my force is in my brain and not in my feet. If these things are made clear, and Mr. Wells is a little tribute to Apple Poirot, I will be satisfied. The results of my little uh, gray cells will speak for themselves. If you will show me where I am to sit, please. I thank you. Uh, uh, this is Mr. Poirot, Miss Oliver. How do you do? Miss Oliver, you have often wanted to meet me, I am sure. I compliment you. Uh, please, please, Mr. Poirot. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen... Our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Well, let me to start with give you some idea of the little village of King's Abbot, of which I have for so many years been the leading, I must admit, also the only physician and surgeon. My name, by the way, is Shepherd, James Shepherd. We have a large railway station, a small post office, two rival general stores, very few able-bodied men, a staggering number of unmarried ladies, none of whom are getting any younger, and an amazing number of retired military officers, all of whom are getting older. In fact, the only newcomer for many months is next door to me, concerning whom little is known, despite the earnest and tireless investigations carried on in respect to him by my sister Caroline. Caroline and her little group of earnest ferrets, or maiden ladies like herself, have been forced to content themselves with the simple fact of his nationality, which is alien, of his name, which is Poirot, the obvious fact that he putters around his garden all day growing cucumbers, and the suspicion, based chiefly on malicious deductions, he's retired hairdresser. Let's see. Now, the main house of any importance in King's Abbot is Fernley Hall, owned by Roger Ackroyd, who's always looked more like a country squire than any country squire could really look, but who's... Actually, an immensely wealthy manufacturer of wagon wheels, nearly 50 years of age, Rubik in the face and genial of manner, and general the life and soul of our, to this week, the peaceful village. The other house of any importance has been left to Mrs. Ferrars by her late husband. Uh, Mrs. Ferrars died on the night of the 16th of September, a little less than a week ago. It seems longer than that. I was sent over for 8 o'clock in the morning of the 17th. There was nothing to be done. She'd been dead some hours. I turned to my home as soon as I decently could, looking forward happily to the warm breakfast I had missed, and rather unhappily to the certainty of a relentless cross-examination by my sister Caroline. Is that you, James? What on earth are you doing out there in the hall? Just hanging up my overcoat, my dear. Oh, Mrs. Farrow's died in her sleep, didn't she? Bacon is cold. How did you know? Out of the dawn, securing information instead of warming the bacon, is that it? I suppose you're going to tell me she died of heart failure. Annie told me. The milkman told her. He had it from Farrow's cook. Since you are bound to hear sooner or later, Caroline, from the greengrocer or the postman, I might as well tell you myself. She died of an overdose of sleeping medicine. She hadn't been sleeping well lately. Nonsense. She took it on purpose. Well, now, why on earth should Mrs. Ferrars wish to commit suicide? A widow still fairly young, very well off, good health, nothing to do but enjoy life. And looking forward to marrying Roger Ackroyd. Don't forget to leave that out. That's an item of fact only in your local gossip circle. A fact's a fact. And there is such a thing as remorse, James. Even if you're as wealthy as Mrs. Farrar. Remorse? I have always been convinced she poisoned her husband, and I'm more than ever convinced of it now. 
If you'd arranged an inquest a year ago, as I suggested, you you're should... You're talking nonsense, Caroline. Then you're absolutely satisfied it was an accident. I'm satisfied this bacon is not going to get any warmer by itself. And this time I went to the surgery to see my patient. All right, James. You don't have to be grumpy about it. Oh, by the way, Mr. Aykroyd's butler, Parker Cole. Well, what about? Mr. Aykroyd wants to know if you'll dine with him this evening. He says he'd regard it as a great favor if you'd cancel any other engagement. Of course I'll go and... Don't worry, Caroline. I may tell you all about the dinner tomorrow. Oh, then I'll give you something to tell Mr. Aykroyd tonight. Rafe Payton is back. Rafe Payton? Yes. And he's staying at the Dog and Whistle. I know he's taking particular pains to be sure that Mr. Aykroyd doesn't find out about it. I wouldn't dream of telling him. Roger Aykroyd's relations with his steps on his own affair. Believe me, Caroline, according to every interpretation except your own... I can't help it if people tell me things. In answer to questions. Well, you'd better rush along to that precious surgery of yours. You've got four patients waiting. How do you know? Well, one can't help seeing through a window. If one is looking through a window... The distance from my house to Fernley Hall, Roger Aykroyd's home, is a little over two miles. I remember that evening as I walked that the subject of Caroline's latest piece of gossip kept returning to my mind, Rafe Payton was in King's Abbott. Rafe Payton, whom I'd known and liked since he was a child. Adopted by Aykroyd upon the death of his mother, he'd grown up to be a handsome but what our narrow little village regarded as a rather wild young man. There'd been many stormy scenes between his stepfather and himself before he finally left for London. According to Caroline, he was secretly engaged to Flora Aykroyd, Roger Aykroyd's niece, who, with her mother, was now living in Fernley Hall. Uh, according to Caroline, I say, and Caroline's information, I'm afraid, is always exact. However illegitimate her source may be. What's the trouble, Aykroyd? A bit under the weather? Yes, Doctor. I've had a little of that pain after food lately. You must give me some more of those tablets of yours. I thought as much, Aykroyd. I brought some up with me. My bag in the hall. I'll get them. Oh, don't trouble. Uh, make certain that window is closed, will you, Shepard? Of course. Well, that one's open. I'll put the latch across, will you? All right. I think it's really bothering you, Aykroyd. The, uh, the door's closed, isn't it? Yes. Shepard, nobody knows what I've gone through in the last 24 hours. What's the trouble? You're an old friend, Doctor. My oldest friend, perhaps. You attended Ashley Ferrers in his last illness, didn't you? Yes, I did. Did it ever enter your mind that he might have been poisoned? Well, now, frankly, Aykroyd, I don't think I should... He was poisoned. By whom? His wife. She told me so herself yesterday. Yesterday? You mean a few hours before she died, she told you? Yes. Some weeks ago, I asked Mrs. Ferris to marry me. She refused. Last week, I asked her again, and she consented. Yesterday, I called upon her. I noticed that she'd been very strange in her manner for some days. Now, without the least warning, she broke down completely. She told me everything. Her hatred of her swine of a husband, her growing love for me, and then, a year ago, the dreadful means she had taken to free herself. It was poison, Shepard. Murder in cold blood. Murder? Are you sure, Eck? That wasn't all. It seems there's one person who's known all along what she did, who's been blackmailing her for huge sums. It was the strain of that that drove her nearly mad. Who was the man? She wouldn't tell me his name. Have you any suspicion? I don't dare have a suspicion. Something she said made me think that the person in question might actually be a member of my household. But that can't be so. I, I won't let it be so. I must have misunderstood her. What'd you say to her? What could I say? She made me uh, promise to do nothing for 24 hours. And she refused to give me the name of the scoundrel who'd been blackmailing her. I never dreamt she'd kill herself. Shepard, will you hand me that letter on the table there? In the blue envelope? Uh, this one? Thanks. It's from her. It arrived during dinner. She must have written it just before she... Do you think she wrote you the little bit she didn't tell you, is that it? Name of the man. Yes, I think so. I've got to open it, and yet I, I'm afraid. What's that? What? I thought the latch of the door gave a bit. Yeah? I'll see if there's anyone there. No one. Uh, nerves, I expect. Are you sure you shut the window? Yes, yeah, it's closed. Well... I'll read it. If I read it to you, it won't seem so bad. I won't be facing it alone. No matter what the man. My dear, my very dear Roger, a life calls for a life. I see that. I saw it in your face this afternoon. 
So I'm taking the only road open to me. I leave to you the punishment of the person who made my life a hell on earth for the last year. I would not tell you the name this afternoon, but I propose to write it to you now, dear Roger, now that I have nothing more to fear. Will you forgive me, Shepard, but I see I must read this alone. It was meant for my eyes and my eyes alone. Do you think that's wise, Roger? I'd rather wait. Well, if you insist on not letting me help you. If you must put it that way, yes, my dear friend, I do insist. I'm sorry. I left Fernley Hall at a quarter to nine. From Fernley Hall to my house, it takes, as a rule, about three quarters of an hour. The night of the moon shining, and I did it in less. From the road, I noticed the lights blazing in our parlor. Caroline was entertaining. Through the window, I caught sight of an egg-shaped head, partially covered with suspiciously black hair, two immense mustaches, and a pair of watchful eyes. Jane, come in, come in, come in. You're just in time for hot milk and crackers. Oh, thank you, Caroline. Oh, excuse me, I'm This is my brother, Dr. Shepard. I am enchanted. James, this is Mr. Hercule Poirot. How do you do, sir? Mr. Poirot is our new neighbor. If I may be permitted the one slight correction, my name is Hercule Poirot. Your good sister proceeds on the familiar English assumption that we are not English, do not know how to pronounce our own silly names. <laughs> He's just making fun of me, James. He has a very dry wit. We've had quite an interesting conversation. I question that it was two-sided. And do you know what Mr. Poirot told me? He's a policeman. Uh, pardon, mademoiselle. Not yet. I see. Do you appreciate Hercule Poirot? It is true earth. The name Poirot, mademoiselle, is known today in every continent, every land, nay, in every city of the world. I am become the mort, the last word. I am as much a specialist as an early street physician. Well, that's what I said, didn't I? A detective? Yeah, consulting detective. That's what I said. I'm afraid, Mr. Poirot, you find little to occupy a man of your talents in this village. Mr. Poirot tells me what he's looking for just now is peace and quiet. Precisely, mademoiselle. That and the correct soil, which you have in so great abundance here in King's Abbot for the cultivation of cucumbers. Oh, I'll answer it. It's probably Mrs. Bates and her rheumatism. Never mind, Caroline. I'll take it. Oh, all right. Hello. Hello. What? What's that? Certainly, of course. Of course I will at once. What, what is it? It's Parker, the butler, calling from Fernley. Just found Roger Ackroyd. Murdered. <laughs> Dr. Shepard. Where is he, Parker? I beg your pardon, sir. Mr. Ackroyd, don't stand there staring at me. Have you notified the police? The police, I sir. What's the matter with you, Parker? You call me to tell me your master's been murdered. The master murdered? Didn't you telephone me not five minutes ago and tell me Mr. Ackroyd's been found murdered? Me? Oh, no, sir. My English is not of the best, Dr. Shepard, but there seems to be a peculiar misapprehension. Well, Dr. Shepard, I I'll never... I'll give you the exact words I heard just now on the phone. This is Parker, the butler, Fernie speaking. Will you please come at once, sir? Mr. Ackroyd has been murdered. But, Doctor, I... Where is Mr. Ackroyd, Parker? Why, he's in the study, well, If sir. you don't mind waiting down here a moment, Monsieur Poirot, I won't be a minute. This way, sir. But of course, of course. I, uh, I'd rather not intrude on him, sir, if you don't mind. Well, I will, then. Door's locked. Well, Mr. Ackroyd must have locked himself in and possibly just dropped off to sleep, sir. Ackroyd! Ackroyd! Look here, Parker. How to break this door in, or rather we are. But, Dr. Shepard... I'll take the responsibility. Oh, if you say so, sir. All right, here we go. Together now. What? Inspector, head is sideways, forbidding the dagger to penetrate the jugular. Death was instantaneous. Ah, has the body been moved? Beyond making certain, if life is extinct, I haven't disturbed the body in any way. And you didn't touch the dagger, did you, Doctor? No, Inspector. No, good. Well, we'll want that for fingerprints. Ah, rummy-looking thing, isn't it? Foreign-looking. Moorish silver. Mr. Ackroyd was quite a collector. There are his silver cases over against the wall. Eh? Who are you? My name's Raymond. And Mr. Ackroyd's private secretary. That's right, Inspector. He's been in the state right almost two years now. Oh, very well. Now, uh, <clears throat> Doctor, how long should you say he's been dead? Half an hour at least, perhaps longer. And you had to break down the door, eh? 
What about the window? The uh, English people, they have a mania for the fresh air. The big air is all very well outside where it belongs. Why admit it to the hour? Hey, who are you? How did you get in here? You call yourself unfortunate man an inspector of police, and you say to me, who am I? Hercule Poirot, master detective, possessed of the finest brain in Europe. Known in every continent, in every land, nay, in every city. Not in my part of the world, you ain't. I never heard of you. How about you, Monsieur Poirot, Inspector? It's my house and the phone call came. Mr. Ackroyd's death. Oh, 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 well, all right then. You can stay. But this is my case, and don't you forget it. Now then. When was Mr. Ackroyd last seen alive? I don't know, probably by me, and I left, let me see, a little before nine. Mr. Ackroyd was certainly alive at half past nine. I, I heard him in here talking. Who to, Mr. Raymond? I don't know. I just heard his voice. But I know it was 9.30. You didn't hear any of their conversation, did you, Mr. Raymond? I did catch a fragment of it. It did strike me as a trifle off. Well, remember, please, the words exact. It is very important. I'm not sure that I can. But the words exact. Uh, wait a minute, uh, Mr. Parrott. Who's conducting this case? You or me? Now then, Mr. Raymond, what was these words you heard Mr. Ackroyd say at 9.30? Well, come on. I would swear under oath the exact words were... The calls on my purse have been so frequent of late that I find it impossible to accede to your request. Thank you, Mr. Raymond, very much. I, uh, I beg pardon, Inspector. Well, what is it, Parker? I just remembered. Miss Flora saw Mr. Ackroyd later than 9.30, about quarter of ten. She was just coming out of this room. You mean she was just closing the study door? No, sir. She'd already closed the door when I saw her. Oh, she told me Mr. Ackroyd was not to be disturbed again tonight. Where's Miss Crawler? Upstairs in her room. Shall I ask her to come down? No, no. Uh, I'll go up. One moment, if I might be so humble, Monsieur Inspector. Could I ask our friend Parker for a little information? Well, well, what is it? Thank you for your so gracious permission, Inspector. Tell me, Parker, is this room exactly as it was when you entered it with Dr. Shepard? Well, to tell you the truth, sir... I felt myself that this chair here was drawn out a little more. It has been puzzling. The grandfather chair between the door and the window. That's right, sir. That's very curious. No one would want to sit in a chair in such a position. What are you talking about? When a man wants to sit, he sits, don't he? Who pushed it back in place, I wonder? Did you, Parker? No, sir. No, sir. I, I was too upset at seeing the master and all. It, it isn't important, is it, sir? It is completely unimportant. That's why it is so interesting. You're very late for breakfast, James. I was up quite late, Karen. I'm afraid I forgot your natural anxiety to learn details you're not supposed to know. Well, don't worry about me, James. Mr. Poirot was working his cucumbers at daybreak this morning. 6.37 it was. And I've been with him ever since. Good. Perhaps you have some information for me, Caroline. Perhaps I have. Perhaps I have. Or are you going to pretend you know what suddenly occurred to Mr. Poirot in the night? So that he couldn't sleep for an hour or two after he got home? Inasmuch as I haven't seen our friends, he went to bed. Well, I don't feel very much like telling you either. If I didn't know that he'd tell you himself, I don't think I would. Well, he was worrying about the prints of some shoes outside the window. The way the rubber studs were worn down, he says, should mean something to him. But he doesn't know what. Did you explain it to him, Caroline? Hasn't the cook been of any help to you, or the milkman, or the Ladies' Aid Society? You or... needn't always be facetious, James. Hasn't the bacon needn't always be cold, I dare say, but it is, and so am I. But not cold, but facetious. James, James, do you know what Mr. Poirot said? He said I had the makings of a born detective in me. He particularly admires my wonderful instinct into human nature. And he told me a lot about the little gray cells of the brain. He says... His are of the first quality, slightly above that, in fact. I'm sure they are. He thinks you're very intelligent, too. Ah, good morning, good shepherd. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Poirot. A beautiful morning, is it not? See, how is this very cucumber? Beautiful, now, my friend, it is yours. I give it to you. All together, my good shepherd, I have a wonderful morning. Everywhere I learn things new and wonderful things. And all the time, the gray cells of Hercule Poirot, they are working, working. Miss Caroline, she tells me so much about this Ray Payton. This morning I go to the hotel. It's what you call it. The Duncan uh, uh, Thank you, Miss Caroline. And I think I will talk myself to Ray Payton. And they tell me at the uh, Dog and Whistle uh, that was here last night another gentleman asking for Mr. Payton. Why, James? 
I certainly well, think you, you might have told... No, Caroline, I thought someone ought to inform Rafe of his uncle's death. I... The least one could do, and since no one but myself and the members of your intelligence service knew that he was in King's Abbot at all. As a matter of fact, Rafe Payton left the door and was at 9 o'clock last night and never came back. Well, what on earth do you think happened to him? Rafe Payton has a right to come and go as he pleases. He might have gone... Anywhere, might even have gone back to London. Leaving his luggage behind? I wonder. Oh, by the way, my good shepherd, that telephone call. Oh, you mean the one that came while you were at the house with me? That is the one. Tell me, do you think it is possible that someone could have telephoned you and imitated Parker's voice sufficiently to deceive you? Well, he said he was Parker. James really doesn't know Parker's voice well enough. Of course, of course. But the telephone call was traced this morning by my friend Inspector Hempstead. It didn't come from Fanny Hall at all. It was put through to you at 9.50 last night from a public call office at King's Abbott Station and at 23 the night mail is for Liverpool. It is the inspector's opinion that the murderer may have left King's Abbott on that very train. Ah, then you do believe that Rafe Payton? I believe nothing, mademoiselle, until it is proved. Well, then, what do you think? I think, Miss Caroline, that uh, Roger Ackroyd was murdered. Outside of that, I think that I will have to think a good deal more. Oh, it's an outrage. That's what it is. A little man, not even an Englishman, a foreigner with moustaches, comes into this home, a British home, a house of mourning, unsolicited, unwelcome. Oh, Mother, do be quiet. Flora, I will not. He comes in here, into my own brother-in-law's house. Questions us like a lot of criminals. This much is our kiss and kin. Mr. Poirot, you must excuse my mother. My uncle's death was a terrible shock. I understand, mademoiselle. It is very little that Hercule Poirot does not understand. Honestly, no, Mr. Poirot, you're on the wrong track. Rafe Payton has nothing to do with this crime. The mere fact that he was hard-pressed for money... Was he hard-pressed for money, Mr. Raymond? Oh, Mr. Raymond. Raymond, now you've made it seem as though... Miss Ackroyd, I'm merely telling the truth. Yes, he was hard-pressed. He's always applying to his stepfather for money. But, Mr. Please, Poirot, Madam, was... Had he done so of late, Mr. Raymond? During the last week, for example. Mr. Ackroyd didn't mention such a fact to me. Of course, Mr. Payton will never again have to apply to anyone for money. You mean that, uh, Mr. Ackroyd's will... Exactly. After paying certain legacies and bequeaths, servants, charities, and so on... Aha, uh-huh. including yourself, uh, Mr. Raymond. Mr. Ackroyd was good enough to remember me to the extent of 1,000 pounds. Mm, it's not surprising. Go on, please. Well... Miss Flora Ackroyd inherits 20,000 pounds outright. The residue, including this property and an outstanding control in the business, goes to Rafe Payton. Uh, you have been familiar with this will for some time past, Mr. Raymond. Roger Ackroyd's confidential secretary. Of course, of course. Um, and Mr. Ackroyd possessed a very large fortune indeed, and he not. Fortune that would have been regarded as large even in less tax ridden times. Then the immediate inheritance of such a large sum would have eased very considerably the present difficulties of Mr. Rafe Payton. Mr. Poirot, you don't think... Is that so, Mr. Raymond? Yes, that is so. You awful little man, talking that way, when you know how Flora feels about Ralph Patton. The idea that you suspect him of killing his... Him no more than any other, madame. You know what I think? I think Roger's death was an accident. Roger was so fond of handling curios. His hand must have slipped or something. He was really a very strange man. Would you believe it? He never gave Flora and me an allowance. His own family. And of course, we didn't have a penny of our own. Why, at this very moment... If you need any ready money, Mrs. Ackroyd, Mr. Ackroyd cashed a check for a hundred pounds yesterday for wages and other expenses due today. The money was never spent. And where, if you please, is this money? He always kept his cash in his bedroom. I suggest that we see if the money is there. Why, Mr. Poirot, sure. Am I to understand, you miserable little foreigner, that you're intimating that I... I merely intimate, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, we see if the money is still there. Ladies and gentlemen, there are here only 60 pounds. Oh, that's impossible. Let me see. 10, 20, 30. The man's right. It is six days. I... This is terrible. Dr. Shepard. Mr. Poirot. I hope nobody believes... One it. must believe there are 60 pounds where they were hundred. However, I'm sure no one would suggest that you, Mr. Raymond, or you, Mrs. Ackroyd, who alone knew of the money... Mr. Poirot, I protest. Just one moment. Go on. I took the money. I'm a thief. I'm a common, vulgar little thief. Now you know. I'm glad that it's come out. I am glad also, Miss Flora. 
You are? Yes, because now we comprehend why Parker thought he saw you coming out of your uncle's room at a quarter of ten. But he did see her coming out of the door. He said so. No, that's just what he did not see. He saw Miss Flora outside the door with her hand on the handle. He did not see Miss Flora come out of the study for a good reason. Miss Flora was never in the study. But where else could she have been? Perhaps on the stairs. Well, those stairs only lead to Mr. Ackroyd's bedroom. Precisely. Then you knew I took the 40 pounds? I knew nothing, but I suspected much. As even now, I suspect that this money you have taken, you did not take it for yourself. I took it for myself. You can take what steps you please. I assure you, Miss Ackroyd, no steps will be taken. Only one thing... Why did you not tell me sooner? Me, Hercule Poirot, who in the end will know everything. Why do not all of you tell me the truth? Just because Flora made a little mistake. That's no Silence, to... silence, madame. Ladies and gentlemen, I am amazed. I, uh, my powers might not be what they were. In all probability, this is the last case I shall ever investigate. But Hercule Poirot does not end with a failure. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, I mean to know, and I shall know in spite of you all. How do you mean, in spite of us all? But just that, monsieur. Every one of you in this room is concealing something from me. It may be something trivial, which is supposed to have no bearing on the case... Each one of you has something to hide. I appeal to you. Tell me the truth now. The old truth. Miss Laura. My good shepherd, Mrs. Ackroyd, Parker, Mr. Raymond. Will no one speak? Ah. Ah. It is a pity. <laughs> You are listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Murder of Roger Ackroyd with Edna May Oliver. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we shall resume our presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Meantime, I'd like to call your attention to this interesting fact. Authorities tell us the young people of today are healthier than the youth of any previous generation. And they say that a big contributing cause is the broader use of the right kind of foods. Take soup, for example. Women have always realized the value of good soup in the weekly diet. But it took a long time to make it. Then came Campbell soups. And women, one after another, tried them. They compared them for wholesomeness and nourishment with their own homemade soups. They saw how much their families enjoyed the fine flavor of these soups of Campbell's. And because women no longer had to find time to make it, soup began to come to the table more and more frequently. Today, soup figures more importantly than ever before in the preparation of sensible, nourishing family meals. And now Orson Welles continues our presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd with Edna May Oliver. I am a village surgeon and Hercule Poirot is a distinguished Belgian detective, so it was scarcely for me to tell him I thought he was wasting his time. Certainly not for me to tell him that he was getting on my nerves. Not that I didn't admire his extraordinary cleverness and inside. Poirot was right, for instance, about the dagger. Police investigation confirmed his suspicion that the fingerprints on the handle of the dagger were those of Roger Ackroyd, the murdered man. Though the position of the dagger definitely precluded suicide. It was Poirot who established that it had not been Parker, the butler, who summoned me on the phone that night to what had become a house of death. 
And again, it was Hercule Poirot who made it indubitably clear that nobody had seen Roger Ackroyd alive after 9.30, at which time Raymond the secretary had heard Ackroyd's voice in the study. In spite of all this, it seemed to me that Hercule Poirot was making little real progress in solving the mystery of Roger Ackroyd's death. Furthermore, it seemed to me a curious thing for a detective of his self-proclaimed standing to be spending so much of his precious time in idle chatter with my sister, Caroline. I had a very interesting chat with Mr. Poirot, James. He thinks me uh, very intelligent. So you've told me. Is it just a coincidence, Caroline, that on those occasional mornings when the bacon is both warm and crisp, it should be so far away from me that I can't reach it? Too much bacon isn't good for you. No such thing as too much bacon. And I'll be the judge of what's good for me. I rather fancy that at least is something I know best, Caroline. Hmm. You know so many things, James. You're so self-complacent. That's why it's difficult to talk to you. That's why you get the idea that I, that people, are trying to pump you. Some more bacon, please. Poirot says I, uh, I'd make an excellent detective. Did he? Mm. We had a very interesting chat. I wonder if Monsieur Poirot found it interesting. He said I was more valuable than anyone he'd met here. He told me a lot about his life, too. About a mad nephew of his. Do you know that Prince Paul of Muritania, the one who just married the dancer? Well, he I do like... not know her. You do not know her, and I do not care to hear about her or about his mad nephew either. Did he ask you any questions, Caroline? No questions. We just chatted and chatted. More bacon, please. I have a little theory of my own, James. Mr. Poirot didn't ask me, but he might have. Whom do you suspect? I don't suspect anybody. I know. Parker was here in your surgery the morning of the murder. That place is full of poison. He's sure to have taken some. As a matter of fact, that's been my theory right along. Roger Ackroyd was poisoned in his food that night. <laughs> Nonsense. He was stabbed in the neck. You know that as well as I do. After death to make a false clue. I examined the body and I know what I'm talking about. That wound wasn't inflicted after death. It was the cause of death. And don't look so omniscient. Next you'll be telling me you know more about medicine than I do. Perhaps you think you could take over my practice. Oh, don't be ridiculous. You know I haven't a license. <laughs> That afternoon, Caroline had a mahjong party made up of her little group of village gossipers, in whose opinion, I now learned, Rafe Payton was mysteriously concealed somewhere in Cranchester, the only big town in the nearest. Of course, that was true. Uh, Miss Gannett's maid, it seems, had contributed the additional information that while taking a walk that afternoon on Cranchester Road, she'd seen Monsieur Poirot in a large black car coming from that direction. After that, I was not surprised to learn that Monsieur Poirot had been invited to my house for dinner. Caroline believes, whenever possible, in getting her information directly from headquarters. A little more raspberry shape, Mr. Poirot. <laughs> Under no circumstances, I am already a man of a uh, corpulence so great. It would hardly become me if I, uh, well, yes, I have, yes, there is no harm in a little raspberry shape. There you are, Mr. Poirot. I beg your pardon, Caroline, if I might have my first helping. Oh, I'll sort this out, my James. There you are. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Poirot, uh, what do you think about Rafe Pitt now? What I think would scarcely be regarded as the legal evidence in the courtroom, mademoiselle. Yes, dear, dear, dear. Mama. You, you are incredulous, mademoiselle Chevrolet. I am incredulous. You have a theory, Poirot. I don't have a theory. I know. Oh, Caroline. James, don't meddle about in what you don't understand. There are several points to this case. Yes, mademoiselle. Point number one. Mr. Ackroyd was heard talking to someone after after half past nine. Point number two. At some time during the evening, Rafe Payton must have come in through the window as evidenced by the prints of his shoes. Point number three. Mr. Ackroyd was nervous that evening and could have only admitted someone he knew. Point number four. The person with Ackroyd at 9.30 was asking for money. We know Rafe Payton was in a scrape. Admirable. Oh, and one other thing, Mr. Mr. Poirot. I found out something for you today. The boots Rafe Payton was wearing that night, they were not brown. They were black. Ah, 
You have found that out for me. Thank you. Thank you. You are sure Mademoiselle Le Lebron are black? Positive? Too bad. Too bad. If they were only black, those boots. I mean, if, if they were. You, you mean... Yes, I understand. Rafe Payton is guilty or innocent according to whether his boots are brown or black. Really, Mr. Poirot? It could easily be. For murder, there was with Mr. Payton so many motives. First motive, blackmail. Rafe Payton may have been the man who blackmailed Mrs. Burrow. Reason, his general money needs. The second motive, the certainty of a great inheritance through Mr. Ackroyd's death. And the third motive, Caroline? Very simple, very simple. Mr. Ackroyd's violent disapproval of Rafe's proposed marriage to Miss Flora. Well, after listening to you, Caroline, I'd say the case is very black against him. I haven't a case, James, I know. Late that afternoon, Monsieur Poirot called on me to ask if I could arrange a little conference room at his home that night. There would be present Mrs. Ackroyd, Flora, Raymond, and Parker. I think Caroline, who was present when he called, would have given ten years of her life to have been added to the list. For my part, I would have been only too glad to yield her my place among those who in that particular evening gathered around the beaming countenance of the Belgian detective and cucumber breeder... <clears throat> yeah, I'm clearing my throat. That is an accepted signal in this country that a meeting is about to begin. Quiet, everybody. I will read the list. You, you will please answer to your names. Uh, Raymond. Yes? Uh, Parker. Yes, sir? Mrs. Ackroyd. Yes, but I want to speak to Yes, to will be sufficient. Miss uh, Flora. Yes? Say, Poirot, what's the meaning of all this? The list I have just read is the list of suspected persons. Every one of you present had the opportunity to kill Mr. Ackroyd. I won't stand for this. I'm going. You will not go, madame, until you have heard what I have to say. I clear my throat again. <clears throat> and now I commence at the beginning. Until now, ladies and gentlemen, we have all been trying to answer to ourselves one principal question. Who was in the room with Mr. Ackroyd at 9.30? Not Dr. Shepard, since I myself can prove that he was at home. Not Miss Flora, nor Mrs. Ackroyd, nor Mr. Raymond, with whose actions on that evening we are well acquainted. Nor Parker, who has furnished me with a satisfactory alibi. Who then? This is the part of Hercule Poirot, the cleverest, the most audacious question. Was anyone with him? Are you trying to make me out a liar, Mr. Poirot? I tell you, I distinctly heard voices. I distinctly heard the words that Mr. Ackroyd was speaking. Mr. Raymond, the words that Mr. Ackroyd said. The calls on my purse have been so frequent of late that I believe it is impossible for me to accede to your request. Ha. Huh. Does nothing strike you as odd about him? Their style, for example. No, he frequently dictated letters to me using exactly the same style. That is precisely what I seek to arrive at. Would any man use such a phrase in talking to another, ah? Huh? <laughs> I think not. My friends, you have all forgotten one thing. This stranger who called at the house in the proceeding weekend, the firm he represented. Do you remember, Mr. Raymond? Dictaphone company. A dictaphone, that's what you think. Mr. Ackroyd had promised to invest in a dictaphone, you remember. Me, I had the curiosity to inquire of the company and question their reply, Mr. Raymond, was that Mr. Ackroyd did purchase a dictaphone from their representative. Why he concealed the matter from you, his confidential secretary, I do not know. Must have meant to surprise me with it. He had quite a childish love of surprising people. Oh, there's only one man who could have done it. You mean Ray Payton? Mother! Oh, let's face it. If he's innocent, he should be able to prove it. If he isn't... If only he'd come forward. That is your advice, Mr. Raymond. That he should come forward. Certainly. Do you know where he is? Me? I know everything. Remember that. The truth of the telephone call of the footprints on the window sill of the hiding place of Ray Payton. Where is he? Not very far away. Where? In Cranchester. Where? No. He is not in Cranchester. He is here, in the doorway of this room. Really? Please, Paula, my darling. 
Have I not told you all at least 36 times that it was useless to conceal things from Hercule Poirot? That always I discover the little secret. It is my business. From Dr. Shepard, Sister Caroline, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I learned that uh, the doctor and Roy Payton, they are old friends. Dr. Shepard knows that things look very black against his friend Payton. He tells him the old story. Yes, he did. He explained to me how suspicion was bound to fall on me, and I had no real alibi. And with the best of intentions, people sometimes make errors. That's why Dr. Shepard consented to do what he could to help Mr. Payton. He was successful in hiding him from the police. Where? In his own house? Uh, no, indeed, Mr. Raymond. You should ask yourself the question that I, Hercule Poirot, did. If the good doctor is concealing the young man, what place would he choose? It must necessarily be somewhere near at hand. I think of Cranchester, a hotel. No, lodgings, even more impractically. No, where then? Ha <laughs> ha, I have it. A nursing home. I make inquiries. Yes, at one of them, a patient was brought there by the doctor himself early on Saturday morning. That patient, I had no difficulty in identifying him as right patient. He arrived at my house yesterday, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the point of this evening's meeting. Ray Patron says he is innocent of the killing of Roger Ackroyd. Oh, I am. I, I swear by heaven please, I please, am. Please, Mr. Patron, please. You have just heard Mr. Patron declare he is innocent. Yet he has three motives for the murder and no alibi. Well, I certainly don't see how you can sit there. I am possessing the floor, Mrs. Ackroyd. Listen carefully, everybody. To save Mr. Payton, the real criminal must confess. I you speak to you, Hercule Poirot. I know that the murder of Mr. Ackroyd is in this room now, at this table, tonight. Tomorrow in the morning, the truth goes to the police. You mean you know who? Yes. At the moment, I know. I alone. For the murder of Roger Ackroyd, there is only one way out. And that way does not lead to freedom. And it is to the murder or not that I speak. This is a matter of life and death. And I, Hercule Poirot, am not joking. Good night. What are you doing out there in the hall? What day am I overcome, my dear? Well, aren't you coming in to chat? I'm very tired, Caroline. But at least you can tell me what happened last night. Mr. Poirot told us all about his little gray fell again. Oh, does he think Rafe Payton is guilty? No. Well, he's crazy. You can go over and tell him so in the morning. Good night, Caroline. very tired. My arm aches from writing. I've written it all out. Now Peyton will be cleared. As I think back, I'm not quite certain why I urged Ackroyd to read that letter before it was too late. Perhaps I subconsciously realized that with a pig-headed chap like that, I had best chance of getting him not to read it. His nervousness that night was interesting psychologically. He knew danger was close at hand, yet he never once suspected me as the blackmail of Mrs. Ferrars. The dagger was an afterthought. I'd thought of a very little weapon of my own, but uh, I saw the dagger lying on the silver table. It occurred to me how, how much better it would be to use a weapon that couldn't be traced to me. I suppose I must have meant to murder him all along. As soon as I'd heard of Mrs. Ferrars' death, I felt convinced that she'd have told him everything before she died. So I went home and took my precautions... The dictaphone he had given me two days before to adjust. Something gone a little wrong with it, and I persuaded Ackroyd I didn't have a go it instead of sending it back. I did what I wanted to it. Took it up with me in my bag. Study that evening. When it was all over, I looked around the room for the door. Quite satisfied, nothing had been left undone. The dictaphone was on the table by the window. Time to go up at 9.30. The mechanism of that little device was rather clever, based on the principle of alarm clock, and the armchair was pulled out so as to hide it from the door. I never dreamed that Parker would notice that Notice that chair. Certainly would not have remembered Poirot hadn't asked him. Having the American sailor with a toothache call me from King's Abbott that night was a stroke of genius. 
No way for anyone listening to have told that it was not Parker. <laughs> Still don't know how Poirot sat that one out. My only regret is about Caroline, and yet... I feel I can trust Poirot. She'll never know the truth, and I'm glad of that. I shouldn't like her to know she's fond of me, and then, too, she's proud. I guess it'll be a grief to her, but... Grief passes. When I finished writing, I shall enclose this whole manuscript in an envelope to address it to Poirot. And now, because I'm tired, take some sleeping powders. Because I'm very tired... I will take more sleeping powders than I should. More than anybody should. I suppose I ought to feel sorry. I am sorry. Sorry that Hercule Poirot ever came to King's Abbot to grow his cucumbers. concludes our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd. In just a moment, Orson Welles will return to the microphone with our guest of the evening, Edna May Oliver. Meanwhile, I'd like to take just time enough to say this to every woman listening. We at Campbell's know good cooking, and so, of course, do you. Speaking, therefore, as one good cook to another, we'd like you to try our chicken soup. Try it, if you will, in the same friendly yet critical way you'd sample a neighbor's good dish or send in one of your own for her to try. And if you'll do that, I know you'll find this soup deep and full and rich in chicken flavor from the first spoonful to the last delicious drop. Indeed, I promise you, just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. And now, here is Orson Welles with Edna May Oliver. Uh, never mind, uh, Orson Welles. What about me, Hercule Poirot? Miss Oliver, have I not the little gray cells? <laughs> you and your gray cells. If you ask me, I think Rafe Peyton committed the murder. After listening to my explanation so careful? Especially after listening to your exclamation so careful. Now, in the days when I was a detective... Scotland Yard? No, RKO. You and your one little murder. Why, when I was a detective... No, no sooner did I establish the identity of the murderer than he was murdered, and I had to start all over again. It is well for you, Miss Oliver, to be literally genius of Hercule Poirot, but remember this. Hercule Poirot always laughs last. Attend. I laugh last. Ha, ha, ha. I accept that as a laugh. Go on. I have observed the proceedings here in the studio, and I have detected a circumstance which has indubitably escaped you are untrained to watch for such things. Almost it had escaped me myself. Not only did I discover that the gentleman who told the story, Dr. Shepard, was himself the murderer of Roger Ackroyd, but I now reveal to you that he was enacted in Mr. Wells' little anecdote by none other than that beloved portrayer of dramatic roles, that celebrated delineator of character, that unparalleled purveyor of protean portraiture, that internationally celebrated... You refer to Orson Welles, I take it, Mr. Welles? I do. <sighs> now I would like to be allowed a little observation of my own. Excuse me, Moreau. Avez-vous la bloom de ma What? I'm not finished yet. Où est le chapeau de ma mère? That's all right, Mr. Poirot. I just wanted to see if you could really speak French. Attend, Mr. Poirot. I laugh last. <laughs> Good night, Edna May Oliver. And may I say I hope that this will not be the last time that you will put me in my place in this program. <laughs> In tonight's Campbell Playhouse production of The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, the role of Caroline Shepard was played by Edna May Oliver. The part of Roger Ackroyd was played by Alan Napier, Mrs. Ackroyd by Brenda Forbes, and Flora Ackroyd by Mary Taylor. George Kaluris was heard as Inspector Hempstead, Ray Collins as Mr. Raymond, and Everett Sloan as Parker the butler. Dr. James Shepard, who committed the murder, was played by Orson Welles, and Hercule Poirot 
who arrested Dr. Shepard, was played by Orson Welles. The music for tonight's production, with the exception of the Noel Coward melodies, was composed and, of course, conducted by Bernard Herman. And now, Mr. Wells, I see we have just a moment. Can we have a word about next week's story? Next week, ladies and gentlemen, it will be our proud pleasure to give you The Garden of Allah, starring Claudette Colbert. The Robert Hitchens masterpiece, both as a book and a play, has engaged the affections of the peoples of the world for 35 years with its ageless story of a great love and a greater renunciation. If Miss Colbert is listening in, I want her to know how eagerly we're all looking forward to the privilege of having her with us in the Campbell Playhouse. No other actress that I know is more ideally suited than Miss Colbert for the part of Domini, the English girl who found in the great Sahara Desert the love that gave the final meaning to her life. And so until then, till next Sunday in Claudette Colbert in the Garden of Allah, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us here in the Campbell Playhouse remain obedient to yours. <laughs> Makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you The Garden of Allah with Claudette Colbert as our guest star. Presenting Orson Welles as The Third Man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the motion picture The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man, yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. No. He had many lives. And I can tell you about all of them. How? Because my name is Harry Lyme. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, The Golden Fleece. Well, it's a queer story, no matter how you look at it. It begins with a bullfight, it ends with a naval engagement on the China Sea. There's a woman in it, of course. Have another drink? All right, if you are. Uh, two gin slings, boy. Yes, sir. Two gin slings. It all started in the little seaport of Algeciras. Like every other town in Spain, there's a bullring there. I don't know how you feel about bullfights, but if it's Sunday in Spain, it's a little hard to stay away from them. A bullfight is to Spain what an opera is to Italy. It's the only thing in the country that starts on time. I'd been dawdling over my shellfish and beer, so when I got into the second faena, Soldadita was in the ring. 
He was younger then and braver than he is now, but I've never been one of his fans. Too much ballet dancing for me and not enough bullfighting, but we won't go into that. I could talk about the corrida all night, but I promised you a story about adventure on the high seas. And it's beginning right now. Soldadita is dedicating the bull. He is paying this compliment to the lady who is seated next to me. For the first time, I glance at her, and the glance freezes into a stare. She has very dark red hair, very pale ivory skin, and very bright yellow eyes. I mean, really yellow, like a cat's. I won't dwell on her. I'd like to, but I won't. Suffice to say that this kid could stop traffic on the Indianapolis Speedway. The bullfighter turns, tosses his hat to her in the classical gesture over the shoulder, and moves out into the sunlight toward the bull. But as far as I'm concerned, the bullfight is over. You must watch the ring, senor. Hmm? I beg your pardon? It is very pleasant to feel your eyes upon me. I adore being stared at, but uh, just now, don't you think it's a bit disrespectful to our friend Soldadito? He's no friend of mine. He's a good friend of yours, senorita. Permit me to inform you that he is my enemy. very graceful, don't you think? Mm. And that was also a graceful speech, senor. No, I didn't hear it. I do not mean his dedication of the bull to me. No, I mean your little speech just now about his being your enemy if he's my friend. <laughs> Thanks. I adore it when men fight over me. Senorita, fighting over you would be a pleasure. Uh, when do I begin? Whenever you like. <laughs> Who shall I take on? The man or the bull? I think you need not bother about the bull. Look. Soldadito is about to make the kill. That was a beautiful kill, wasn't it, Mr... Uh, what is your name? Lime, Harry Lime, yes. Good kill. I will call you Harry. The bull kneeled like a penitent at his feet. The beast seemed to be asking the Torero's pardon. Mm, it should have been the other way around. You are already jealous. I adore that. <laughs> Still, you must admit it was a glorious kill. Uh, great kill. Tell me, Harry, what are you doing in Algiers? No, I'm just looking around. And what are you looking for? Well, no need to look any longer. I found it. You make very pretty little speeches. I adore that. What is your profession? Oh, uh, export, uh, import, mostly. I, I dabble in a lot of things. What a pity. Why? I had allowed myself to hope you were a sailor. Well, I have been a sailor. Will that help? You have to have master's papers... I'm here with my yacht. Perhaps you have seen it in the harbor. Oh, that big three-master with the black hole? It's mine. We've lost our captain. Oh? It happened quite suddenly. I'm very sorry you're not a ship's captain. I would like to see you in the blue jacket with the gold buttons. Would you believe it? I was a ship's captain. I do not believe it. But I have master's papers. And where are they? Oh, in Barcelona. Oh, that is a bore because we are leaving tomorrow. Okay, I'll have somebody bring him down by train tonight. In other words, you want the job. In other words, I've got the job. I needed that job too much. And, of course, she knew it. I don't say she didn't like me, but there wasn't any doubt of it. That season, I was a little afraid about the seams. I phoned a friend of mine, a forger up in Barcelona, and made arrangements to cook up some papers for me and rush them down that night to the coast. Then I changed into my best shirt, the other one, and went to the best restaurant. She told me she was going there after the bullfight. Good evening. Good evening. I, I'm sorry, but I just realized something. I don't know your name. You, you do not know the lady's name. You know Soldadito. Of, of course he knows me. All Spain knows me. But what is this man doing at our table? He, he doesn't know you. That's all right, old man. You can fix that. Introduce us. I am the Baroness von Kernipald. But you will call me Nadia. Okay, Nadia. The next morning, I had the forged papers and the captain's job safely in my pocket. The truth was, of course, that I'd never been a sailor in my life. Unless you count the work I had to do as a deckhand when they found me stowed away on a short trip from Alexandria to Naples. But I needed that job bad. And after one look into those huge cat's yellow eyes of hers, I would have jumped at any job she offered, whether I needed it or not. You like the ship, Harry? No, she's a beauty. The steward will take your luggage to your cabin. Right now, you'll be needed on deck to superintend our departure. And uh, by the way, where are we going? To China. <laughs> Algeciras, Spain, 
to Hong Kong, China. That's quite a run for an old salt, whose only experience as a navigator consisted of piloting a canoe around the shallow end of Lake Winnebago, Wisconsin. Luckily, I thought to bring along a little help. The help's name, of all things in the world, was Sidney Carton. He was an ex-smuggler, rather an unemployed smuggler. I'd run into Sidney occasionally on various little capers in and around the Mediterranean. I figured he was crooked enough so I could trust him. His main attraction, besides a shock of dirty, carrot-colored hair and a glass eye, was a set of teeth like a rotten rake. Sidney was the only man I ever knew who could eat a tomato through a zither. But if Sidney was an eyesore, he was a gift from heaven as far as Captain Lyme was concerned. He was a real sailor, remember, and he covered up for me doing all the real work while I walked around in my blue jacket with the gold buttons trying to look important. Naturally, Sidney wasn't doing this for love. But since I didn't have any money, I found it necessary to make him a few promises. I tell you, Sidney, this, this isn't a yacht at all. Of course it's a yacht, Harry. This is a pleasure trip, pure and simple, and there's nothing in it for us. I told you we were carrying contraband, old man, and I'll prove it. What kind of contraband? Dope? Don't be a fool, Harry. Nobody smuggles dope into China. We're going off around the world just for the fun of it, and that ain't any fun. Why had I been signed on with so few questions asked? Why had we left so quickly? Above all, what had happened to the original captain? <laughs> it was queer enough, all right. But I was not telling Sidney the truth when I claimed that this was not a pleasure cruise. It was a pleasure, believe me. Then, one night, quite late it must have been, because I remember the moon was down. I was up on deck finishing a cigarette. Harry? Hmm? Harry? You still up, old man? I want to talk to you, Eddie. Why don't you get some sleep, old man? I found After all, it, Harry. Was up. You found it? What did you find? The contraband. Under the floorboards. I know what we're carrying now, Harry, and it had knock your eye out. Amazing. That's what it is, amazing. Okay, old man, okay. Spill it. Oh, I've got a whole lot to spill, Harry. A whole lot. Maybe I ought to begin with the explosives. Explosives? Very powerful they are, Harry. Enough to blow this ship to China. So that's it. Oh, no. No, that's not the contraband. But let me ask you this, Harry. Did you ever notice that glass box in the chart house with a sign over it that says emergency only? Hold it a minute. Oh, what's wrong? I thought I heard something. Go on, go on. And I also found out about the captain, Harry. Hmm? Do you know who he was? Take the one thing at a time, old man, please. He was a naval officer for Hitler. Oh, very high and mighty mucky-mucky in the Nazi Navy he was. And you know his name? What's his name got to do with it? I want to know what was happening. I'm coming link. to that. But the captain's name, Harry, was von Koenigvall. Von Koenigvall, but that's not just... Right, what... Harry. He was her husband. And this is a rum go if ever I've seen one. Now, you take the expenses. You take him. What I want to hear is you about... You can't laugh it off, Harry. Try as you will, it just ain't funny. These explosives are all wired up and set to go, Harry. This isn't a ship. It's a bomb. Shh. And as for what we're smuggling... Shut up. There is somebody listening. Stay there. I'll be back in a second. Right. Hello. Hello, Nadia. It's too hot to sleep, isn't it? Hmm. It's pretty hot, all right. Keep me company, Harry. I'm lonely. When I finally got to my own cabin, it was dawn. Didn't dare go looking for Sydney in any way. I was bone tired. They couldn't have let me sleep for more than an hour. Yes. Yes, what is it? It's Matthew, sir, the third officer. What do you want? Well, sir, we're in sight of land in the old court. Don't bother me. Ask Sydney. He knows the... Course. Yes, but please, Captain, may I speak to you? Okay, okay. Now then, what is it? It's cotton I want to talk to you about, sir. Well, what's wrong? Well, I hardly know how to tell you, sir, but he's gone. Gone? Yes, sir. We've searched everywhere, very thoroughly, but there's no doubt at all, sir. Mr. Cotton is not on this ship. <laughs> Orson 
Wells returns in just a moment as the third man. Now, Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with today's story, The Golden Fleece. <laughs> I still don't know how, how we made it into Fort. The trick was to keep that second mate from guessing that I couldn't tell the poop from a bosun's whistle. And also to keep all of us from crashing into a reef or turning upside down or something. Luckily, a little boat came out to meet us with the harbor pilot. Seems that's the regular procedure. I was very grateful, I can tell you, to be spared the embarrassment of having to swim for it. But it's a long haul from Hong Kong, China to Panama City. And much as I like Nadia's company, I think I would have quit the job if I hadn't managed to make a deal with young Matthews, the second mate. I showed him some papers I happened to have, proving I was a secret operative from the FBI and explained that he had to cover up for me the way Carton had been doing before. And by the time we got out of the canal on the Pacific end... I had everything pretty much under control. Would you like another drink? Uh, no, thanks. Please go on, Mr. Uh... Uh, Lime, Harry Lime. Uh, you see, I've got a reason for spinning this yarn. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, what happened to Carton? Well, uh, Sydney? <laughs> Nobody ever saw him again. Now, I'll skip the Pacific crossing now because nothing very important happened to us till we got to China. Unless you'd like to hear some more about those yellow eyes of Nudge. Uh, what happened to von Koenigwald, the lady's husband? I'm coming to that, old man. Uh, just a second till I finish the drink. Okay. Well, it was late in March when we sighted Hong Kong. I'd learned how to imitate a sea captain by then, but I was more than a little anxious about my papers. It had been a nasty moment or two in Tahiti, and I was afraid the British authorities might spot the forgery. They might even have gotten some wireless message about me by then, but I still didn't know the purpose of the trip, you understand. Sydney hadn't gotten around to telling me about what the contraband was before he disappeared. So, my... Curiosity got the better of me, as usual. And I stayed with the ship. Captain, there's a speedboat coming alongside on the port bow. Yeah, it can't be the pilot. We've already taken him on. Could be the harbor police, sir. Yeah, is it good? No, the speedboat is mine. Oh? You'll bring the ship into anchorage, Mr. Matthews, please. The captain and I are leaving now. We are? Where are we going, honey? I loathe that expression. Okay, now, yeah, but you have to answer my question. There'll be plenty of time for that on the way. We'd been riding upriver from Hong Kong for a good half hour before Nadia took it into her beautiful head to start talking. I'm taking you to meet a very important man, Harry. Huh? You'd better know his name. It's General Wei. A Chinaman? He is Chinese, yes. General Wei was governor of one of the largest southern provinces, but of course that was... Where important. are we meeting him? I think the mainland would be too hot for him now. The general will be waiting for us on the jungle. A what? A Chinese boat. I hope you're hungry, because there's bound to be quite a feast. You mean to say we've come halfway around the world to keep a dinner engagement with a Chinese warlord? Ours has been a very serious mission, Harry. And before you meet the general, I think you should know the truth. So do I. The general is planning to retrieve the lost provinces... Luckily, he is a wealthy man and had many investments in Tangier. It was my mission to bring him some of his wealth, which will be needed in the coming war. I think you have guessed what happened to the Baron von Königwald. Yes, I think so. I think... I think the Baron had a wife. I think his wife bumped him off. Am I right, honey? Please call me Nadia. Okay, I think Nadia bumped him off. He was a greedy man. I had reason to suspect that he planned to take part of the gold for himself. Gold? Yes, Harry. Gold bars purchased in Tangier. That's why I couldn't tell you earlier. It would have been too much of a temptation. The ship is lined with gold. Half a million dollars worth. You know those Chinese ships? 
You know, the ones that look like some kind of cross between a Spanish galleon and a floating chop suey store? <laughs> Pretty soon we came up to the biggest and gaudiest on the river. We were helped on board with a whole lot of oriental fanfare, and I gathered that in a minute we were going to be presented to his nibs, the warlord himself. Uh, Nadia. Yes? There's just one thing I don't understand. No matter what price the old boy pays for that gold you brought him, I, I can't see why you bothered to cart it all the way across the Pacific. If you just told me before, I could have made a very nice deal for you in Mexico. I did not bring the gold here for the profit, Harry. Here he comes. Nadia, a thousand welcome. Welcome to you, great one. All oh, my gratitude. This is General Way, Mr. Harry Lyme. Harry, may I present my father? I know you've heard about shark's fins and bird's nest soup, but I'll bet you never knew a Chinese banquet can last seven and a half hours. Well, this one did. With eating all the way. May I offer you some more ice wine, Captain Lyme? Well, I'm afraid I've had too much already, General. Uh, I know this may sound a little rude, but I can't help wondering, is... Is Nadia really your daughter? She is my only child. That's funny, she doesn't look very Chinese. No, Nadia's mother was a white Russian refugee. I met her in Chief Fu and made the mistake of marrying her. Nadia, however, is no mistake. She is my very precious jewel, Mr. Lyme. And I thank you for taking such good care of her. Father! Father! And it's gone! It's got... Get this big boat! What's happened? What's the happened? Boat, Harry, our boat with all the gold on it. It has vanished. While we were in there stuffing ourselves, somebody had made off with a yacht. Word came to us it was going downstream toward the open sea. It's my fault. Well, why yours, Nadia? That Matthews boy, the third mate, I should never have trusted him. I should never trust anybody. But if you'd gone on stabbing your ship's officers and tossing him overboard, you'd have ended up without any crew. There she is ahead of us. Ahoy there, golden fleece! Come about and prepare to receive us on board! Can't you get any more speed, Harry? Well, I'm punching a hole in the floor as it is. Ahoy, golden fleece! This is your last chance! Come about or we open fire! They won't answer. They will now. Fire! We had a dangerous-looking gang of hatchet men with machine guns on our launch, and they put up a good show. It wasn't long before we were next to the yacht, and I could see the lot of damage had been done to the crew on board. It wasn't my crew. It was strangers. Chinese. We just have to storm over the side. Come on, Harry. <laughs> What's wrong, General? Are you hit? That's all right, Captain. Just give me your arm. Okay. Here we go. No sooner were we on deck than a mean-looking Mongol I hadn't noticed before. I up in the shrouds, bit off the end of a grenade, and threw it smack into our launch. Well, there goes everybody on our side. I guess this is it, Nadia. Yes, Nadia, this is it. Hey, wait a minute. Don't worry, Nadia, I am not a ghost. Wait a minute, you're Nadia's husband. Yes, uh... happily for me, I was not as dead as she thought I was when she pushed me into the sea. Hans. You should have remembered. I am a good swimmer. But, uh, Keep your hands in the air, please, all three of you. Hans, how did you get here? By plane? I couldn't guess your cause, and it was the easiest way. I just flew to Hong Kong and waited for... And now what are you going to do? I am going to do unto others as they would do unto me, Captain. If you happen to remember any prayers, you'd better start saying them, all three of you. I'm wounded, Kennicott, and dying. It doesn't matter about me, but Nadia's... Father, I'm your no. true child. Do you imagine I would leave you now? This is all very nice and noble, but what about me? That's true, Harry. Hans, this man has done nothing to harm you. Let him swim for he it. He knows about the gold, Nadia, and I prefer to keep that as my own secret. He also knows about something else, don't you, Harry? Carlton told me about it the night I killed what him. What do you mean? There's a tiny glass window here by my hand. Carlton explained it to you. I heard him. The sign says for emergency only. Yes. Remember what he said, Harry. This isn't a ship. It's a bomb. Thanks, Nadia. God bless you. Shoot that man! Yes, no, you can't. He's a good swimmer, too. Goodbye, Harry. Child. You gave me a new father with a seal of our family. Uh, I still wear it. It's enough to break a pane of glass. Goodbye. Harry? He's too far away to hear you. He will hear this. Uh, 
sampan picked me up. But I almost drowned myself first, thinking about all that gold. A half a million dollars worth of it going down to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> Have another gin sling? Thanks again, Mr. Lyme. Well, that's the story. Here's why I told it to you. I know the spot where this happens. I've got it marked exactly on the map. Cost about 20,000 pounds to do the salvage, but that still leaves a pretty big margin of profit. And I just wondered if you'd be interested, sir, in, in investing. Mr. Lyme, I wonder if you know who I am. Well, no, no, not, not exactly. I... I'm the Lord Constable and Chief of Police in this colony. We have a full dossier on your activities as a confidence man, and I thought I'd let you tell your tale because I wanted to know how you work. Lyme, that salvage racket's the oldest of all the old skin games. I'm surprised that you're trying it on anybody, least of all a policeman. Good night now. And by the way, we'd be much happier here if you'd leave town. Within the next 24 hours, that is. Well, um, pip pip. Uh, pip pip. Another gin sling, sir? Uh, no. Oh. Just give me the check. <laughs> Lyme returns in just a moment. Now, Harry Lyme. <laughs> well, friends, I think you understand why I don't like telling that story. Whoever I tell it to usually turns out to be a cop. That isn't the worst of it. The worst of it is that it's true. Well, pip-pip. Pip-pip. <laughs> 